format of the meeting will be as per the agenda published and a copy of the officer presentations can be found on the committee website. All those present will remain muted until the chairman allows them to speak. Only members of the public that have registered to speak can make representation to the committee. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I welcome you all to the committee? I'm Councillor Filmer, I'm chairman of the committee. Just a few uh, notes before we get on to the agenda itself. Um, the way we'll run the meeting is that each application will be taken in turn. The officers will outline the details of the application and then we'll have the public speaking time. Members will then debate and decide on the application before them. For members of the committee wishing to speak, can I just remind you that you need to indicate via the online chat and uh, you'll be called in turn. Uh, during the debate, there will be a proposer and then a seconder for a resolution. Members will then vote on this proposal in turn, confirming that they've been present throughout the application being considered and will vote for, against or abstain. The votes will then be counted and the result announced. I'll now ask the officers and councillors who will be taking part in the meeting to confirm that they can see and hear me and to introduce themselves. So if we start with the, uh, the planning officers, uh, Dawn De Vries, are you present? Thank you very much. I am present and I can confirm I can see and hear everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Adrian Noon. Chairman, uh, he's not covering the first item, so he'll be joining okay. a little bit later. Thank In you. In which case, uh, is Stuart Howlett present? Yes, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Stuart Howlett. I'm the head of planning at Sedgemoor, and I can confirm I can see and hear, hear everything. Thank you. And also, Shanta Parsons. Good morning, Chairman. Yes, I'm a senior planning officer for the West team. I can see and hear everything. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, from our legal section, uh, Dawn De Vries. Uh, sorry, from our legal section, Dawn Lehman. I'll come back to. Chairman, she was having problems logging in, so she may be a little bit late coming to the party. OK, I'll try Dawn again at the end. Uh, from our democratic services, Mrs Nicholson. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. My name's Leila Nicholson. I'm the committee manager and I can confirm that I can see and hear everyone. Thank you very much. If we then move on to uh, the members of the committee, uh, I'll come to you in, in turn. Is uh, Councillor Granter present at the moment? Yes, Chairman. Thank you. Good morning. Yes, my name's Councillor Graham Granter. I represent the Fairfax Ward in Bridgewater. I can confirm, I can see and hear everybody loud and clear. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Glassford. Yes, good morning, Chairman. Yes, I'm Alec Glassford. I'm a councillor for Fairfax Ward and I confirm I can see and hear everything. Thank you. Councillor Pearce. Morning, Chairman. Um, councillor Cassie Pearce, West Dover Ward, Bridgewater. I confirm I can hear and see everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Scott. Yes, good morning, Chairman. Um, it's Councillor Liz Scott from the Axvale Ward in near Axbridge, and I can confirm I can see and hear everything. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hendry. Morning, Mr. Chairman. Sedgemoor District Councillor Alistair Hendry for Burnham and Sea Central. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I can see and hear everything. Thank you. And Councillor Facey. Yes, good morning, Chairman. Councillor Mike Facey, Burnham and Sea North, and I can hear and see everything, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. Good morning, Chairman. Yes, I can see and hear everything. I'm representing Burnham North. Um, my name is Mike Murphy. And Councillor Revens. Uh, good morning, Mr Chairman. Councillor Bill Revens representing the North Petherton Ward. I can confirm that I can see and hear everything. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Kingham. Hey, good morning, uh, Councillor Stuart Kingham. And I represent the West Poldens and I can hear and see all. And Councillor Bradford. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Committee. Councillor Alan Bradford representing the North Pedant Ward, and I can hear and I can see everything quite clearly. Thank you, Councillor Bolt. Good morning, everyone. Brian Bolt, Ward Member for Cannington and Wemden. I can see and hear the meeting. Councillor Perry. Yes, thank you. Good morning. Uh, Councillor Liz Perry representing the Kings Isle Ward, and I can confirm I can hear and see everything. 
Thank you, Councillor Grimes. Good morning, Chairman. Councillor Tony Grimes, Barrow Ward. I confirm I can see and hear everything. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, myself, as Councillor Film, as the Chairman of the Committee, and I've seen and heard all the members and officers so far. Uh, would also just mention that we do have uh, members of the public present, some of whom have registered to speak, some of whom are here to observe the meeting. Uh, we also have other members of council, including the uh, portfolio holder for development with us today. And if I could just check at this point whether Mrs. Lehman has joined us. No, we'll carry on then for the moment and uh, hopefully Mrs. Lehman will join us in, in due course. I believe, Mrs. Nicholson, that's all the members who are present at the moment. Chairman, have we um, spoken to Councillor Gibson this morning? Did I, I miss it? I haven't heard from Councillor Gibson. Is Councillor Gibson present? She's on the list. I wasn't sure whether we'd had apologies from Councillor Gibson, but maybe not. OK. I know she has. she's having problems with her internet, but she hasn't t told me she's not coming, if you see what I mean. OK, again, we'll, we'll try before we start the first application. We'll, uh, we'll drop back to uh, both legal and Councillor Gibson just to make sure. If we move on then to the items on the, uh, the, the, the actual agenda, the first item is apologies for absence. I think, Ms Nicholson, we've heard from all councillors who are present apart from Councillor Gibson who Gibson. Will, will, will await. Uh, item two is urgent business. I'm not aware of any other urgent business that isn't covered by our agenda. Item three is the uh, public speaking time. For, for those members of the public who've registered to speak, uh, we'll take, as I mentioned, each application in turn. The officers will outline the background and detail of the application, and then you'll be asked to uh, to address the committee. We'll do that by uh, asking you to enable your your microphone uh, so that we can uh, hear your your three minutes that you have to present to the committee. Uh, when you're doing your presentation, we will give you a one minute warning uh, of that uh, three minutes coming to an end, and hopefully you should hear a, a bell. Mrs Nicholson, if you could just demonstrate the, the bell. Sorry. Oh, that's better. That's right. Thank Sorry, you. it was buried. No problem. And and just again for members of the public, when you hear that, you've got one minute left to, left to go. So if you can draw your comments to a close by the, uh, the end of the three minutes, that would be most appreciated. Uh, next item is decorations of interest. Members, are there any decorations that members have for this morning's applications? Right, I have uh, Councillor Pierce. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I need to declare a personal interest on Bridgewater applications on pages 1 and 52, please, as a member of Bridgewater Town Council, but I have not taken part in any discussions relating to those. Uh, Thank Mr. you. Chairman, Mr. Uh, hold, hold, if, if you can bear with me, Councillor Murphy, I've got Councillor Evans first. All right. Uh, and then I'll come to you. Councillor Evans. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, page 27 um, is in my ward, and I'm also an Orpheliston Town Councillor. I've taken no part in any discussions um, leading up to this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Murphy. Thank you, Chairman. Sorry to be so impatient. Um, uh, item uh, page number 56 is uh, an item which appears on my ward at uh, Barrow Road. I have taken no part in any conversations and in fact had a phone call from an interested party and advised them that I could not speak about that project. I'd just like to say that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other decorations? Councillor Bradford, I think. Do you have a decoration? I think you're on, on mute, Councillor Bradford. I'm speaking against item 27, being, being chairman of the town council. And uh, right. So so in, in terms of that, it's uh, a predetermination that you're declaring on that oh, one, definitely. Councillor Bradford, yes? Yeah, very much okay. so. Very much so. Thank you. Uh, oh. Councillor Hendry. Sorry for taking so long, Mr Chairman. Uh, the same as Councillor Murphy, the application on Barrow Road. Uh, I can't find it now. Six dwellings, is it? No, sorry, the one for Edward. Anyway, I have this 
it's just around the corner from me. I haven't taken any conversation from any person. I don't know anything about it. Thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, Councillor Gibson, can I just check whether you're now present? And can see and hear us? You may be on mute because we can't hear you at the moment. No, it will come to uh, Councillor Pierce. Well, it was only to say that Councillor Gibson sent me a message to say she was here at the meeting. So, but <laughs> I don't know what's happened. So, okay, Chairman, yeah. Chairman, it's my council facing my box was not working for some reason. Okay, Chairman. yes, Chairman, uh, page fifty-six, Chairman, this morning, eleven twenty triple zero four five, member of Birmingham Hybrid Town Council but not taken part in any previous discussions on the application. Thank you very much. Obviously, it looks like we're having some technical issues with the uh, with the chat as, as this time. Again, if 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 that isn't working, if you can try and use the raise hand and we'll we'll try and use that as well as, as an option if, if the box isn't working. Obviously, as you know, it's, it's easier if we can do the other. But uh, Councillor Granter, do you want to uh, comment with a declaration? Your hand raised briefly, but I can't hear you at the moment. <laughs> Councillor Granger, are you there? It certainly does seem that we're having one or two technical issues this morning, so we'll we'll do our best to uh, to carry on. And if I could just come back for a final attempt to make contact with um, Mrs. Lehman, are you present now from legal? No, and I've got Councillor Pierce. I'm sorry, Chairman. It's, I've just had another message to say Lee has been here since 9:20, and she's asking if Layla, if you could send her a, another link into the meeting, please. Um, it's probably easier if she actually logs out and re-logs in. Okay. Um, lo if yeah, if you log out completely. If hopefully Lee can hear this um, and then um, redo the link. I will send her um, a copy of the link to her home email just in case. I think members oh, will. No, no, I can't. I can't do that because she won't come through as a councillor. She won't be able to see everything. So, um, yeah, she'll need to try again on the Sedgemore one. Sorry. What we'll do, members, is we'll 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 just pause, if, if you don't mind, we'll, we'll take a, a two or three minute break just to see if we can get Councillor Gibson in um, before we actually start the application. So if you could just bear with us for a couple of minutes, we'll just pause and we'll carry on as soon as we get the, uh, the ability to do so. Chairman, I'm going to try a legal officer as well, OK? That would be helpful. Thank you very much. Um, Chairman, I'm here now. Oh, excellent. Thank you. And and, and you can see and hear us all? I can see and hear everybody. Thank you. Excellent. We're, we're making progress. OK, we'll, go, we'll give Councillor Gibson a couple of minutes just to try and, uh, and get in. Chairman, sorry, Councillor Gibson is saying she's back in again. Right, Councillor Gibson, could you, are you able to uh, speak to us at all or is that still not working hello hello Councillor hello. gibson good morning if if uh, can you confirm that you can see and hear oh it's too much on the screen i keep getting um admits on the screen am i supposed to get that no don't worry about that that'll be dealt with by um by uh, yeah. services so yeah excellent yeah. but we have we have we've got you with us that's 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 great thank you very much can you can you see me? Yes, we can. OK, cool. Right, so we get back to we were at decorations of interest and I'm, I'm. Presuming Councillor Gibson, you'll have the decoration on the Bridgewater applications the same as Councillor Pierce. Yes, please. Yeah, thank you. OK. For, for members of the public, just so that you're aware with decorations of interest, it's, in, it's important that you know if there's any uh, background that members have on an application. Um, where you've heard a, a decoration of a 
personal interest, it basically means that members may have some passing knowledge of an application or an applicant or objector, but that not to such a level that it would actually prejudice their views when it comes to making a decision. Once they've declared it, that's recorded. They can then take part in the debate. They can vote and be part of the decision. If you've heard a uh, prejudicial interest, that basically means, as the name implies, that their views could be prejudiced by the knowledge that they have of an application, and therefore they can't be involved in the in the determining. So they make that declaration, and when we get to the application, they will leave the meeting and uh, not be part of the decision-making process. We also have a, a standing order within this committee uh, to avoid what's called predetermination. That's in effect making your mind up before you've come to the the meeting. Uh, it's important that any member comes with an open mind and, and can uh, listen to the debate and, and make the decision on what is in before the committee. If they feel that they have already made their mind up and predetermined an application, they can't take part in the debate. And one of the ways that we make sure that doesn't happen is to ask members that they don't get involved at the town or parish council level of planning decisions. They only get involved at either town and parish or they get involved at the district level. They can't do both. So where you heard a declaration today that someone was predetermined, that's that's what they meant. And it basically means that they can address the committee as a as a ward councillor. But again, they'll leave the meeting and not take part in the actual decision making on that particular application. That brings us to the end, I believe, of the declarations of interest. I'm not seeing any other comments being made. So if we move on then to the actual applications that are before us this morning. The first one of those is uh, Penley House in Bridgewater. And Mrs De Vries, I think you're going to uh, present this one for us. So if you'd like to make a start, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm assuming all members can see the opening slide. Certainly, it seems to be on the screen, yes. Lovely, thank you. Um, so the application is for Penley House, Road Lane Bridgewater, and it's for demolition of Penley House, erection of a three to four storey block of 33 flats, bike and bin stores and parking area. So the application is before members as the town council and two elected members have objected on the application as they consider the development conflicts with policy. Um, they're objecting on the scale of the development, impacts on character and appearance, design being out of keeping, loss of amenity for adjoining residents, ecological concerns and constraints regarding the access road. So the main considerations of the application are principle of development, affordable housing, size, scale and design, impacts on adjoining properties, highway considerations, um, eco impacts on ecology, surface and drainage, um, water impact on heritage assets. So this is an aerial shot of the site from Google, showing the setback of the site from Road Lane and the access into the site. So for members' attention, this is Road Lane along here, this is Oak Trees Nursing Home to the front. This is the access into the site currently, and this is the grounds of the application site that we're going to be considering today. So the application site is shown on this slide outlined in red with properties in Penley Avenue presenting rear boundaries um, to this to the east uh, boundary, Road Lane and Oak Tree Care Home to the south boundary, which is Walk also presenting rear boundaries to the west, and a few properties off Penley Close orientated side onto the site to the north. The site's located within the settlement boundary for Bridgewater and currently accommodates Penley House, which has been converted into flats, although it's currently vacant. And there are single storey um, flat roof garages along the northern boundary. And as previously developed, the site would be considered brownfield within the settlement boundary and therefore redevelopment in principle is considered to be acceptable. Um, and due to the location of the site, it's also considered to be sustainable in terms of being in close proximity to transport links and key facilities which would be compliant with policies S2 and S4 of the local plan and consistent with advice contained within the NPPF. In terms of planning history, um, a hybrid application has been consented on the site in December 2018, which granted detailed consent for the demolition of Hemley, um, Penley House and a replacement of one block of seven flats, which is in detail shown as block A on this slide, um, an outline for further two blocks, providing an additional 29 flats, resulting in 36 dwellings on the site overall. The three buildings were located um, close to the boundaries with a centralised parking and turning area and a number of trees on site were also consented to be removed as a result of this development. 
So this development is the extant position and can still be implemented on the site. So given this, the principle of 36 flats has previously been accepted in terms of scale of development. This application seeks consent for 33 flats, so three less than the consented position, um, with a mixture of one and two bed flats located in one central block around an internal courtyard. The access road and parking area is located to the southeast edge of the site, enabling the retention of green space and landscaping around the building. The development is a council led project and is proposed to deliver 20 one bed flats and 13 two bed flats, which would all be offered as affordable housing. The affordable housing manager has confirmed there are currently more than 2,500 households registered with the council seeking help to access suitable affordable homes. 43% um, of this housing need comes from households requiring one to two bed development. So as such, the development is considered to reflect the identified housing need and is considered to comply with policies D5 and D6 of the local plan. There has been concern from residents in terms of future management of the development. The site would remain to be owned by Sedgemore District Council and managed by homes in Sedgemore, who are a respected and high performing housing organisation. As rented accommodation in the event of issues, the tenancy can be reviewed. So in terms of context, the bottom image shows the site access and the top photo um, a view into the site from the access. So Penny Lodge, the bungalow to the left of the image and um, the garage, members can see in the top image is in third party ownership um, and uses the existing access onto road lane. So entrance in, so Penny Lodge, which is not within the ownership of the application and its garage in third party ownership. So this is the access route going into the site. The top image shows a view from the access into the site and the existing mature tree that be retained as part of the development. And the below image shows the rear elevation of properties onto Penley Avenue that are orientated um, towards the site. So the, these are properties at front onto Penley Avenue and side boundary. So the above photo shows the front elevation of Penley House, which is already consented for demolition as part of the planning history. The second photo provides a further view of the mature tree to be retained on site and behind the tree you can see the single storey garages that run along the northern boundary of the site. The top image shows the single storey garages um, which beyond this is Penny Close and the existing landscaping to this boundary. The second image gives another view from the car park towards the rear of the properties um, on Penny Avenue. The above shows images of the boundary with Oaks Tree, Oak Trees Nursing Home and a fenced off amenity area which previously belonged to one of the flats. And the top uh, left image shows the pedestrian access to the west of the site, which has a hedged and landscape edge to Penley House and provides access to the rear gardens of properties on which is walk. The landscaping to the rear of Penley, as shown in the top left image, is proposed to be retained as part of the development and the bottom image shows the rear elevation of properties on Witches Walk. So to give members an idea of scale, design and materials before we move on to the elevations, um, as members will note from this slide, the design and materials for the site do differ from those present on the surrounding properties and buildings, but given the position of the site set back from Road Lane and not sitting within an identified street scene, there would be no wider character issues with this approach and the site would be viewed separately from the surrounding more traditional residential development. So in terms of materials, the development proposed predominantly white render with light grey, mid grey and teal cladding with blue engineering bricks as a lower brick course. There are dark grey briselets and grey windows and passive vents on the roof. The building is predominantly three storey with a four storey section of the building in the eastern corner, which would overlook the car park. So this slide shows the internal elevations that be visible from the internal courtyard of the building with matching materials to the external elevations. Concerns have been raised regarding the overall size and scale and massing of the building. So this slide indicates the outline of the existing building and the existing landscaping on site between 29 Penny Avenue and 44 Witches Walk. The um, below section shows the scale of the proposal and the position of the development relative to the boundaries. 
The section also shows the height of the fourth floor, which is limited to one corner of the building. So in terms of um, ground floor, it provides 10 flats, four of which are two beds, six one bed, um, all of which are in accordance with space standards. Some concern was raised regarding accessibility as the upper floors are accessible by staircase and there's no lift proposed. As the site will be tenanted, the 10 units um, at ground floor are accessible and all other remaining flats will be rented out to appropriate occupiers. At first floor, there are a number of balcony areas that have been designed set into the building or with solid screens to ensure no direct views into neighbouring properties. The ground, first and second floor detail six one bed properties and four two bed properties on each floor. Um, the second floor mirrors the below floors and again meets space standards. And on the third floor, um, there are three flats uh, two one bed flats and one two bed flat. And again, members should note it's the southeast corner of the building only with the remaining building stopping at three storeys. Due to the flat roof design, this results in the height of 8.9 metres for the three storey element and 12 metres for the four storey element. So in terms of overall scale, there are a number of three storey pitch roof buildings within the vicinity of this site. Um, but as previously raised, this site, due to the backline position, would sit in isolation from any street scene. As such, whilst the design and materials appear more contemporary than those within the area, due to the position, it's not considered to result in an adverse impact on any street scene or give rise to any wider character concerns. The development is therefore considered by officers to be an appropriate size, scale and design and would comply with guidance in the MPPF and the local plan. There was a lot of concern raised by surrounding residents in terms of direct impact through overlooking and invasion of privacy. In terms of impact on neighbours, the building is closest to the southern boundary that forms the rear boundary of the nursing home. The distance from this boundary increases from 6.53 metres to 20.6 metres as you progress to the east. Properties in Penley Avenue back onto the northeast boundary and the building is set 23.4 metres from this boundary, resulting in a front to back separation of about 40 metres. Um, properties in Witches Walk back onto the southwest boundary with an interjecting footpath, um, and the building is set 14.4 metres from this boundary with a front to back separation of 24.5 metres. The building is located 11.9 metres from the northwest boundary, which forms the side and rear boundary of the firs. This is a one and a half storey property with dormers orientated to the northeast. Given the orientation and the distance from this and the surrounding residents, whilst the proposal will result in the introduction of a number of windows, it's not considered to result in an unacceptable level of overlooking or intrusion, given the urban nature and character of the wider area. The above slide shows visibility in both directions from the existing access, which would be improved as a result of the development to ensure appropriate 43 metre displays given the 30 mile per hour speed limit. The access to Penley Lodge at the entrance of the site would be retained and the footpath extended into the site and onto the parking area. The width of the access is acceptable for two way traffic and there is sufficient space within the parking area to allow for the turning of service vehicles. There are 35 parking spaces, including two visitor spaces and 32 cycle spaces are also proposed. This level of parking provision is broadly in accordance with um, Somerset parking strategy and the cycle spaces are controlled by condition. The application was supported with a transport statement, which confirmed traffic generation of approximately 11 trips during the weekday AM and PM period hours, which the highway officers confirmed can be accommodated within the capacity of the local highway network without giving rise to any adverse highway safety issues. So moving on to impact on ecology, the application was supported with the preliminary ecological appraisal, which was undertaken in March, which did identify the presence of bats on site. Further emergent surveys were carried out in May and June, which identified a roost. Um, as such, the county ecologist has recommended conditions requiring a licence and ecological mitigation to be carried out in accordance with the submitted BAT survey, a condition limiting lighting, um, site clearance and hedge tree removals, um, and a requirement for a landscape and ecological management plan to be submitted and agreed in writing. So subject to these, the application is considered to comply with policy D21 of the local plan. 
Moving on to drainage and surface water, the application was supported with a flood risk and drainage stroke, um, drainage statement, which confirmed that infiltration was not considered appropriate for the site. As such, an attenuation system with a controlled discharge was proposed and the lead local flood authority was satisfied with the details discussed and recommended a condition. So based on the information submitted and subject to the recommended condition, officers satisfied the development complies with policy D1 of the local plan. In terms of impact on heritage assets, um, the building is not listed and it's not within a conservation area, but it is considered to be a non-designated heritage asset. Lots of objections have been received during the application regarding concern for the loss of um, Penley House based on the age and detail of the property. Whilst it's not listed or within a conservation area, it would be considered a non-designated heritage asset. The development of the site as proposed would result in the complete removal of Penley House, although Penley Lodge, which um, was the gatekeeping cottage originally in connection with the wider estate in third party ownership, would be retained. As a non-designated heritage asset, paragraph 197 of the MPPF applies, which states that the effect of an application on the significance of a non-designated heritage asset should be taken into account in determining the application. A balanced judgment will be required having regard to the scale of any harm or loss and the significance of the heritage asset. The development will result in the loss of the building, but it has been confirmed that it's not suitable for modern living and there's no viable economic solution to enable the reuse of the building. The planning history for the site has also already consented the loss of the building through the previous application and is a material consideration in this case. Mitigation is also proposed on this application through the reuse of some of the existing materials within the garden with raised planters or benches. Whilst the loss of the building is unfortunate, for the reasons set out above, an objection on this basis could not be sustained. In terms of other material considerations, there would be significant economic benefits as part of the proposal, um, with the development providing a new generation of modern council homes. Um, this would also result in significant investment to address housing pressures associated with poor housing and homelessness. There's also a high number of environmental benefits proposed as part of the application with green waste and high quality topsoil soil due to be reused on the site. Um, a high specification of the flats and energy efficient measures have been designed into the affordable housing to make it affordable for living, including a fabric first high insulation enhanced thermal bridging and low air tightness target, triple glazing, efficient heating and hot water plant, photovoltaic panels on the roof and passive vents and a heat recovery unit. So in conclusion, the site is located within the settlement boundary and forms a brownfield site that's previously had consent for um, 36 flats. The principle of development subject to detailed considerations is accepted. The development would provide um, affordable rented accommodation that would meet identified need within the area and the size scale and design for the reasons set out within the report and presentation is considered by officers to be acceptable. Impact on adjoining properties has been set out within the slide for members consideration but officers are satisfied it wouldn't result in an adverse um, impact any different to an existing urban form um, and highway considerations are considered to be acceptable subject to conditions. Impact on ecology and drainage and surface water is considered to be acceptable subject to conditions and impact on the heritage asset whilst it would result in the loss of the heritage asset. Um, this has previously been consented, which ultimately is the fallback position for the site. So the application is recommended for approval subject to all the conditions listed. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> As you'll see, we have a, a number of speakers on this uh, application. So if we take uh, the first one first, which would be Gary Wynn. Is Gary Wynn present? And if so, could you turn on your microphone and let us know that it's working OK? Is Mr Wynn present? I'm not hearing anything at the moment. So I had heard that there might be a possibility that Mr Wynn might not be able to make it. Uh, and in that instance, um, registered on here <clears throat> and his microphone is off. Right. Again, Mr. Wynn, if you could turn your microphone on. If not, you might have again to try and log out and log back in again to see if we can get that working for you.
If not, as I say, it, it was possible that Mr. Wynne wasn't going to be able to make it, so we had arranged. Is Mr. Is Mr. Taylor present? Steve yeah, Taylor. Chairman. Are you okay, Mr. Taylor, to uh, to read Mr. Wynne's uh, submission? Yes, Chairman. Okay. In which case, I will. I, I know you don't need it, but I will remind you. You've got three minutes to address the committee, uh, and <coughs> you will hear the bell go when there's a minute left to go. So, if you could uh, please give Mr. Wynne's presentation, please. I am a resident of Pendy Avenue and have been all my life. Also, my parents were residents until the council told them that the three block project was happening and it wasn't safe to keep residents on site. This is around early 2019. My main concern with the new tower block is the sheer size, which will leave it towering over a lot of properties in the vicinity. It will also allow residents to over current residents in their gardens and properties. My eldest son is severely disabled and has a bedroom and bathroom built as an extension in the garden. In the summer, our garden is a haven for him, either enjoying a paddling pool, stretching his muscles on his bouncy castle or physio in his walker. In the summer, it will be overlooked and lose sunlight. It will reduce the value of some properties around, meaning homeowners in the area will pay for this poorly planned development directly, directly from their own investment. Road Lane is a busy family orientated community. Road Lane is already a busy road and with a possible 88 new residents at their cars and delivery vehicles will add considerable more traffic on the road with more noise and air pollution around the estate. School and care home, Bridgewater and the Sedgemore area need more housing for families, the elderly and the disabled. How many older people are living in large houses that could be freed up for families? How many disabled people or people with mobility issues are in unsuitable properties? The site has the potential to do more than being a high density housing scheme, which in time will have all the same problems as other projects have development since construction. Part of the sales pitch for the new flats is its carbon neutral running, modern eco materials, underground heating system and modern installation. But Pendy House has already absorbed its carbon footprint from its time of construction. Repurposing and building something more suitable for families would be cheaper, better for the environment and the community. It would also be a good move for the town to save part of its historical landscape. Bridgewater was dotted with large houses built by wealthy traders, landed gentry and farmers over the centuries. Pendy House has been a home to a former mayor and a justice of the peace. It may not be listed, but is part of our town's history and being brought up to date and reused to house families as it was intended for, could see it still being in use in another 200 years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Taylor, and, and thank you, Mr Wynne, for the uh, your submission. The next speaker we have is one of the ward councillors, Councillor Levy. Are you present? I am, yes. You're a little faint. I don't know whether your microphone could be any closer to you. Okay, if if uh, if you try and speak up because you are, as I say, you're, you're a little faint. But again, just to remind you, you'll hear the bell go when you've got one minute left to go. So please start when you're ready. Councillor Levy, can I just interrupt you for a minute? I, I, a number of members are, are finding it very difficult to, to hear what you're saying. So is, is there any way you can try and make your system louder or, or is there anyone else who 
has a copy of your your speech that they could read out for you. Um, I think Councillor Redman has. Could I just check that with Councillor Redman? Are, do do you have a copy of Councillor Levy, Levy's speech? Uh, Chair, sorry, uh, I don't. I it's on my system. It will take me some time to find it. I mean, it's not easily uh, accessible at the moment. Okay. What what I'm going to propose to do is is if again we'll we'll pause for a couple of minutes because I think it's important that we obviously hear from Councillor Levy, and unfortunately a number of members aren't aren't hearing what you're saying. Unfortunately, Liz. Yes. Okay, what I'll do then is I'll, I'll if, if members will, will bear with me, I will pause the meeting until quarter past. That gives us three or four minutes just to get uh, Councillor Levy able to uh, address us. Does Councillor Levy want to send it to me and I'll read it? Um, yes, okay. Okay. Thank you. Again, as I say, we'll, we'll just... Don't panic. We're, we're going to wait until quarter past anyway, so you've got a few minutes to uh, to get it over. But uh, sorry about that, Councillor Levy. Obviously, there's there's a slight technical issue at the moment, but uh, it's important that members hear what you're uh, what you're saying. So we'll we'll start again from the beginning of of Councillor Levy's presentation when we uh, when we get it. Thank you, Councillor Levy. D uh, Councillor Glassford, I noticed that you put a note in the in the chat. Was that just about the audibility, or was there uh, another issue that you wish to? That was the same, uh, Chairman. Okay, that's fine. Okay, Chairman, do you want me to um, read it? Hopefully, you won't need the three minutes, but I'm happy to. Um, I've now got it, so I'll read it on behalf of. Uh, Councillor Levy. Okay, I'll. I think we'll. If you just bear with me one minute until we get to quarter past, because we said we start at quarter past, just in case anyone did nip out for a uh, comfort break. Um, but we'll we'll just give them the one minute left to go, and then we'll start. Right, Mrs. Nichols. I'm, I'm, according to my computer, it's quarter past now. So, uh, if if we can make that, uh, if if you'd like to give uh, Councillor Levy's address, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Chair, members, I am one of the ward councillors for Hamp, and would like to thank you for the opportunity to address the committee with my concerns about this application. As you will be aware, this application differs considerably from the original agreed proposal of three two-storey blocks. Local residents agree that the site needs redevelopment, but are shocked and surprised by what is now being proposed. Again, the number of objections received will have made you aware of this. My fellow councillor, Councillor Lee Redman, and I met a couple of months ago together with concerned residents to view the site and to try and envisage what impact the proposed development will have. The surrounding area is residential and consists of two storey homes plus an old people's home adjacent to the site. Once we had marked out the footprint, it became clear how overpowering this development would be. 
not only would it be exceptionally close to neighbouring properties in places, but would also be totally out of keeping with the surrounding area. The height of the proposed development means people living in the surrounding properties will be subject to a greater loss of privacy, as not only will their gardens be overlooked, but also their living areas, including their bedrooms. The plans and photos do not convey the negative impact this application will have on the area. I wish to stress again that local residents and councillors are not against the site being developed, but object to this particular application. However, in view of what I have said and the number of objections received, I would respectfully ask that the committee refuse this application or at least request a site visit before a final decision is made. Thank you very much. And uh, again, thank you, Councillor Levy. Uh, Councillor Redman. Good morning, Chair. Good morning. Just to remind you again, you'll hear the bell when there's a, a minute of your time left to go. So start when you're over. Councillor Redmond. Chair, members, thank you for the opportunity to speak to committee. You have heard from Councillor Levy. She outlined the impact this development will have on the community I live in. I'm speaking today as a local councillor and resident. I have been asked by many, many residents to try and convey to you the negative impact this building will have on the area and their lives. I wish to oppose this application and will ask you to refuse it. Before someone, someone shouts NIMBY, I need to be clear. Residents are not objecting to the demolition and development of the site. The now empty building is an eyesore. The area needs regeneration and the community needs more accommodation. In fact, most of the people that I speak for are happy with the already agreed proposal. They are content with the three blocks that will provide the accommodation required and not to dramatically impact people's lives the way this monstrosity would. I urge you to go and look at the site. Pictures do not do this huge development justice. This proposal is a massive change in existing developments locally. The block will fill a massive space. The footprint and height of the four storey cube proposed is ridiculous. I have been contacted by numerous residents local to the proposed site. The main concerns relate to overlooking, loss of privacy and the overshadowing caused by loss of light the building would have on their lives. You will have taken the time to review the more than 50 objections from all around the area. I have a petition of local people with nearly 100 signatures. In these strange times, you will re respect how great that is. There will be a loss of use from many properties and a huge loss of privacy to those people neighbouring the site. Being limited to three minutes means I cannot adequately explain how this eyesore will negatively impact the area. I ask you to refuse the application. The weight of objections and the size of the building deserves full consideration of all the facts, facts that photos cannot purvey. The new plans mean aspects of the proposed building will be towering over homes and an old people's home just metres away. Some sides and the top of the new building will be visible more than a mile away. The town council and local councillors will fully support the large volume of valid objections from local residents and if members may be minded to support this massive building we ask that you request a site visit to allow you to fully recognize the impact this will have better still refuse the application and send the council back to the original plan members these are genuine planning objections the proposed building will overshadow many properties causing loss of light it will overlook many properties causing loss of privacy the visual impact of the development is out of keeping with and out of scale with the area when compared to the existing and surrounding buildings. Members, this is an easy decision. Please refuse the application. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Redman, and, and perfectly timed. Thank you. Uh, our final speaker is uh, Com Coyle, who is the agent for the application. Can you just turn on your microphone and confirm that you can hear us please. Hello Chair, yeah I can hear you, can you hear me? Yes we can, thank you. So again you've got the three minutes to address the committee and you'll hear the bell when there's one minute left to go so please start whenever you're ready. Thank you, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak in favour of this application. My name is Colin Coyle, I'm the agent acting on behalf of the applicant Serge Wards District Council. Serge and Council are investing five million pounds in the construction of affordable homes to meet, to meet the ever increasing housing need in Bridgewater. This development of 33 one bed and two bed self-contained apartments 
will have a very positive and key impact in fulfilling some of that growing housing need. Through the development of this application, it has been established that there is a considerable lack of smaller accommodation in this area of Sedgemore District. It is integral to Sedgemore Council's long-term housing strategy that smaller accommodation such as this development is available to their tenants, not only to meet the need of smaller families, couples and individuals, but to enable tenants that are currently occupying larger accommodation that they may not need to downsize to a more suitable housing type that will reduce expenditure on energy bills, council tax and so on. This will also free up larger accommodation for those who really require it. The site is located less than two miles from the town centre, with road lane being a main arterial, arterial route, with the bus stop directly outside of the site, taking you into the town centre within a five minute bus ride or so. Its location is therefore sustainable and meets with government requirements for sustainable de development set out in the MPPF. The design of the building follows zero, zero carbon principles. If this application was approved and the building constructed, it would be one of the most energy efficient, low carbon residential buildings in the Sedgemore district. In the current climate, this point should not be ignored. Fuel poverty and a low standard of living accommodation is all too prevalent in the Bridgewater area. And this is an opportunity to take steps forward, providing comfortable, affordable and extremely efficient homes for those who really need it. The building itself is laid out in a courtyard design with over 2000 square meters of green and landscaped area surrounding it, which will retain and enhance existing biodiversity and retains the vast majority of trees and hedges that exist on the site, enabling screening. There is adequate and well-considered amenity space for car parking, cycle parking, refuse and recycling storage. The building has been carefully positioned to adhere to all overlooking constraints in all directions and is largely screened from view, which vastly reduces its impact. Yes, some of the surrounding properties will have a partial view of the building, of the completed building. However, in planning terms, being well outside overlooking and overbearing constraints, the impact on existing tenants is compliant with planning guidance and should not outweigh the need for this type of accommodation in Bridgewater. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, any comments or questions, please? Uh, Councillor Hendry, I think you were first, please. Okay. Good morning, Mr Chairman. Thank you for this. I'd like to uh, thank the case officer for such a, a detailed presentation. Uh, first and foremost, there's a huge need around the town for social housing. We all, we all know that. There's, that's beyond having discussions about. We know it. This project itself, I actually think is really, really good in its, in its own right, the way it stands. In Burnham-on-Sea, we have a very similar thing, four storeys high block of flats in Victoria Street. And at the time, there's a lot of objections, but you expect that anyway. In the main, it's already underway and it's been built and actually looks it looks really good as it stands. Apparently, house had to, had to go. We all know that as well. That's been discussed and done. These flats look like they're going to be very high quality in so many areas. I think it's really good. Policy D1 local plan complies with that sales through. The statutory consultees are all on board with this. No objections whatsoever from any of them. The sale alone, if I've done my calculations right, is around 32k. Uh, to reduce the value of neighbouring properties is never a reason to have something like this turned down. That doesn't come into play here. Uh, it is an info project, looks really good. You obviously can't please everybody, and you'll probably find if you looked into a lot of the people who object to this already have one from the social housing stock, so they are home and dry and probably don't even live anywhere near it. Uh, all in all, the parking spaces, the development, the standard of quality, go on and on. I think it's a really good project. And I, at the moment, I don't have any problem, but I'm happy to listen to what everybody else has to say. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. We've got a number of other members who've indicated. We've got Councillors Pierce, Gibson, Glassford and Kingham. So we'll come to Councillor Pierce first. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, I mean, we certainly do need more social housing. And I'm really pleased to see the green credentials for this proposal. However, it is the, the things that do concern me are the size and scale of it and potential for overlooking. The fact we have 
both ward members, there have been 56 letters of objection and a petition with over 100 signatures suggests that, um, you know, this, I think this application needs more investigation. Um, my particular worries are it's the outward facing nature of the proposal. I find it hard to understand how it's not overlooking uh, other properties and its close proximity to Oak Tree's nursing home is a concern to me as well. Um, it is an unusual site. I know it fairly well. Um, so I, I would like to propose a site visit um, so that we can get a, 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 a feel of the, of the site itself and the uh, challenges it presents. Thank you. Thank you. The, the one thing I would just mention to members, obviously, in, in terms of a, a site visit, we're obviously under COVID regulations at the moment. We would not be able to carry out a site visit until those regulations change. So it's it would be a, 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 obviously a, a significant delay in the process, but that's something members need to uh, need to obviously take into account. Uh, Councillor Gibson. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering why it moved from a block of three to this big massive block that looks, uh, I, I don't think it looks very nice, I think it looks a bit like a prison on the design. Um, um, I just wondered why it moved from, from that uh, to this um, massive, uh, massive sort of development that's centralised. Is it to create, is it to create the, uh, the area in the middle? Is it, or, or, or what? What is it? Okay. Mrs DeVries, are you able to address that question? Yes, thank you. Um, so the slide members have got up in front of them at the moment is the planning history. So this is the consented fallback position for the site. Um, the position of Penley House in this slide is, is roughly in this location. It was a hybrid application. So effectively, the detailed element of the scheme was demolition of Penley House and replacement with this flatted block. Um, it was, it was um, sort of two and a half storey accommodation, but it was very cleverly designed in terms of windows, so it wouldn't have an adverse impact on the neighbours, um, but very close to the, the boundary. The This element of the site was an outline, so it wasn't set, but this was them indicating where they could put blocks of development. Um, I would suggest you would struggle to get 36 flats in those three blocks if you were limiting yourself to two storey, it, there has been reference from speakers about all the blocks being, being two storey, that wasn't set by this consent. So this building was set, which was about two and a half storey with accommodation in the roof space, um, but these blocks weren't set in terms of size and scale. So the assumption is, if they were trying to demonstrate you could get 36 flats in in total, bearing in mind that was only seven flats, so those two blocks would have had to have accommodated 29 flats, the scale of these are likely to be more than two storey, but if if that came forward as an approval of reserve matters application, obviously we would be looking at scale of impact and impact on neighbours to determine whether the size and scale of them were acceptable and whether they could get 29 flats in there. But mm -hmm. um, scale of economies as well, if you build three separate units, it's going to cost more than one unit. Um, also with the infrastructure to come in here and the amount of hard standing, you've lost a lot of the open green space by separating the development over multiple buildings than what you would if you consolidate the development into one space. By pushing the development more central into the space, it does allow you a lot more relief from the boundaries. So it does give you the maximum separation distance that the neighbours could have versus the quite tight development that has, has been consented as part of the fallback. Yeah, so basically it's sort of like the biggest you can get in the middle, I think it's just over. I do think it's just too big. Um, there also another question about the trips. You said uh, eleven trips. Was that right? You thought that that would be eleven trips out of the place when there might be what eighty-eight hundred people maybe living here. It was the highway section. Just bear with me while I'm going through two highways. So in terms of the trip generation, um, it's. Um, 11 trips during a weekday a.m. or p.m. peak hours. So it's, it's, you know, maximum trips expected at 
um, say school run period or school pickup period would be 11 trips during the weekday AM PM peak, um, which was demonstrated through the transport statement they submitted on the application. County highways were happy with the trip generation and they were happy that generally that could be accommodated within the highway network without causing highway safety issue. Oh, I think 11 is quite low estimate there. OK, I've got Mr Howlett. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I was only going to come back on um, a, a comment that Councillor Pierce made about in terms of the overlooking and the impact and, and trying to assess that. And obviously, you know, agree entirely what you said about the um, site visits. And, and unfortunately, at, at this stage, we couldn't visit the site. It, it wouldn't be uh, wouldn't be socially responsible and, and possibly not legal either if we did that. So um, we have to find an alternative. Now, the alternative that we've been doing is trying to put as much information as possible in terms of the impact on the properties on the properties uh, surrounding the site. So I did wonder if if it was worth Mrs. De Three's going back through that slide, the slide that she's just put up that explains the separation distances, because that's obviously a key part of how we've assessed um, impact on neighbouring properties and also explaining about the balconies, because I think that's again something that we that could do with a bit more detail, Dawn, if that's OK. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Mr. De Vries. Um, in, in terms of the balconies, there are balconies serving the first, second um, floors as as you may be able to see on this bit, so this edge, it goes flank across. So the balcony is screened from this direction, which is the closest point in terms of potential concerns about overlooking. The balconies themselves are also fairly modest in terms of footprint. So you wouldn't be able to get um, a set of table and chairs out there, for example. It would be a, a sort of standout area only that people would spend sort of fairly minimal time in. This balcony in this corner is the one open balcony with, with no recesses and no screening. Um, the other balconies are set into the building. So again, screened by existing walls. There's a wall here, a wall along here. These ones, um, this elevation doesn't actually have any balconies at all. And there's a screen wall here as well. So in terms of balconies, they are set into the building or they've got screen walls to sort of reduce um, sort of direct looking because the properties on this boundary are closer to this boundary but they're orientated side on so it's not a, a front to back relationship this elevation that's it is the front elevation of the building because it's been arranged in a block looking outwards in all the directions but in terms of distance um the building's 23.4 meters um so there's approximately a separation distance of 40 meters between these two properties um, and then again, the back of the nursing home, if I can show, I mean, it's it's 6.53 at the closest point here, going to 20.6 here, and again, sort of 14.4 metres um, front to back and a separation of 24.5 in this location with regards to the nursing home. I think if I can show you the aerial shot and perhaps even the design inspiration for the unit so oak trees is the nursing home here it's a square arrangement very similar to what's being proposed in this site but obviously this is a smaller scale nature but in terms of overall scale impacts um, there are a number of three-story pitch roof buildings in the wider area um, which were shown to members um, because of the pitch roofs these are actually a similar height to what's being proposed because the development is flat roof so the um, heights were previously mentioned is 8.9 for the three story element and um, I think 12 point something if memory serves for the four story element. Um, but it's it's comparable to the size of some of the development within the wider area. Thank you very much. As I say, we've got a number of councillors at Councillor Glassford, Kingham, Bradford and Revens. So Councillor Glassford. Is Councillor Glassford there? I don't know whether you're on mute, Councillor Glassford, if you could just try once more, and if not, I'll move on to Councillor Kingham and come back to you. Uh, okay. Oh, thank you, Councillor Glassford. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, uh, I, I usually go out for my exercise. I walk for about an hour, which I think is permitted under the new rules. So I, I decided to walk up Road Lane and and I, and I uh, actually had a little walk around it as part of my exercise and uh, went back and carried on walking up, saw the three-storey flats, 
also before you get to uh, that development we've got two blocks of four-story flats uh quite close to where we built the houses on the old uh, black horse site uh, which have been up there for years so on street scene it's not out of place and actually if you stand on the pavement just past the oak trees uh house housing place and uh, you can only see a bit of a chimney pot from an actual road lane and although this is like, like this the fourth floor will make it a bit higher it is well it's well disguised because of all the trees and plantations i think this is a very good application and uh, i shall support it thank you thank you councillor kingham yeah thank you chairman um it's the first time i've seen the uh design of the buildings it's good to see that um Sedgemore is providing some modern living for our tenants um, it's something which is well needed the development i think i think people get a little bit concerned when they see a tall building but um when you look at the pictures of the three-story brick houses which were on the screen a little while ago i think this doesn't compare right i think it's far more in keeping with modern living design it has all the uh green credentials which as part of Sedgemore's climate change policy. Um, I think when you see something modern like this, I think it's, um, people tend to sort of get a bit frightened because it looks, it probably looks taller than it really is. And on, on the whole, when you look at it, I think this is a, a good proposition, a good development, and I would like to move the recommendation, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bradford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I did. I, I called to go to Bridgewater yesterday, and whether I'm naughty or not, I did drive in around the site, staying in my car, and stayed in the car for 20 minutes looking at it, which I think is very, very important. You cannot decide on these decisions until you you have looked at it. You've really got to look at it and put yourself in that position. I think Alex Glassford said a lot of things I was going to say, if I'm if I'm perfectly honest. It, it, it's a site that's begging for something to be done with. It's untidy, it's untidy, it's a bit of a mess, a bit of a disaster there at the moment. Some of the trees are going to stay. So the one little thing that probably concerned me, it's a fourth story. But I think that's got to be incorporated with a bit of the building that's going to be left possibly. That's the only reason that's, that's, that's been done. It's low carbon. It's modern, it's going to look different than everything else around, but, but change is inevitable sometimes. And, and once people get used to it after five or six months, and then it, it should blend in and, and be be what's needed. And, and people do need these houses, there's no question about it. No doubt when it's done, they'll be queuing up for somebody to get in there. And really, we can't stand in the way of progress. Sometimes it's a big site and it wants utilizing properly. And I think by these plans that are out, whoever, whoever did it is very good. And uh, the planning officer as well, well presented it and in the way it's done. Um, the access, in my opinion, is no problem. It's slightly improved back a little bit. So you've got better, better access in Road Lane. Quite a lot of traffic up and down there, taking rat runs very often in North Petherton. That's how it is. But, but generally, um, and I'm going to support it and I'm going to, and I'm going to second Alex Glassford, right? I'm going to second the proposal, Mr. Chairman, OK? And if I'm naughty going to look at it, so be it. But, but, but you cannot make decisions until you look at it. The eye never lies. My favourite saying, you know that? And I've been to look, and it's begging for improvement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, so just, just to confirm, Councillor Bradford, you're seconding the proposal to move the recommendation I think was made by Councillor Kingham? Is that mm -hmm. right? That's correct, Chairman. Yeah. And I'll and I'll second that. Okay. Okay, that's fine. It was just I think you said Councillor Glassford. I just wanted to make sure it was the I've got the right proposition that you were seconding. Okay. And, and if anything can be done about the fourth story, so be it. Just to make it that perhaps the, the dominance on Penley and I and I deeply deep respect the people who've spoken this morning. They're all very passionate about their communities like I am. And and it will be a slightly overlooking. But once once it blends in and people get used to it, I think I think it's needed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I've got other speakers. We've got councillors Revens, Hendry, Gibson, and then I think Bolt. So, uh, Councillor Revens. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And you know, first of all, commend the officer on, a, on an exemplary report. Um, it was a very, very detailed presentation, and I, I, I welcome it greatly. Um, my, I am concerned about this false story. I think we're so close to a really good application here, but I, uh, it's this false story that really troubles me. I'm all for the social housing, I'm all for a good quality, fantastic environmental credentials. There's, there's so much in this that I'm, I'm, I, I want to support. But this full story really troubles me because of the impact it has on the neighbouring properties. Um, I've not been to look at it. I've followed the rules and, and that's the situation that we're in. Um, I would have loved in normal times to have supported a site visit. And given given the applicant is unlikely to do us for non-determination, um, maybe deferring it for a site visit might be a better alternative than, than than going ahead. I would like to understand a little bit more about the tree that's shown in slide 21. Um, it's shown as being higher than the building. I just want to check that that's the case. And also what's what screening does that give in winter as well as when it's in full leaf? Um, I also noticed the width of the driveway wasn't wasn't um, very wide for 33 cars being parked up there. I do wonder whether it needs to incorporate a passing place as well. And I did, I think here the um, officers say that the parking was broadly in line with County Council guidance and broadly in line gives me a little bit of cause for concern that it may be doing us a little bit short. So I would prefer to see this application um, us to go to a site visit. I would prefer to see this application come back with three stories um, and a couple of queries that I would like responded to, please, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mrs. Debris. Thank you. Um, in terms of scale, um, this was a section through the site. So this is um, 29 Penny Avenue. This is the indication of the existing building that's on site. And this is 44, which is walk. Um, which lies to the side. There's a little footpath that runs to the back, which members would have seen via the other um, notices. The landscaping along the edge with which is walk, which was in the photos that I showed earlier, that's all being retained. Um, it's three storey at this point, which is is sort of marginally compar comparable to the ridge height. It's slightly higher than the ridge height, but there is a good degree of separation between these two. So officers are happy in terms of size, scale and dominance that at that distance. You know, whilst there will be some mutual overlooking, it is in an urban area that's built up. There is a lot of mutual overlooking existing, not from this site currently, but if, if this site is developed, it's anticipated there would be a, a degree of overlooking introduced, but not to the extent that it would result in an unacceptable intrusion in terms of privacy and amenity. Um, the fourth story element, which is, is this bit, um, again, you know, the degree of separation between the two, Given the height, given the distance from the boundary, because site boundaries at this point here, um, officers are generally comfortable that the extra height, also because it's flat roof, is fairly limited. Whilst it is four stories in height, it is flat roof. Um, the graphics that they've provided, whilst lovely, I do think make the four story element look quite dominant in the 3D visuals that they've provided. It's good to give members an indication, but the sections are more accurate um, representation. So this is Penley Avenue. That's their garden. That's the site boundary. That's the position of the four story element. This large tree that's shown that is higher than the building that I did quiz the agent about to confirm that this wasn't inaccurate. It has been confirmed that that's an accurate representation. They've been out. They've measured the tree. Um, that is an accurate height representation of that tree. Um, the one thing I will say is um, it's a seasonal tree. So during the summer, it will provide a lot of screening. During the winter, it will be a lot of branches that you'll be able to see through. Um, so that point is is taken. Um, in terms of the layout, bear with me. Sorry, I'm just trying to cover all of your points, Councillor Revan. So the graphics, I think if I go back to this, because the angle that this has been taken at, it's it's been taken to um, sort of focus the impressiveness, if you like, in terms of the design solution. So it does unfortunately make this bit appear really, really dominant. But as you can see, sort of because of the angle, the three story element tapers down. So this isn't 
a, a true representation in terms of size and scale, but it is just this front corner that's being done at the additional floor. And if I can take you back to the layout of the site. So in terms of, so you can understand from this visual, this element along here, that's the four story bit. So this bit, all of this bit in the surround, apologies, um, that's all three story. This is the four story section. The reason this was acceptable or considered acceptable as four stories is that the, the separation distances on the previous slide of 40 meters, that's taken at the closest point it does angle away and the boundary angles away and so that the separation distance is greater at the point it goes to four stories and given it sort of overlooks the communal car parking area it wasn't considered to give rise to such a, a, a significant issue that we raised objection with it um, in terms of the access um, and the width of the access it is five meters in length so it does allow for sufficient space for two-way vehicles up and down the access road so there's no parking bays proposed but this is the neighbour's um, garage that was seen on the previous photo so they're still able to get in and through to their property the improvement is the increased width of this because at the moment the um, access road is stepped away from this boundary so the access road would be going close to the edge of this boundary but it would also introduce the pavement along this edge and into the car park area so that you could cross over so there is safe pedestrian access into the site um, and the tree is retained to slide 21 you referenced in particular i'm assuming it's it's this tree that i've already covered councillor evans yes that's correct it, it, what i wanted to get was an impression of what you know clearly as you you know the diagrams are are I can't remember the phrase that you used. Um, I'm just trying to be diplomatic and not, not use the word. A little misleading. bit misrepresentative. <laughs> um, it's, it's because um, this one's a visual. Yeah. It, you know, it, it's not to scale. This this I, vision isn't to scale. I would also um, I would also contend that the 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 tree represented there is also misleading, because when it's not in 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 leaf, it will there will be considerably more over looking and overbearing. From a four-story building on those properties on Penn Lee Avenue is the point that I'm I'm making. Yeah, in in terms of height, this image does show. I couldn't get all of the tree in the photo from this <laughs> view, um, but obviously that's the height of Penn Lee, which is a two-story. Yeah. Which you know, it is it is quite a substantial tree on site. In, yeah, um, and it it, it provides it would provide screening in summer, but mm. not in winter, and that's the point that I think I wanted to clarify. Thank you. Mr. Jeffries, were you also able to clarify the um, broadly in line with parking standards? Uh, yes, apologies. Um, if I go back to the layout again, so the layout of the um, development, obviously there's 33 flats proposed. There are a mixture of one and two bed flats. Um, there is one space proposed for each flat, so there are 33 parking spaces and there are two visitor spaces. Um, it's it's broadly in line in terms of every single unit has a parking space. Um, I think it's short on visitor spaces. So there are two visitor spaces proposed, um, but I think it, it probably should have had a couple more. But in terms of um, provision on site, given that all of the development is one and two beds and there's a space for each flat, in addition to two visitor spaces, we, we were generally satisfied from that from a highway um, perspective. Thank you. I've got a number of councillors still wishing to speak. I've got councillors Hendry, Gibson, Bolt and Perry. So, Councillor Hendry. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Further to what I said at the very beginning, but actually I stand by everything. It's, it's all proved to me to be correct. Uh, councillor Alex Glassford um, hit the nail on the head and everything he said was just spot on about the street scene. You know, and everything he said was just absolutely first class. The, the four story element. <laughs> That's all right, Councillor Andrew. We'll bear with you while you get the <laughs> get the dogs back under control. Do you want me to move on to the next speaker, Councillor Andrew, and come back to you? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Okay, we, we will. We'll, we'll move on to Councillor Gibson. I'll come back to Councillor Hendry in just a moment. Councillor Gibson. Yeah, I'd like to second Councillor Pierce's uh, uh, proposition to go in to ask to, to, to go for a site visit, really. Okay. Please. Thank you. Councillor Bolt. Uh, just a few questions, really. Uh, um, Mr. Fries has given us the height of the four story version at 12 metres. What's the existing height of Penley House? Uh, that's number one. Um, number two would be the bin services. Um, I'm, it, it didn't highlight it. I'm assuming that that's in the, yep, that, that's the area. So they'll be collected in that area. They aren't having to be taken down the driveway. Um, the next is, um, I'm not sure. We've got 13 uh, two bed flats. I gather that's for families, probably with small kids. Is there not a, a play area uh, allocated um, with regards to that? Uh, I agree totally with um, Councillor Revens's comments about, you know, it, it's, it's nice to have something new and everything else. But, and we've talked about street scene, but the four story and the dominance there is going to be seen by people from Penley and Witcher's Walk. Uh, and it will be quite a dominant view, um, especially during the winter. It's, it's the height of the, the fourth story, which I, I think I've got the stumbling block with. Um, but yeah, if, if those other questions could be um, answered, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. DeBreeze. Thank you. Um, I don't have the height of Penley House to hand. Um, I, I could scale it off the existing uh, documents, but it would take me a little bit of time to gather that. It is two storey with a pitched roof and being the age that it is, it's a slightly taller than standard sort of property. So if I was to hazard a guess based on the photos, I'd, I'd sort of go to somewhere between um, what, two and a half, five, six, seven metres in height, I would suggest maybe. Um, I can get the adequate measurements for you but it will take me time and I'll have to come out of the system and scale it off but I would if we hazard a guess at seven meters so the um, proposed block would be sort of 1.9 meters higher um, set further away from the boundary in terms of the three-story element and higher again for the four-story bit in the corner um, in terms of the accommodation it's one and two bed um, properties I there isn't a play area there, there is um, a nice green surround to the development and it's well located in terms of other facilities. Um, a lot of people on the housing list are hidden households and people unable to get onto the housing list. So whilst there are a lot of people with um, children, there are also a lot of people who don't have children that require one two bed um, accommodation. As um, Homes in Sedgemoor would be leasing it, they would be looking for appropriate people to fill um, the flatted development and um, as it was suggested by the agent there's a lot of accommodation taken up by existing households that only need one or two beds which could release subsequently sort of three bed properties in sort of residential areas with play parks and things like that for families but um, that's an assumption rather than um, fact it, it would be a management issue for homes in Sedgemoor in terms of occupation. Thank you if we come back to uh, Councillor Hendry I do apologise to everybody. First off, I think a dog saw a rabbit in the gardens. Uh, can I ask um, Don De Vries, I've, I've, I've kind of forgotten here, what's the overall height, the, the maximum height of the, the fourth storey, given it's got a flat roof? Um, if you bear with me one second, I'll get the right measurement for you. I've got Not it referenced something. in the report. Yeah. Just trying to find the relevant section. <clears throat> This is a bit where I think I should have put it specifically on one of the slides, so it would have been a bit more easily accessible. A reasonable figure would do, it doesn't have to be exact. Yeah, um, I, I think it's about 12 metres, but... Oh, okay, okay. The You can't refuse 
a project like this because a tree might shed its leaves in the winter. That doesn't work. It just that's that's not a reason to actually turn something down. The Penley Avenue, so I've got my, got my notes here. Penley Avenue is far enough back from the fourth story, given it's got a flat roof with this huge tree in between to, uh, oh, sorry, something's just come up, uh, to be acceptable is perfectly okay. Councillor Alex Glassford, as I said before, got everything absolutely correct, and I agree with every word he said. A site visit is not required for this. Not my opinion, it's not. You can see everything very clearly here on, on what's been shown to us with all the slides. So I stand by what I said at the very, very beginning of this. I think it's a good project. I have absolutely no problem. I would have seconded it myself, but it's already been done. So thank you. Bye. I, I can just confirm quickly. The height of the three story element is 8.9 metres. The height of the four story element is 12. Okay. No, that's that's fine. That's acceptable for me. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I would just say um, to Mr Coyle, I, I, I understand you're, you're uh, aiming to be helpful, but unfortunately, I, I must ask you, you, you can't really be involved in the in the debate while it's going on. So I, I do understand that your the messages that are going in the chat are, are aimed to, to, to help the, the councillors, but we do need to take that information through the officers rather than rather than from from yourself as the agent. But uh, as I say, I do understand it's, it's trying to be helpful. Um, we've got a couple of other councillors who've registered to speak, um, Councillor Perry and then Councillor Grimes. And then I think we'll be looking towards um, moving, a, a, taking a resolution. So Councillor Perry. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, can you just, I, I couldn't quite see how many flats are proposed on the fourth story? And, and would it not be acceptable to just lose the fourth story at all? Um, can you just also um, show how close the, it is to the, the care home and which I think you put that the, uh, the four story bit was sort of probably overlooking that particular area. Can you just tell me, please? OK, there are three flats on, on the top floor. So there's two one bed flats and one two bed flat. Um, so in terms of layout, there's there's one one bed flat in that location. This is the staircase to go up to the accommodation. Um, that's the two bed flat. So it's it's a double room and a single room in the two bed flat. And again, this is the one bed flat in in that location. So again, for members, it, it's that corner of the building that's got the accommodation in it. So there's one flat there, staircase and accessing area, two bed flat on the corner, and then one bed flat. In the end, so it's it's three flats on the top floor. Um, in terms of location relative to the care home, so this is the um, boundary. The one thing that's different in the graphics, um, because we amended it during the application, is originally they were proposing balconies um, on this edge, which we've relocated to this edge to, to ensure that there's not an elevated view from this position. At the very closest point, because this is the point that um, I sort of had a look at at the very closest point it's six and a half meters that goes out to 20.6 so from here to this boundary here that's 20.6 in terms of separation from the care home there's a building um to the back of the care home here um but the main care home itself is actually fronting onto road lane so if i get the so in terms of here so oak trees which is the main care home structure and then that's the um sort of single story extension out the back so it's it's um 6.5 meters from here going out to 20 meters from this boundary and then from the main block of accommodation that's set slightly further back thank you what i would just say to members in in terms of any planning application obviously we have the application that's before us that we're making the decision on today in terms of particular elements of that application you sh you shouldn't be turning it down because something else might be better if you feel that a particular element makes it unacceptable then that is something that you can make a decision on but the fact that something else might be slightly better doesn't is, isn't a, isn't a reason for turning down what's in front of you it's, it's whether it's acceptable or, or not is 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 what's in front of you uh, I did mention we only had two speakers left. Um, Councillor Murphy obviously is, is indicated through the uh, the raised hand, so I have got him down next. Uh, so I'll take Councillor Grimes and then Councillor Murphy, and then we'll move to a, a vote on the on the proposal. So we have Councillor Grimes. Thank you, Chairman. 
Um, thank you, Mr. DeFries, for a, a very thorough presentation. I don't believe it's feasible to defer for a site visit at this time. And very good plans have enabled us to make a decision. Yes, a site visit may have been preferable, but I am happy to support this application with the information that we've got in front of us. And I think it's a very good application. Thank you, Chairman. OK, I've got Ms. Councillor Murphy, then I've got uh, Mr. Howlett and. Whoa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Shall I speak? Yes, please do. <clears throat> Thank you, I'm Councillor Murphy. I, I, am, I am a little bit distressed at this application. I love the application. I like the, the, the modern modernity of the building. I'm very concerned about the lack of imagination that's been used in the actual design of the building, especially this H block prison style, um, in my opinion, and agreeing with Lee Gibson um, design. Um, looking at the, the, the actual layout of the flats, it's been designed without children in mind. And I would like to know, first of all, one of the questions I'll be asking is, how far is the nearest play park or how far are, are areas for children to actually play? Because you're talking about quite a lot of flats, very tightly uh, positioned to maximize the, <laughs> the the amount of flats you can get in with no verandas, verandas or balconies, not verandas, balconies outside, no space outside for the children to play. So they'd have to come down three and four stories each time to play outside in an area where there's no playing. Uh, this is a very, very, uh, in my opinion, it's a, they've gone for uh, density, as always, density, overbearing, overlooking, without, it would appear without much of a regard for D25 protecting residential amenity in the surrounding area, particularly the nursing home. I agree with uh, everything that um, has been said in some respects. Okay, yes, it's a very good thing for, um, you know, for housing, for especially for those who need it, social housing, and that is a definite need. But when you when you are going to make one and two bedroom flats that w with uh, the second bedroom being a single bedroom, it's clearly for a child. And so I, I, I have to say that the I am deeply concerned about this and I agree with those who have suggested that we go for a site visit in the fullness of time, particularly to look at the fourth story, which I think is really, I have to say, ridiculous that you have put a fourth story on this. Uh, in, in contradiction to one of my colleagues who spoke about the four stories of flats in Burnham on Sea, right to the pavement edge, and right next door to a very old uh, row of terraced houses who are crying their eyes out about the, this, this, uh, and complaining bitterly about the overshadowing, overbearing um, people looking into their gardens. It's absolutely horrific. We, ha I've had to visit several people there to try and console them about the nature of this development in Burnham on Sea, and this is reminds me of it in particular that it, it is it is very high in places it is very tight in its uh, in in when you come out of it you notice that you showed don de Vries, i think showed mrs de Vries showed uh, the fourth story corner flats i mean when you come out of this corner flats you, you are there is no room to do anything except go down the stairs so a child with a bike for example is going to have a lot of problems i think this is a poor design a, a lack of imagination beyond anything I've seen for a long time from Sedgemoor. And uh, I would suggest that I would, I certainly will be supporting anybody who uh, comes up with a resolution to have a delay so we can go and look at this site and, and in some ways recommend uh, a change of design. I am not happy with this at all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if I come to Mr. Howler, I would just again, can I remind everyone who's attending the meeting who is is not part of the committee that the, the chat boxes are there for committee members to indicate that they wish to speak uh, we we cannot be having contributions from uh, uh, members of the public or councillors uh, and 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 to be honest councillors sh should know that um, and I would ask uh, councillors you may have your views but please this is now for the committee to make their decisions on the presentations they've had I, I, you you really cannot be adding uh, information into the chat at this stage. Uh, Mr Howlett, and then I have got Councillor Gibson and Councillor Scott, and I am going to move to a vote. So, Council Mr Howlett. Thank you, Chairman. It was just to, to try and address the fourth floor issue um, once for all, really, because obviously the, taking it out of the scheme would mean the loss of three 
homes. So, you know, ultimately that's something that we we wouldn't want to do or wouldn't want to support, given that as the case officer set out in so much detail today, um, and I'd like to thank uh, Dawn as well, because it's a difficult application and it's important that um, members do get as much detail as possible, particularly in the circumstances where site visits are, are very difficult. But I'd have to say you've had more detail about the impact of that fourth story set out to you as part of the presentation and the officer responding to the questions than you could ever do on a site visit because the building's not there after all. So what we've done is set out surroundings and the context in some detail. So, I, you know, I'm not sure members would get anything further other than delay for, you know, delaying the project uh, in terms of going for a site visit. Also, of course, with the fourth floor, there would be an additional benefit which was identified by the police um, architectural liaison officer that would improve surveillance over the parking area as well so that you know there are some natural benefits from um, some height on the building particularly where there's no impact on any of the adjacent properties which we've demonstrated today so i i, I agree with the majority of speakers i think um you know it, it's a good scheme it's a scheme that uh, as a council we can stand behind um particularly because of its green credentials the fact it's meeting an identified specific need where there's also a shortfall in need it's a particular need that we find very difficult to get through normal planning processes other than direct provision. So, you know, as a council, we should be proud that we are trying to directly address, you know, what is a massive shortfall in, in Bridgewater. That's it, Chairman, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gibson. Um, I think it's overpopulated the building. Can I look at the, uh, have I put the, the slide for the top floor up again? Because I just want to have a look at the windows. Uh, because it's, it appeared that there was just one window. For the flat, um, the one at the top I'm looking at, there's just one window. Yeah, one window for an entire flat. I think that's disgusting to have one window for an entire flat. They might be small flats, they look tiny flats to me. And I should imagine that is reciprocated through a lot of the building. There's one window. Mrs. DeVries? Yeah, thank you. Um, in, in terms of amenity space, there's the modest balcony area there, the one window that you can see on this one. There are also um, a number of sort of light, um, roof lights indicated, it's the hatch squares. I don't know if members can see them properly in terms of the main rooms. So there would be some natural light into those spaces through sort of um, roof lights on the flat roof. OK, so what about the, the, the uh, flats below? They've just got the one window. Um, the flats got below, one. you've got the balcony area and the window there. Right. Have they got a window looking into the courtyard? Yes. So there's two windows to the flat. Yeah. OK. Right. OK. <laughs> Thank you. And Councillor Scott. Yes. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, I was actually going to say exactly what Stuart Hewlett has just said, but he said it more eloquently than I could. I think it's a, a good project for the council to deliver. Um, this is what's needed. We've had surveys. We do need small uh, accommodation for one parent, well, not one parent families, for single people. And um, to put it here in this location, um, people can walk to the shops, they can walk to school they can walk everywhere or cycle and that's what we're trying to deliver in our climate change um, strategy so perhaps we don't need the 33 parking spaces i hope we don't because they will be occupied by young people who hopefully will be aware of our climate emergency so i'm quite happy to support it thank you thank you very much at which point we i'm going to move towards a to to take the the votes so i'll come to members for their their views please um we have the proposition that was moved the first one that was pr proposed and seconded was for the recommendation as per the committee papers to grant permission that was proposed by councillor kingham and seconded by councillor bradford uh, the other proposal uh, that was proposed by councillor pierce seconded by councillor gibson for a site visit was was after that so We'll take the the first one first, and obviously, if if members were were minded to want to go for the second one, then obviously they would have to vote against the the, the first one. But the but the prop proposition we have in front of us is the recommendation to grant permission with the conditions as outlined. So, if we come to 
to members. We'll start with Councillor Granta. Could you confirm that you've been present throughout the debate uh, and discussion and presentation and that you, uh, whether you're for, against or abstain, please? Councillor Granta. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, you have been present for all of the debate. Uh, it's a very difficult one, um, obviously, with the local people totally against, but I, I think it, it, it is, in all reality, quite a, a, a good development. Um, housing, social housing is needed in a bad way in Bridgewater. Um, I'm afraid um, I'm going to against, against some of my colleagues, but uh, I, I'm going to talk vote for the recommendation that um, the officer's recommendation on this one. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I may have missed it, but did you say you'd been present throughout the whole debate? I have. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Glassford. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I have been present throughout the whole debate and I am for the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Pearce. Thank you, Chairman. I've been present for the whole debate and I'm against the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Gibson. Yeah, I've been here uh, for the whole debate and I'm against. Thank you. Councillor Scott. Um, thank you, Chairman. I've been here for the whole debate and I'm for the application. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hendry. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I've seen and heard everything and I'm very much for the application. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Facing. No, thank you, Chairman. I've been present throughout the debate, Chairman. And I'm in favour of the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Murphy. Thank you, Mr Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I've been present for the whole debate. I've seen and heard everything and I'm against. Thank you. Councillor Evans. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Seen and heard everything and my vote is against. Thank you. Councillor Kingham. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I've been present through a whole debate and I am for. Thank you, Councillor Bradford. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I've seen and witnessed the whole debate and I am for. Thank you, Councillor Bolt. I've been present for the whole debate and I'm against. Thank you, Councillor Perry. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I've been present through the whole debate and I am for. Thank you, Councillor Grimes. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I've seen and heard the whole debate and I'm for. Thank you. And I've also been present throughout the whole debate and I'm also for the recommendation that's been moved. Can I just confirm, Mr Nichols, and that's all councillors have voted? Yes, Chairman, that's uh, everybody voting. So that's 10 in support, five against. Thank you very much. As, as you said, that's uh, one, two, three. I can confirm that, Chairman. Excellent. Thank you, Mrs. Lehman. Uh, that's 10 in support, five against, so that is clearly carried, so permission is, is granted. I'm going to suggest, members, that we take a short comfort break uh, for five minutes, so we will restart at 11.20. Uh, Councillor Bradford, did you want to ask a question? You're muted. You're still muted. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. Sorry, just a little bit of clarity before we break. Um, yes. And this is a job. This is an important job. This planning committee, right? So I don't see if the going to site visit holds up. To be perfectly frank, there's no reason why an individual don't know where these places are to, and they can't drive themselves, not get out of a vehicle and look. I'm sorry to say. I, I, I think Councillor Bradford will will have that. We can have that discussion later, but but I, I'm sorry, I take, sorry to be I, awkward, but I wouldn't no, have spoke fine. on that one at all. If I hadn't gone and looked at it, I would not have spoke on that this morning at all, to be frank. All right. Thank you, Councillor Bradford. I'm not being um, awkward. I'm just you know, make sure we get our jobs right. You know, it's, it's no different than farming. We've got to do it. It's a job. Yeah. Thank you. OK, sorry. As sorry. We, to we'll that's OK. We'll restart, as I say, at 11.20. No, no, it's uh, 11 20 so uh, hopefully we should all be back uh, i'll just run quickly around if we could to members just to confirm you're here um councillor granter yes chairman present thank you councillor glassford yes chairman present councillor pierce yes i'm present thank you C councillor gibson 
Uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Councillor Scott. Uh, yes, Chairman, I'm present. Councillor Hendry. I'm here, Mr Chairman, can see and hear everything. Thank you. Councillor okay. Facey. May not sound like me, Chairman, mouthful of biscuit, but yes, here. <laughs> Councillor Murphy. <laughs> I'm here, Mr Chairman, present and correct. Thank you. Councillor Evans. I'm back. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Kingham. Present, Chairman. Councillor Bradford. Present, Mr Chairman. Councillor Bolt. Present, Chairman. Councillor Perry. Yes, present. Thank you. Councillor Grimes. Present, Chairman. And I'm here too, so that's good. I think all members are here. Um, I should have mentioned earlier, but just to, to point out, if you hadn't noticed, there's a the planning application that was on page 44, uh, which was the uh, application in Brighton or Mark, uh, that has been withdrawn from the agenda. Uh, the reason being that the the it was up for refusal. The issues that were causing it to be refused have been addressed, and therefore it's being delegated as a as an approval. Um, so that's why it's not before us today. Uh, so that takes us on to our next application where we have speakers present. That's on page 27. And I think, Mrs DeVries, you're presenting this one as well in North Petherton or North yes. Newton. Thank you. Um, members should be able to see the front slide. Yep, we can now. Perfect. Okay, the application was at last um, committee and was deferred by members for a site visit to consider the scale of development, highway concerns and implications of the different levels. Um, the application is before members in general because the recommendation is contrary to the view of the Town Council um, as they objected on access, overdevelopment, reduction of affordable housing and the development being out of keeping in the street scene, loss of privacy and insufficient parking. So main considerations are principal, size and scale, highway considerations, residential amenity, affordable housing, um, bin storage and archaeology. So I'll just run through these slides relatively quickly as they've all been previously seen by members. So the slide shows an aerial um, shot of the site um, with the application site just above the also, also print. So it's this site location. The um, site is partially inside and partially outside the settlement boundary. Um, policy T4 does support the exceptional release of sites to meet affordable housing, um, which can be subsidised with market housing, although there should be a maximum of a 50-50 split. Um, there are five dwellings outside of the settlement boundary, so it would equate to two and a half dwellings. Um, two are provided on site and the affordable housing manager has confirmed that this would be acceptable. In terms of planning history, um, this slide was circulated to members ahead of the site visit, um, but there is an outline consent granted on the application um, site for five dwellings. Um, as it is an outline, the layout um, submitted is indicative, so it's not been set, but um, the access is in a similar location with a similarly sized um, property. The access to the main dwelling, which is being retained just for the main dwelling, was previously shown potentially to serve two extra properties and then the other properties just sort of laid out in a courtyard style arrangement. Um, this shows the application site outlined in red and a section through the existing um, level detail on the right hand side. So top of the site is at this point which slopes down to the back of the existing property and then again slopes down and that's the highway level for members information. Um, this shows the layout of the site, which is seeking detailed consent for six dwellings, two of which are proposed as affordable. The vehicle access to the site lies to the south of Levens Farmhouse, with plot one set back and orientated into the site. Um, plots two and three are proposed as affordable, adjoining a double garage, which would serve plot three and four, with plot four and five at the end of the cul-de-sac. The double garage on the northern boundary is shared between plot five and six, again, all of which are orientated into the site. Um, the development, its position to the boundaries and the current neighbouring properties and outbuildings were all pointed out to members during the site visit. So this slide details the elevations and floor plans for plot one, which is three bed at the entrance and orientated into the site. Plots two and three, which are the affordable dwellings, are shown as two bedrooms. Plots four and five are located at the end of the cul-de-sac and proposed as detached four bedrooms. 
and plot six, which is proposed as a three bed property. So this slide shows two sections um, effectively looking um, through the site along the access road. So the top looking north and the bottom looking south. The red arrow on both of um, the images shows the location of Lovens farmhouse and the bottom section shows the position of the plot of plot one relative to the adjoining property as seen on site. So this is Lovens farmhouse. This is the adjoining property as seen on site and this is the location of plot one. So again, this is the levels this um, darker line is, is existing level, so you can see where it's sort of cut and fill to elevate up to sort of the finish level of the end. Um, this shot shows a view of the from the access road, although plot one is set back from both Lovens Farm and Farthings, which perhaps isn't clearly shown on the front elevation, but this is set back from this property and significantly from Lovens Farm, and members saw this view from site. These images show Lovens Farmhouse, Petherton Road, its width and existing vehicular and pedestrian accesses into the site. The land is currently elevated from the highway and would need to be graded to enable the development. So these are views from within the site showing the raised garden area. And these images show the southern boundary and the view from the garden between Lovens Farm and Farthings. And these are views of the northern boundary and the adjoining outbuildings um, on that boundary, which were highlighted to members through the visit. And the properties on the bottom of the image is the adjoining um, development to the southern boundary and its access, which is tapered for the development. So in conclusion, the principle of development is considered to be acceptable and officers are satisfied in respect of um, size, scale and design of the dwellings. There's sufficient parking provided within the site to serve the development and visibility displays are shown on the plans and controlled by condition 12 on the decision. Officers are satisfied that the development would allow appropriate separation relative to surrounding properties and would not result in any adverse impacts um, and the development would provide two affordable dwellings. A bin storage area is proposed near the access to the site and a condition is proposed to ensure that any heritage assets, um, given it's an area of high archaeological potential, are adequately recorded throughout the development. The application is therefore recommended for approval subject to a legal agreement to secure the affordable housing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Again, we have a, a number of speakers. The first one is uh, Samuel Wadham Sharp. Uh, Mr. Wadham Sharp, if you could just enable your microphone and just confirm that it's working, please. Uh, yeah, I've done so. And again, I, I speak on behalf of several residents and you should have also received um, email correspondence from us as well with um, alternate photographs. Excellent. I hope you've all seen those. Yep. Thank you very much. And again, you'll hear the bell go when there's one minute of your time left to go. So please start when you're ready. Councillors, today you must end this madness. Your local plan states meaningful and robust consultations with town councils and local communities to ensure impacts identified are appropriately addressed. This has not happened. An 800% increase in objections and the community and town council remain ignored. In the previous meeting, Councillor Hendry stated that villagers always object to planning as they dislike change, an unacceptable prejudicial statement from a publicly elected official. We support an alternate proposal, which is a viable brownfield reuse and will not cause impacts. You have seen this site, the disused barns bordering Lovens Farm. You must look at these proposals in unison and understand that while they cannot coexist, the Burnt House Farm one alone would meet your housing needs assessment. It will only replace ugly buildings already bordering other homes, so cannot cause further impact. You have witnessed firsthand that the Lovens Farm site is so small and so steeply elevated that it violates policies T4, D5 and D25. This overdeveloped garden will be so elevated that it will dominate the street scene, homes and gardens within such close proximity. You must rectify the planning officer's negligence from both the outline planning and the full application. His report is riddled with doubt, stating on balance it would meet this policy and it shouldn't significantly impact other properties. His responsibility is to guarantee that policies are met in full and evidence that proposals will not impact others. He has yet to even convince himself. Our own independent expert survey has evidenced the low density nature of the environment is devastated by this development. It will degrade security, 
overshadow and dominate neighbours as so elevated and only a stone's throw away. You have seen how this proposal would contravene policy D14 as it impacts the highway. Review the images I've sent you all and grasp the impact that your parking had on the road. This will become the permanent situation. Look at the photo and ask, where can pedestrians, including the elderly and primary school children, walk without risk? The visibility displays are blocked and they're uns therefore unsafe. This is a farm road. Where would the farm vehicles navigate that road through those gaps? The plan has identified that there will be a need to park on the road as the site does not provide the required parking. The spaces also include garages. New build garages are redundant as they are too small and new build homes all lack storage. Who will enforce the planning condition to only use garages for parking? This is an empty condition and clearly lacks any thought. I implore the committee to heed the town council, town mayor and local community wholehearted rejection of the density, domination, topography, safety, security, amenity and environmental issues. I compel you to reject this proposal. Thank you very much and well timed particularly with, with the distractions going on around you as well. So thank you very much. Yeah, apologies uh, for that. I should be on the ward. Don't, don't, don't worry about that at all. So, I mean, we, we understand that, that there are a lot of people have, have got other issues that they're, they're juggling at the moment. So don't, don't worry, that hasn't impacted on you at all, but well, well done. Um, Mrs. Lehman. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, members, can I um, just make you aware that any comment from the last speaker in relation to um, um, issues that was discussed in the last committee um, is not a relevant material consideration. It's not in the context that it was put. And I will ask my members to. Thank you. Un understood. Um, Councillor Bradford, you've registered to speak as, as ward councillor. So uh, again, start when you're ready, please. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman. Good morning, Mr Chairman. Good morning, committee. First of all, I'm going to thank you for, for giving the time up for all those that attended for the site meeting, how important, how important that is, especially in these little villages. You'll see how the street seems affected, number one, by this. You've got Burnt House Farm being done not 30 yards down the road, and a further 30 yards down the road, you've got a big, a big new development, Long Reach, a real detrimental effect for the village scene. Now, regarding affordable housing, it would appear this was brought forward for affordable housing scheme very early on, had to complete with Tuckerton Lane, and Tuckerton Lane won the day, and this was put forward afterwards. Well, the affordable housing figures were, were, were reached already by the grant in a burnt house farm. So, so really, this, this is one that's been poked in on the side and caused a lot of aggravation to the people. The people in the village just don't want it. They don't want this one at all. If this had gone to a village consultation, it, it had been kicked right out the door and we wouldn't, wouldn't be having all these meetings and site meetings now and energy spent discussing it. I feel very sorry for the gentleman next door in Eaton House who, who did a purchase at a particular period of time when, when this was all going on. He, he, it wasn't relevant at all to anything and, and, and everything happened and he was totally in the blue. Just like a lot of other residents, north, south, east and west, people, People weren't informed at all about this one, and it all happened very, very quickly. Unfortunately, I was away on holiday for three weeks at a time. I couldn't do a thing about it, and it was all too late by then. And that's why we got ourselves in this position now. The topography and, and, and the height of some of these houses, if it was built there, what a what a mess to a, a nice village to go and do a thing like this. You know, it's totally... Well, we had a, we had a complaint this morning about the site of the houses within with an urban area, when we get to a rural area, this is far, far worse and, and far damaging to the an area, I think it would be. Nobody wants it. Nobody wants it. And I'm, sh I'm sure everybody on that committee by now would have picked, would have picked up these views. Nobody wants this site at all. And I hope, and I hope that site visit convinced an awful lot of other people as well. But thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, anyhow. Thank you, Councillor Bradford. Our next speaker is the agent James Colshaw. If you could just confirm that your microphone is working, please. It is. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. And again, you'll you'll hear the bell go when you've got one minute of the time left to go. So please start when you're ready. Brilliant. Thank you. My name is James Colshaw of Collier Planning, and I'm speaking today on behalf of the applicants. I'd like to take this opportunity to remind members that the principle of development for housing has already been established 
through an earlier outline of plan and consent, the erection of up to five dwellings, which was approved in February last year. Therefore, in terms of the application before you today, members have to consider the planning merits of the provision of only one additional dwelling, given that a fallback position for five dwellings already exists. In this respect, your officers are satisfied that the provision of a single additional dwelling is acceptable and the site is large enough to accommodate the scale of development proposed. In addition, the small scale nature of the development means that the provision of an additional dwelling assists in the delivery of two affordable housing units. These are well integrated within the site and offer real benefit to the area as properties are considered to be out of reach financially for many residents. In this respect, your officers have concluded that the proposals are fully in accordance with local plan policy T4. Careful consideration has also been given towards the design of the proposals to ensure that the overall size, scale, form and layout of the development is commensurate with the existing built form within the village. Having regard to the topography of the site, the proposed dwellings would be stepped, with the westernmost dwellings adopting a one and a half storey design to ensure that they do not exceed the height of the existing neighbouring dwellings to the north and south. Your officers have concluded that the development would not harm the character and appearance of the local area, and the use of high quality materials and the tension of the stone wall at the road entrance to the site makes a positive contribution to its setting within the street scene. Mm. The residential amenity of the nearest neighbours to the north and south of the site has been duly considered as part of the application process, with amendments made to the form and layout dwellings to ensure the amenity of existing and future occupiers is protected. In respect of highways, the County Highways Authority have raised no objection to the proposals and have confirmed that visibility at the access is sufficient. Existing planning conditions associated with the site to the south in conjunction with the conditions proposed with this application secure this visibility. The access itself has been designed in accordance with current highway standards and ample provision would be provided within the site for the parking and turning of vehicles in compliance with the development plan. Members will understand that planning law requires all planning applications to be determined only against the policies of the development plan and all other material planning considerations. Therefore, for the reasons I have identified, and as set out in further detail within your officer's report, the applicants request your support for the officer recommendation today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, as was mentioned, this, this uh, application has been subject of, of a site visit, uh, which, which just for clarification was carried out before the, uh, the lockdown uh, came in again. Um, so I'm going to come around to each of the members for their reports on that site visit. I'll take them in the order that they are on the agenda. So we'll start with um, Councillor Grimes. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, very interesting site visit. Um, it was nice to get on the site and have a look around. Um, I'm not convinced that this is a good application. I'm really not happy with the extra plot, but I shall wait and see what uh, other members have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bolt. I, I totally concur with um, Councillor Grimes. It, it seemed well overdeveloped. Uh, Councillor Facey. Is Councillor Facey there? Yes, Chairman. For Sorry. once, lost the words. Um, <laughs> yes, Chairman. Um, very enlightened. Not happy with plot one. It does seem. And, uh, and I'm not. Um, no way have I got uh, designs on highways authority, although working in the building trade all my life. <clears throat> I, I'm still a little bit apprehensive of the, the access, Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Glassford. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, yes, good sleep, is it? Uh, I've got my concerns over uh, the topography and that. Uh, other concern. Is uh, the affordable units? Uh, they actually do look like they're affordable units in a sense that uh, they stick out with a sore thumb compared to the other ones. Now, normally we try to blend them in so you couldn't tell them apart. To me, if it, if it ends up looking like the drawings we got there, I, I don't think that's acceptable. But uh, I'll listen to the rest of the debate before I make my mind up. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hendry. 
Councillor Hendry. Yeah, apologise about that. Just two seconds. Okay. No problem. Uh, projects like this are, uh, are decided by policy, planning policy, not actual personal feelings. Okay, so that's what it comes down to straight away. The not so good points, if you want that, is the is the entrance and exit. It's not a deal breaker, but it's not ideal either, but it's acceptable what it is. Councillor Facey pointed out about plot one, and I totally agree with him. He's, he's absolutely correct. The development is, is actually OK, but plot one's a little bit of a, I'm not sure about that one at all. Plots like this will never stay vacant in ongoing perpetuity. It just doesn't happen. They will be built on, whether it's now or 10 years time, they will be. The plans as they are could be mirrored from next door. Now, I know we shouldn't be considering next door because we've only got what's on the table, but it's a thought that's in the back of your mind there. There is something going to go on next door, so one would mirror the other almost. There's no windows to bother anybody else either side of it, and that's, that's a big plus on its own. The street scene is not actually changed that much because if you drive past that down the lane, you're not going to suddenly look right or left and say, there's a load of houses built up there. It doesn't work that way. You would only see the entrance and exit, so the street scene for me just isn't that bothered at all. Uh, is, is this still, can I ask Don DeFries, was it, who's the case? Is the sole money coming in about 60K? Am I right in saying that? And then there's about 15% come back to the, to the local council around 9K, something like that. Is that correct or not? Councillor Hendry, if I could just ask at the moment, if, if we do the round okay. of the of the site okay. visit reports and then we'll come on to yeah. the debate. Oh, that's, that's OK. That's don't worry about that. Sorry, sorry, I was on the site visit. It's absolutely fine. Yeah. Uh, Policy D2 seeks to achieve high quality design with the site and identity of the surroundings be of a design that makes the most use of land which recognises the need for positive treatment of the spaces around between buildings. Now, this is supported by policy D25, which states consideration of privacy, overlooking dominance and loss of light. Well, in actual fact, this passes all of these. It's, it's acceptable to everything that's just been said there. Policy D14, the project should ensure the expected nature and volume of traffic and parked cars generated would not compromise the local road networks. Well, given that it's only five, uh, was it five or six houses? I'm not sure about plot one. I, I'm a bit undecided about that one. The volume of traffic is actually not that much uh, to be said. Policy D34, it doesn't come into play because there's only six houses. So I, my opinion on the first time round was OK, but plot one is a little bit of a sticky point. So I'll leave it at that and move on here. Everybody else has to say thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Pierce. Thank you, Chairman. Firstly, I would like to thank Councillor Bradford on reminding us of the value of site visits. And this one was very, uh, very, very useful, actually, because it's difficult to get uh, a, um, a, a feel of the, the slope of the land from the, the pictures only. And I think in terms of the um, topography of the land, and as has been said, the density and domination, I think actually I do have concerns around policy D25, which which is uh, mentions overbearing and visual dominance. And that's the feeling I got of how the development would be um, if, if agreed. And also in terms of policy T4, which is about preserving the amenity of um, nearby buildings. So for those reasons, I remain to have concerns. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Perry. No, sorry, I haven't I haven't wanted to speak on this. Um, I didn't actually attend the site visit. Oh, because, I'm sorry. Sorry. Um, sorry, I thought you realised I couldn't get to it. Sorry about that. No, that's all right. I, I was. <laughs> I was reading off the off the list, and uh, no, you're right. I should have should have moved straight on to Councillor Evans. Sorry about that, Councillor Perry. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Can I just clarify that you're at the moment seeking just a contribution on the site visit and not uh, a contribution to the debate on policy? Absolutely, please. That okay. would be helpful. I'll, I'll, at, at this stage, I'll limit myself to the site visit. But I have comments on policy I would like to introduce uh, yeah. later. Um, my 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 perception of the site visit was it was extremely helpful to understand the topography of the land which shows the visual domination that this development will have on Eaton Manor Farm and Farthings on either side of the property 
Uh, it also highlighted some of the concerns that we have a high a, a, an access road which is unadoptable in terms of county standards um, coming out onto a road which is sufficiently busy for me as county councillor to submit a small member improvement scheme. Um, so I would contend that, that that's, that's been accepted by county highways and I would contend that that's evidence that they, have, they do have concerns about the speed of traffic on that road. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Scott. Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. Yes, the site visit was very useful because it does actually show the topography of the land, which I don't think is fully explained in the um, drawings. Um, I would be concerned about the surface runoff from this uh, um, area because there's a large road that runs downhill should there be a storm event. Um, and I understand there's quite a bit of flooding nearby anyway. Um, so I'm not particularly happy, but I'll leave comments until later. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think I'm probably the last member of the site visit team. Um, as, as others have said, I think this was a useful site visit because the the land levels are significantly changing as you move across the site. Uh, we viewed it from from the highway itself. Uh, we also went on onto the site and, and went throughout looking at the, the locations of the proposed dwellings. Um, we also had pointed out to us where the, the boundary of the development boundary actually ran through the site so that we could get a better idea of, of the relationship of that in terms of this application. As others have said, um, having looked at that, I must admit I do have concerns with this site uh, in terms of the, the density of, of what is proposed. I know that we have an outline permission that, that was for five, um, but I mean, that was an outline permission saying in principle it was felt that five could go on there. And then at reserve masses, you would then look at the detail and work out whether five actually could fit on there. Um, to now come back with a completely different application for six, I, I felt is pushing it too far, particularly the concern I had was the relationship, or, well, the key relationship between plot one and the neighboring property. They are extremely uh, uh, close and, and in that corner is pushed forward. And I've heard other comments and probably the street scene is is maybe not not significant enough change to uh, to to go against it. But I felt that there is a significant change in the street scene. It, it seemed quite typical of that area. The character was significant stone walls butting the the, the road. Uh, this will remove a significant area of stone wall from the existing property. And so that will have an impact on the street scene, whether that's, as I say, significant enough uh, to vote against I would have to, to, to weigh up but uh, I think it was a useful site visit particularly because of the relationship with the neighbouring dwellings and the the, and the layout and, and site level changes so again I have, have serious concerns on this application and we'll listen to uh, further debate from other members. Uh, if the first speaker I've got indicating on this one is Councillor Evans so if you'd like to uh, enter the, the debate having had the, the reports back from all the site visit attendees. Thank you very much Mr Mr Chairman and uh, th thank officers for giving up their time to conduct a site visit in, in a socially distanced way. It was particularly helpful to see the site firsthand. Um, I think members will like me have um, regarded um, this in breach of policy D25 because of the visual domination that, uh, that uh, this will have on the neighbouring properties and on the street scene. I consider it to be an overdevelopment of the site. And on those grounds, I would, I would move that we object. But I'm also very concerned that this breaches policy T4 as well, which is the main policy under which this would be allowed. The report quotes um, six bullet points from policy T4 that, re that are in relation to this development, but are also specifically for sites that are all affordable housing. It doesn't include three subsequent bullet points, which are about sites which are partially um, affordable housing. If we look at those three bullet points, it says where delivery of such screens is not financially viable, cross subsidy by way of market housing will be considered where all the following criteria are met. The council is satisfied it is essential for the successful delivery of the development demonstrated through an independent open book financial appraisal. There is no comment 
about an independent financial appraisal in the officer's report. The second bullet point is absolutely fundamental. Market housing does not exceed the affordable housing elements unless exceptionally the proposal delivers other locally agreed infrastructure priorities. So it cannot be over half of the houses that are affordable or are market houses unless there is a contribution to some other infrastructure priority. There is no contribution to another infrastructure priority. The, it goes on further in that policy to talk about parish and town councils having lists of infrastructure priorities that they could contribute to. I spoke to the town clerk yesterday of North Petherton Town Council and he confirmed that there is such a list. He, he sent it to me and no approach has been made to contribute to that. So the second point of that, of, of, of that is also not met. I thank Councillor Glassford for his comments, which I agree with, because it, it, it meets the third of those bullet points that the affordable housing should form part, part of the overall development and be well integrated with the market housing. Because in this site, it isn't. It is very clear where the affordable housing is tucked off to one side. This does not comply with policy T4. It does not comp comply with policy D25. And I would move that we reject the officer's recommendation. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman. Thank you very much. Mrs Debreeze, did you want to comment at all? Um, yeah, in, in terms of policy T4, um, Councillor Evans is correct. There hasn't been a financial appraisal submitted with this application. Um, in terms of the justification that's been put forward to officers, um, as plot one is inside the settlement boundary, it would be acceptable as an infill plot. So it's it's consideration of um, the properties outside of the settlement boundary. There's five outside. There's two proposed as affordable. So that is less than half. To make it half in terms of policy compliant, um, it would be possible to condition um, an equivalent contribution of half a house because you can't deliver half an affordable unit to be contributed. Um, but the the challenge is that contribution would need to go to an affordable home in this area to meet the um, sort of emphasis of that policy. Um, on that basis, the affordable housing manager didn't object to the application based on policy T4, but it, it is for members to debate and weigh up that policy conflict. Thank you very much. I've got Councillor Gibson and then Councillor Grimes. Yeah, thank you. Can I second uh, Councillor Revens's proposal there? I think that um, developers quite often look at affordable housing as, as a way of getting more, uh, more expensive housing put on. I know that's how it works in lots of ways, but it, it just feels it just feels wrong. Uh, this application, uh, like a lot of applications that come forward with the uh, affordable housing element, I don't think they really care. I just think it's a way of just getting what they want and making more money on um, on the other housing that gets put up. Thank you. Um, I've got Councillor Grimes and Councillor Hendry. Councillor Grimes. Thank you, Chairman. No, I was uh, about to second uh, Councillor Evans, so uh, no comment uh, after that, as it's been seconded. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just also to comment on that, I agree with with what Councillor Evans has, has said. I must admit, I've I've got concerns over the over the T4 and the 50 50 percent element. I I do understand a contribution can be made. I think in this case, I don't think that is is appropriate, and also often there's small percentages that you might be looking at this. This is quite a significant, this is 10% units below where it should be at least. And, and it would have been within the applicant's choice to have gone above the 50% if they wished to, um, but obviously they haven't. Um, I understand the issues of viability, but this is an exception site in a rural area. This isn't a, an allocated site. So I think this is something that we need to uh, to, to bear in mind as well. So uh, totally agree with with Councillor Revens's comments. <coughs> Councillor Hendry. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Just like to say that um, I've heard everything else uh, everybody had to say, and I'm really pleased it did because they pointed out the things I probably hadn't considered. So I kind of have I have uh, I've changed my opinion. I just like to point that out. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Councillor Scott. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, I do consider this is an overdevelopment of site, and I do agree with what's just been said with um, the um, breach of possibly policies. Um, could I just ask, um, I understand that the ha um, local housing need has been met in North Newton. Um, so does that mean that we shouldn't be considering extra houses? Thank you. Mr. Debris. The housing need for North Newton, um, there were two remaining units still to be found from the existing identified need. So the two units that were proposed as part of this application would have met the existing need. Um, if you would up it to three, there isn't currently an identified need for three, um, but the, the housing needs assessment is is a little dated. So if it were updated, the assumption is always going to be that the housing need would go up. But at the moment, there is an identified need for two, which this development is is proposing to meet with the two that it was proposing. Thank you. And I haven't got any other speakers indicating at the moment. I will oh, hold on. There's a hand. No, there isn't a hand. Sorry. Um, I haven't got any other speakers indicating, uh, so I'll just come back to Mr. Debris. You've had a proposal that's for refusal uh, and that's been seconded with outline reasons given by Councillor Revens. Are you uh, are you happy that those are valid planning grounds that uh, that we would be able to uh, to vote on? Yeah, so the concerns as I've heard them, um, I'm just aware having heard people's reflection on the site visit and the and the concerns they may have had through the site visit, I'm not sure we've um, discuss those or come to an outcome on those points. But in terms of the concerns as raised, as I've heard them so far, in terms of the recommendation, um, if, if it were going against officer recommendation, is um, the general overdevelopment of site and conflict to T4 being unjustified re relative to the um, policy requirements, in particular the three bullet points um, referenced. Um, I've heard design of affordable housing, so I'm assuming that's a policy D2 conflict. Um, and D25 was mentioned, but I, I'm not clear where the, the neighbour conflict concern is, whether that's plot one and the farthings or, or something different. OK, I'll come back if I may to, to Councillor Revens, if you could just clarify those for, for Mrs DeVries and then we'll be moving to a vote. Uh, yes, she's. I think she's got, uh, got it correct on T4. It's the three bullet points uh, that I referenced there on Policy D25, it's um, overbearing and visual dominance of Farthings and Eaton Manor House. Eaton Manor Farm, sorry. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy with those. OK. Chairman, uh, apologies. It's sorry, I've Noon. Got Mr Noon, yes. Sorry, I, apologies. My um, chat isn't working. Um, I need to raise an issue here that unfortunately has been missed in the application. Um, which I think constitutes another reason for refusal. It could possibly be dealt with by condition if you were going down that route, but the rear of this site is identified by DEFRA as a traditional orchard. The applicant has missed that in his eco ecological assessment of that. Um, it may be that there is no issue, but if members are minded to refuse the application, I think there is an ecology issue that we need to be flagging up to the agent via a reason for refusal it may well be dealt with on the way to any appeal if he were to go down that route or could be addressed in a resubmission. But the, the ecological report has failed to identify the traditional orchard that is designated and there are no sort of mitigations, mitigations if necessarily proposed. So I think it's a failure to demonstrate that the site can be developed without harm to that designation. Uh, apologies for interrupting and late raising of that. OK. Mr Chairman, I'm happy to incorporate that into my resolution. Thank you. OK. And can I just check with Councillor Gibson that you're happy as the seconder that that is incorporated as well and the reasons outlined by Councillor Evans? Oh, yeah, very much so. I think that interjection of uh, Mr Noon is uh, really important. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. I'm not seeing anybody else indicating to speak at the moment, so we will move to a vote, um, which is voting on the recommendation that has been proposed and seconded to refuse permission for the reasons that we've just been through. So we'll start 
with uh, Councillor Grimes this time. And again, it's just to confirm you've been present, heard the debate, and whether you're for, against, or abstaining on the proposal, which is a refusal. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I've seen and heard everything, and I'm for refusal of this application. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Perry. Yes, thank you. I've seen and heard everything, and I'm for the refusal of this application. Thank you very much. Councillor Bolt. Present for the whole debate and for refusal. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Kingham. Thank you, Chairman. I've been present through the whole debate and I'm for the, the recommendation. You're for the recommendation for refusal? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Revens. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Chairman. I am in favour of my proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Murphy. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I've seen and heard the whole debate and I'm for refusal. Thank you. Councillor Facey. Mr Chairman, seen and heard the whole debate, Chairman, and I'm for refusal. Thank you. Councillor Hendry. I've seen and heard everything, Mr Chairman, and I'm for refusal. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Scott. Thank you, Chairman. I've seen and heard everything and I'm for refusal. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Gibson. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I've seen and heard the whole debate and I'm refu uh, for refusal. Refusal. Sorry, if I can get my words out. That's all right. <laughs> thank you. Councillor Pearce. Thank you. Yes, I've seen and heard the whole debate and I am for refusal. Thank you, Councillor Glassford. Thank you, Chairman. I've seen and heard the whole debate and I am for refusal. Thank you, Councillor Granter. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I've seen and heard all of the debate and I am for the refusal. Thank you. Thank you. And also I've seen and heard the whole debate and I'm also for refusal. Can I just confirm, Mr Nicholson, that's all members have voted? I've just been asked to just to confirm, Councillor Revens, that you did see and hear all the debate. Yes, I did. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman, and apologies for not clarifying that earlier. No worries. Mr Nicholson. Thank you, Chairman. That's unanimous at 14 of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So that is clearly carried, so permission is refused. Uh, members, I'm just going to suggest we, we take a couple of minutes. We're not going to actually break, but I'm just going to take a couple of minutes to get Councillor uh, Bradford back in and also uh, just to resolve any issues about other people who need to get into the meeting or, or not. So we'll just take a couple of minutes to resolve that. Thank you. Mrs Lehman, I just noticed your hand is up. Is that because you wanted to raise an issue? Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, if it's still up, I thought I'd put it down. Oh, I can see what I've done. I put it down. Thank you, Chairman. That's OK. And the same, same for Mr Noon. I think your hand is still up. Apologies, it's down at my end. Um, OK, it's gone down sorry. here as well now, so that's that's okay. fine. Uh, Mrs Nicholson, is, is Councillor Bradford back in with us? Mr Taylor is getting him in. OK, thank you very much. Back in business. Mm -hmm. Welcome back, Councillor Bradford. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you. Right. I think that means that everyone is now uh, present. So if we can move on to our next application where we have a speaker present, and that is in uh, Burnham on Sea. Uh, we're on page 56 of the agenda. And uh, Miss Parsons, I think you're introducing this one. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I've just clicked on something. Can you see my screen? Uh, yes, we good. Yes, we yes we can. It's on full good. full screen now. Thank you. Thank you. This is a reserve matters application for the erection of eight dwellings on land to the east of Barrow Road. The an outline application has already been granted for the erection of eight dwellings. Um, that included details of the access. So the access has already been approved. Now this application is located, the site is located within the settlement boundary, um, close to the existing built up residential area of the town. And the aerial here shows 
there is an existing access into the site that leads to a field beyond. Um, there is this application itself takes part of the land to the south of 150 Barrow Road in order to create a wider access. Um, as I said before, the access has already been approved at outline stage. So this application is to deal with all the matters within the site itself. The, um, the area is characterised by a variety of residential properties, primarily um, bungalows, uh, brick and tile bungalows to the south of the site with a number of um, dormer extensions and then houses, generally houses along Barrow Road with some bungalows with a differing a palette of materials, ages and designs of properties. This is the red outline indicating the site itself. So the access is to come in to the site here, um, incorporating part of the site of number 150, and then to lead in into the site here. Braithwaite, these are the properties that um, are accessed via Braithwaite Place. As I said, the access itself has already been approved at outline stage, and these are the details of the access, which comes in off of Barrow Road. This is close to the access looking northwards along Barrow Road. The, the public footpath also um, follows through onto the existing access and goes through the site into the field to the north. This is looking directly into the existing access and the proposal incorporates part of this garden here to widen the access. This is looking into the access further into the field and then this is the southern boundary of the site with the properties in Braithwaite Close and some of their outbuildings. Another view of the southern boundary of the site with Brent Knoll in the distance, the Knoll in the distance. This is the some of the rear elevations of the properties in Barrow Road. This is a view looking across the site at the um, dilapidated structure that will that was on the site and a more distance view of looking down through the site and then across the reens and then back towards the housing. So the proposal seeks to provide eight dwellings. We've got plots one, two, three, four and five along here, which are detached four bed dwellings and then a row of three bed dwellings at the end. As you can see, the access would come in, run along the north of the properties with turning areas here. The existing pedestrian um, right of way that crosses the field would be um, diverted and this route does show it coming through the site and leading into the field to the north. In terms of um, the design of the dwellings, the, they would be two stories in height and this illustrative drawing indicates the contemporary nature of the proposal. They would be two storeys in height with rooms in the roof space. They are of modern design with pitched fibre fibre cement slate effect roofs um, with a mix of facing brick and grey stained timber boarding. Now going back to the layout um, to talk about the ridge heights, um, the houses range from 6.56 metres high, um, which relates to plots two, three, four and five and to 7.97 metres high, which um, relates to plot one. Plot six, seven and eight have ridge heights of 6.98 metres. And this is another view of the illustration. This is plot one and two. These would be the first plots that uh, would be seen as entering into the site from the west. I'm going to run through um, some cross sections because that indicates the elevations as well as their relation to neighbouring properties. So this is looking east from the access at the gable end of plot one and you can see plot two behind and it illustrates number three Braithwaite place here and the outbuildings adjacent. And then we've got looking south at plot one and two. So um, this is the front of these plots and the this frontage faces into the site. And this is looking at the rear of plots two, three, four and five. 
So these would face the properties, the rear gardens of the properties in Braithwaite Place. As you can see, there are no first floor windows within these elevations. There are um, roof lights, which would be set at a, a minimum height of at least 1.7 metres above the floor area, the internal floor level. Uh, the same plots, plots two, three, four and five, facing from, uh, this is the front view of them, facing into the site, facing northwards. And then this is the end elevation of plot five. So this is looking looking westwards with um, number 20 Braithwaite Place indicated here. These are the three detached three bed dwellings at the east, east end of the site. So this is looking east from the plots, uh, sorry, at the front of the plots at the top line. And then this is the rear of the the, the dwellings facing into the field, and this is indicating number 20 Braithwaite Place. This is the end side or the side plot of number six, which would face the northern fields. Again, this is the layout indicating how, how the proposal is um, laid out. Now, in terms of updating the um, report, during the processing of the application, a number of amended plans were submitted and a number of um, neighbour consultations were carried out. And um, we have now had 58, we have now had letters of objections from 58 local residents. Now, going back to the principle of the um, development, outline consent has been granted for eight dwellings and this dealt with the uh, um, this dealt with the access at that stage. There were a number of conditions, or there are a number of conditions attached to the outland consent, and that those conditions covered these matters listed on the slide. Now, in terms of visual amenity, the uh, site is set back from the road and would be accessed between two existing dwellings. It is not therefore in a prominent position. However, the houses would be viewed from the neighbouring dwellings to the south, the west, and further to the north. The existing residential development around the site comprises of a variety of dwelling types, designs and materials, and as such, there is no distinct vernacular. The proposed houses would be modern in design in terms of the elevational details of materials and fenestration. However, they would be detached, incorporating ridged roofs and roof lights, which are typical of dwellings in the area. The development as a whole would not have an adverse impact on the character of the area and would be appropriate for its setting. In terms of um, impact on residential amenity, the, the houses would be at a height of between 6.6 .6 metres and 7.97 metres. And while the ground level would be raised across the site by an average of 0.7 metres, the proposed houses would be cited so, cited so as not to have an, sorry, would be cited so as to be an appropriate distance from their neighbours' gardens, so as not to result in any undue loss of light or visual domination. Plot number one would be positioned 3.8 metres from the neighbour's garden to the south, with the eaves at a height of 4.2 metres and the ridge slipping away from the boundary. The western wall of plot one would be at least 10 metres from the boundary of the western part of the site. And it would be approximately 21 metres from the rear wall of number 150 Barrow Road, which is over here. And a greater distance from the wall of the other windows within um, Barrow Road. Plots two, three, four and five would have gardens between 9.2 metres and 9.7 metres in length. Plot eight would be positioned 3.2 metres from the neighbour's garden to the south, with the eaves standing at a height of 4.5 metres and the ridge sloping away. There will be no first floor windows facing directly towards the neighbouring gardens to the south, other than the roof lights, which I'd mentioned before, which would be set at at least 1.7 metres minimum above the internal floor level. Um, 
some issues of issues have been raised by residents that um, have been included with previous conditions on the outline consent. The environmental health officer recommends conditions in respect of demolition, construction operating times, construction environmental management plan, piling and land contamination. Those um, matters have been covered by conditions attached to the outline consent. In terms of highway safety, the means of access to the site has already been dealt with at outline stage. And in terms of the public right of way, this would need to be diverted, which is considered to be acceptable subject to the condition attached to the consent. The County Highways Author Officer has raised no objection to the proposal. The internal layout of the site provides adequate parking and turning for the nature of the development. Just to clarify on the last sentence within the page covering the highways issues or main issues. Um, there's a typo there where, where it says it is not considered that the development would have no adverse impact on highway safety, whereas that's a double negative and it should reread. It is not considered that the development would have any adverse impact on highway safety. In terms of ecology, the county ecologist is aware of the construction management plan submitted with the application and has assessed the impact that the proposal would have. He has no objection provided the recommended conditions are attached to ensure that development is carried out in accordance with the construction management plan. He recommends a landscape and ecological management plan to provide details on how retained and proposed new habitats will be managed in the long term and to provide appropriate biodiversity enhancement to the site and conditions are attached accordingly. In terms of flood risk, the site is within flood zone 3A and it is within the settlement boundary. As it is within the settlement boundary, the sequential test is deemed to be passed. With the outline consent, conditions were attached to require flood resilient measures, flood ev evacuation plan, for the development to be of at least two storey in height to provide a safe refuge from flood and to be above 300 mil above existing ground levels. These, these, uh, these details were attached, as I've said, to these conditions were attached at outline stage. The drainage board is satisfied, satisfied with the proposed surface water drainage scheme. Now, um, to conclude, it's considered that the proposal is satisfactory in terms of its impact on highway safety, on amenity of neighbouring residents, on ecology, on flood risk, and that it would have no adverse impact on the character of the area. The recommendation is therefore to grant consent and it is recommended to add two further conditions to those on the agenda. One would be the standard condition to take away permitted development rights to add new windows in the future. And the other is to require charging points for electric vehicles in accordance with the highway officer's comments previously. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. As you'll see, we have uh, two speakers on this application. The first one is uh, Catherine Richardson. Can I just ask Catherine Richardson if you could turn on your microphone and just confirm that it's working? Uh, good morning, Mr Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Again, just reminding you, you've got the three minutes to address the committee and you'll hear the bell when there's a minute to go. So start whenever you're ready, please. Thank you, Mr Chairman and members of the committee for allowing me to speak today. 88 of the local residents signed a petition earlier this year supporting a 14 page document listing their objections to this development. These have been reiterated each time the revised plans have been circulated as none of the amendments thus far have addressed their concerns. The local residents continue to have legitimate concerns about the design, density, proximity, style and finish of the planned houses. They're also concerned about the effect on traffic congestion. The fact that the change to noise levels may constitute nuisance, light pollution, the loss or change of the existing footpath, the impact on the varied wildlife and the risk to establish trees in people's gardens. The original plan stated that the new dwellings would be bungalows. Despite the changes made thus far, the plans still look like houses and the height of the new properties will be overbearing and results in the surrounding homes being significantly overlooked. This is exacerbated by the inclusion of balconies on the front of some of the properties. 
The current plans also appear to result in visual domination of the area in terms of both height, number and proximity in relation to existing homes. The height, style and materials and the number of properties being squeezed into this small field do not complement the area and will clearly dominate the surrounding properties. This will mean that the eight new properties will also result in the serious loss of visual amenity for about 35 of the surrounding existing properties. The above appears to contradict both national and local planning policy. Turning to the issue of flood risk, the field is known to be a high flood risk area. This is addressed by raising the overall ground level, including an upstairs escape route and the provision of permeable surfaces. All of these measures have been included to protect only the new properties. Despite repeated questions to the relevant parties, the local residents are not reassured that the provisions will remove the potential for flooding of their homes, and no account seems to have been taken for the potential impact of the foundations on groundwater displacement. Can anyone please guarantee that the surrounding properties will be safe going forward? What must be clear to the committee is the fact that it is unlikely to be possible to satisfy both requirements. Changing the plans enough to address the overlooking and visual domination issue may compromise the provision of an escape route. Turning to a predominant concern outside of the reserved matters issue, it should be acknowledged that traffic conditions have materially changed since the original application was agreed. New ownership of the, new pe of the petrol station nearby has resulted in a significant increase in congestion along this part of the Barrow Road, which directly impacts the access to the field. The potential addition of a further 26 cars from the development, I think that's the number of parking spaces, will only worsen the situation. So surely this issue must be revisited. Mrs. Richland, I'm going to have to call time on you there. That's the three minutes, but thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The second speaker we have is Peter Tysak. Can you just turn on your microphone and confirm that it's working for us, please? Good morning, Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. You're breaking up a little bit, but I think it, it should be OK. So um, start when you're ready and, and you'll hear the bell when you've got okay. a minute to go. All right. Th thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillors. Uh, this application is seeking to develop the 50 Barrow Road was granted consent uh, for outline permission for eight units in March 2018. Uh, so the application before you is today is just dealing with the reserve matters as your report describes, uh, the principle of development having therefore been agreed. Understandably, some objectors are still unhappy that the site is going to be developed at all, but that has already been decided and brings us to today's starting point. My client became came involved with the site after the outline consent had been granted and he has taken careful note of the concerns of local residents and made numerous changes to his earlier proposals to try to meet those having made changes to design and layout and having negotiated to a level of some detail with your officers and statutory consultees we believe that there is now full agreement on all, all these matters the only outstanding point that i can see is that some neighbors do not like the design and this, as you know, is a very subjective matter, which can be addressed by your local plan, pro, local plan process, assessing the local vernacular and producing a di design code. In the absence of such, it is for the de developer to provide a design that works with the grain of the perceived vernacular, whilst bringing forward a building appropriate to the present day. You would not want us to build a copy of an earlier design, especially with today's need to work to modern building standards with more advanced building materials and methods of construction. These effectively dictate a different appearance to today's buildings as can be seen from other developments in the area. This proposal comprises eight properties of three types designed to sit well together in this small cul-de-sac overlooking the fields. Roof heights are set as low as possible and facing materials proposed have been chosen so as to sit well in the distant views. Consideration has been given to the needs of the drainage board for access to maintain the land drainage and necessary paperwork is in place for the minor diversion to the public footpath which crosses part of the site. And having done everything requested and having addressed every concern, we ask you, no, we urge you to give consent today. Thank you, councillors, for your time. Thank you very much. 
members, any comments or questions, please? Are there any uh, any members who wish to comment, please? Yes, I have someone. Co uh, Councillor Kingham, please. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, one issue I was looking at on the uh, objections was was flooding, but I think um, our officer has, has sort of um, explained that um, satisfactory things have been put in place. Um, design, I mean, I think the design is in doesn't suit everybody, but obviously this is a, a new side to modern design, which is sort of fashionable at the moment. Um, I've been to some houses similar to this on a site just outside Western Supermare. Mm -hmm. And when it's actually completed, it, it looks a lot different. I think when you see it on a plan, I think people see something different and they're not always aware of actually what it's going to look like. Um, on the photographs, one of the boundaries to existing properties was it's a wire fence. And I wasn't sure whether any, any of that, that was the boundary of the existing properties or whether that was part of the site, because obviously it uh, doesn't give any privacy to either parties. I wondered if anything was going to be done with that. But otherwise, I'm, I think it's a, a nice development, modern, and I think people, once it was done, would be quite proud of it. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Parsons. Are you able to address the, uh, the the boundary question? Yes, thank you, Chairman. I'm not sure if Councillor Kingham is referring to the boundary along here because that's one of the photographs I indicated um, where it had a low boundary. I'm just checking to see if just checking to see if I've got details of what's proposed. Um, however, if not, then a condition can be added if not already added to the report to require details of boundary treatments. Just having a quick check that it's not already on there, which you probably would have spotted. So yeah, I'm happy was, to, yeah. yeah. It was in, your, in the photograph you were showing. Yeah, I think I know that um, the boundary you're referring to is probably this boundary here, but um, I think it would be appropriate to add a, an additional condition requiring boundary treatments, Chairman. Thank you. I've got a number of councillors have indicated councillors Murphy, Gibson and Facey, so we'll come to Councillor Murphy first. Councillor Murphy. Sorry, I beg your pardon, Mr. Chairman. I've just unmuted my microphone. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. At first sight, it looks it looks a very, very nice development. Um, I like the treatment of the houses. It's very similar to a, uh, a site that's further up right next to the filling station that was proposed up that road. There's three or four houses with this cladding, modern, very nice. And I think this is this is the sort of project we really need to support. But there's a some buts about it, and I think the Mrs. Catherine Richardson was extremely eloquent in her presentation uh, about density. There, that it is no doubt a very dense site when you consider that someone who is turning, or if a, if a, the, we're now living in a van type uh, situation where vans have to come up, and when you look at the drawing and you see the uh, the the drawing that you had up before with the houses showing in a lateral horizontal sort of position, um, the main site, no, the actual drawing of the, you had a drawing of the, an artist's impression of the site itself. Uh, when you, and uh, when you started going through this, pro that, this one here, when you look at the drawing and you take, could you go back to that drawing again, please? I don't know who's changing this, but there you are. Uh, anyone coming into the site on a truck or a, a van will have to go all the way down to turn down into this area here, causing a lot of congestion and so on. Um, with people parked here, maybe stopping people, this will become a, an issue, I think, in this time. The thing I wanted to ask about this, this particular project is, this project was passed in outline for bungalows. And at the time, I'm sure it was granted permission because most of the houses surrounding it, apart from at the very front, which is next to a boarding house, um, um, the... Uh, especially the bungalows in Braithwaite Place, which have been established for over a hundred years. Braithwaite Place is all bungalows. And that was why I am sure when they put forward the proposal that the proposal was accepted because it was very much in keeping 
from a from a point of view of next door and and beyond of bungalows why and why have you uh, we now have a situation where the height of some of these will average between 20 and 24 feet before we add the foundations that have been put in for flooding to 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 be prepared for flooding in that area so you could have uh, houses that are between 25 and a half 26 27 feet high with the addition of the foundations down to 24 feet now on that basis i would say we are in a different category altogether uh, you know if this was passed in its original uh, condition as bungalows why because the people in Braithwaite Place, just next door, were perfectly content not to say a single word. Now that they suddenly see this rather beautiful, uh, <laughs> I must say, beautiful designed uh, uh, buildings, etc., with very little turning spaces all to the end, with a lot of traffic coming in and out, delivering, because it's, I think it's overbuilt to some extent, because they're trying to get as many in as possible and to get bigger houses in as possible, I think it's now has the category that Mrs. Richardson mentioned, overbearing as far as briefly place is concerned, loss of existing footpath, light pollution is without a doubt because of 27 feet, 25 feet and so on, there will definitely be loss of, of light. And I would say, in my opinion, this should be reconsidered and might even take a, a site visit of some description, but it should be reconsidered and redesigned. And I personally, Although I like the I like the quality that is, is produced, I like the fact they've got cladding on it, etc., which is really much in modern keeping. I would say this this is an overextended attempt to get more value for houses by increasing the heights at the expense of the neighbours. And so I would have to say I'm not in favour of this application. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Ms. Parsons. Thank you, Chairman. I only wanted to just to clarify that the outline consent um, that was approved was only to deal with the access at that time and all the reserve matters are to be dealt with at a later stage, which is why this application has come forward now. Um, whether or not bungalows were shown on illustrative plans is is a matter that just would have been uh, at the time of at the outline consent, the drawings would indicate dwellings. The outline consent was solely to deal with the access. So if, if illustrative plans were shown that included eight dwellings, that, that's really just to demonstrate that you can get eight dwellings on the site. But there's there's nothing. Um, we've not approved bungalows at all. I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Gibson. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, well, I think generally um, bungalows are a waste of space in lots of ways because um, you know you've got to uh, utilize the roof I think and I think the design on here um, I really like the design um, uh, but my problem is there's nothing being said about any sustainable green credentials apart from uh, you mentioned about um, plugging in cars which you know we know all know that not everyone is going to be able to have an electric car not not in the next not in the foreseeable future anyway um i i just want to know i don't think we should be building anything or putting anything up that hasn't got totally green credentials we should just shouldn't be passing it um i like the design it, it looks like a design that would i've seen houses that look like this that really fulfill those credentials um i'm not sure about the the dominance and i don't see much ecology going on around the outside um and on the edges i think they've been missed off i don't know where the site begins and the uh the fields uh start um and uh, mrs richardson was talking about she mentioned about trees about the growth of trees or something in in one of the lines i, I didn't quite get what she meant by that whether um there wasn't the space to grow, you know, to grow more, um, you know, to, you know, to grow, grow things in the gardens, basically. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Parsons. Um, I'm not aware of the green credentials attached to this application, so I can't clarify that. 
um, in terms of um, ecology, the ecologist is happy with the application. There, there are conditions attached to this consent. I'm sorry, if this is approved, there will be conditions attached and they can be seen on the agenda in respect of the management plan. And the ecologist wishes for an enhancement to ecology and that, that he expects through this, this development. Um, I'm not sure of the comments in relation to the trees. There are existing trees along the south of the site that are not within the site, they're within the neighbours' properties. Um, you can see the size of the garden, so it is really down to a view as to whether there is or is not room to plant, plant additional trees. In terms of the boundaries, the, um, the, the field boundaries run northwards of this line and eastwards of this line. So it is adjacent to the fields on two sides. If I go back to the aerial. So the site is clearly within this this area here. I think Ms Parsons, in terms of one of the questions that was raised about the neighbouring trees, and I think it was in the report about the, the potential for damage of the root areas and that that would be, I would assume, protected under the development plan that they would have to not do work within the area of the root bowl? Sorry, yes, Chairman. The, I've had clarification from our landscape officer that these trees, um, her view is that they would not be affected by this proposal and there are conditions to ensure that that's the case and they're on the, agen on the agenda. Thank you. I think Ms. Mrs DeVries, did you want to clarify something yes. as well? Sorry, it, it's just um, reiterating a little bit what Shant has already proposed. From the tree officer's comments that's at the start of the report, there is one tree that would be lost as a result of the access going in and it is proposed to replace that tree as part of the landscape scheme. In terms of the ecological and landscape um, sort of controls and mitigation, um, condition three onwards sort of deals with the ecological mitigation and the landscape stuff. So condition three um, is the licensing for the groundworks and vegetation clearance. There's a construction environment management plan as condition four. Condition five is a landscape and ecological management plan. Um, condition six is um, mitigation um, for any land, um, ecological impact to result in an um, biodiversity uplift as a result of the development and there's a construction environment management plan as seven the landscaping scheme as eight um, protection of landscape areas under condition nine and the root protection areas under sort of 10 and 11 so it is it is robustly conditioned in terms of ecological um, mitigation and uplift as a result of the development and both the ecologist and the landscape officer are satisfied with the application thank you thank you I think the next councillor I've got is councillors Facey and then councillor Bradford, I think, but councillor Facey first. Yes, thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> um, it's my own personal view, Chairman, um, is that I think the site looks very modern. Not particularly a great, I do like the cladding, etc. not particularly the colour, Chairman, uh, but again, it's the eye of the beholder. Uh, I think must commend the developer because they put a lot of thought into this. They completely removed the windows facing over Braithwaite Place. Uh, and in principle, Chairman, I, I think it's a very tidy, as Councillor Murphy says, there are some houses that have been uh, developed and put up on the old Bodie and Scoose building contractors site, not far away from there. Again, um, I, I, I think personally they've done a good job. There are lots of conditions which obviously have got to stay there. I mean, I support and with the additions of the conditions you put today. And with that, all in all, Chairman, I mean, I'm quite happy with it. And I'm quite happy to propose and support the officer's recommendation to go ahead with the development. Thank you very much. You, Councillor Bradford. I'm not sure whether Councillor Bradford's still with us because the message, I, I wasn't sure whether it was apologies he was leaving or, but I'll assume that he's not here then. Any other comments from members? At the moment, I have one proposition. Councillor Grimes? Thank you, Chairman. 
Thank you. Um, yes, I mean, there are many other developments like this in Burnham and Barrow behind other properties. Um, and I think this is a good application and I'm happy to second the recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hendry. I don't have to speak at all, Mr. Chairman. Everything I was, everything I said was going to say has just been said. So thank you. Okay, and Councillor Bolt. I was only going to second it, Chairman. Okay. In which case, I'm not seeing any other councillors making any other indications. Fine. So we'll move to the to the vote again. I'll come round to members, uh, and if you can vote for, against, or abstain, and confirm you've been present. And the proposal, just to confirm Councillor Facey, was the officer's recommendation together with the additional conditions as outlined uh, in the presentation. Is that correct? That's correct, Chairman. Thank you. Yep, Mrs Lehman, I think that's that's right. That's the three extra conditions that uh, that were outlined. So if we start this time with, uh, let's start with Councillor Facey. Yes, thank you, Chairman. They've been present throughout the uh, debate, Chairman, and I support the officer's recommendation with all the conditions. Thank you. Councillor Hendry. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, exactly the same as Councillor Facey. I support the, the recommendation with all the conditions. Thank you. And you were present? Yes, Mr Chairman. Seen and heard, heard everything. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. I think Councillor Scott left us having declared a, an interest. So we then come to Councillor Gibson. Um, yeah, hi. Yeah, I've been here for the whole debate, and because it's not got maximum green sustainable credentials, I'm voting against it. Okay, thank you, Councillor Pierce. Thank you. Yes, I've been here for the whole debate, and I'm for the recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Glassford. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. I've been here for the whole debate. I am for uh, the officer's recommendation. Thank you. And Councillor Granter? Yes, thank you, Chairman. I can confirm that I've listened and seen the whole debate, and I am for the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Grimes? Thank you, Chairman. I've seen and heard the whole debate, and I'm for. Thank you. Councillor Perry? Yes, thank you. I've been present through the whole debate, and I'm for. Thank you. Councillor Bolt. I'm present for the whole debate and I'm for. Thank you. Is Councillor Bradford with us? No. OK, uh, so we'll move to Councillor Kingham. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I've been present through the whole debate and I am for the application. Thank you. Councillor Evans. Uh, present and heard the whole debate and I'm in favour. Thank you. Councillor Murphy. Thank you, Chairman. I've been present and heard the whole debate and in sympathy with the fact that it is surrounded by bungalows, I am against. Thank you. Uh, I've also seen and heard the whole debate and I'm for the recommendation as moved. Mrs. Mrs. Nicholson, uh, can I just confirm that's all members who are present have voted? Chairman, can I just confirm, because I, I think I've missed a couple as we were going along. Councillor Grimes is obviously in support and yes. Councillor Bolt, did he? Was in favour as well. OK, thank you. That's correct. It's all right, just people were messaging me left, right and centre and it's a bit difficult when you're trying to catch up with things. So um, that is um, two against. That's an yep. easy bit. Uh, therefore, um, 12 in support? No, no, I don't think so. No. <laughs> Try 11. That's right. Do you agree with that, Mrs. Lehman? That's the numbers I've got. Yes, 11. <laughs> OK, 11, 2, and we had two absent, one for yes. interest and one left. OK, so that is clearly carried. Permission is, is granted with the additional conditions as outlined. Right, members, if you turn to the next application we have on the agenda, that means page 52 and Old Taunton Road, Bridgewater. We're just getting Councillor Scott back in. Thank you. Hopefully she's coming back in. Can I get confirmation someone can see the opening slide? Yes, we can. Perfect. Do you want to tell me when we've got everyone in? Yeah, I'll let Mrs Nicholson do that if that's all right.
okay it looks like hello that sounds like councillor scott to me yep i am here thank you perfect okay perfect. please go right. ahead the application is for 2A Old Taunton Road in Bridgewater and it's a retrospective application for the erection of a polycarbonate roof over an existing courtyard area. So the application um, is before members because the Town Council originally objected on the development being out of keeping within the conservation area. Um, but as it's not in the conservation area, they have since confirmed their objection is because the structure is not in keeping with the street scene and the character or architecture of the area. So contrary to policy D2. So the two main considerations in this case are design and impact on the immunity of the adjoining resident. So this slide shows an aerial image of the site which is identified by the red tag um, in the centre and the site's located within the settlement boundary and within a built up residential area. So with this one, the entrance we're going to look at to this property is on Old Taunton Road. The neighbouring property that's potentially impacted on has a separate entrance on the opposite side, so it's on Taunton Road entrance, but I'll cover this later with members. So this is the location of the site outlined in red and specifically the roof covers over um, the section shown as 2A outlined in the image on the right. So it's polycarbonate roof over that small section there. Um, the building internally has been split into flats and there's access to one Taunton Road on the southwest elevation from here, which leads to first floor accommodation and access to 2A itself on this elevation. So this is a uh, slideshow of the floor plan provided by the applicant to confirm the internal layout of the property and the courtyard area subject to this application forms the top right element of this floor plan. So indicated by the blue arrow, so it's this square area here that's subject to the um, roof covering. Um, uh, as you'll see, there's access into the courtyard area from the streets and then into 2A as shown by the um, orange arrow. So this is the sole access for the property. The entrance to One Taunton Road is shown by the blue arrow at the bottom of the slide and there's a staircase located on the other side of this window that overlooks the courtyard area from One Taunton Road. Um, 1 and 2A Old Taunton Road are in separate occupation and as such um, there has since the original subdivision of the building been a degree of overlooking of this courtyard entrance. Um, this slide shows the elevations of the courtyard area and the polycarbonate roof. The supporting information confirms the construction is a timber wood frame with transparent polycarbonate roofing sheets and it has been in situ for um, approximately six years. Um, if it was a residential property, it would be lawful through passage of time, but because it's flats, it still requires a planning application. The applicant is not aware of any damp issues or water ingress, and there's no heating um, devices within the courtyard area to give rise to any fires, um, fire safety hazards. Um, given concerns in terms of loss of light, the plans were amended during the application to remove a small section of the polycarbonate roof, which is immediately outside the window to increase light levels to this window serving the staircase. So the bird's eye plan in the top right hand corner shows the northern edge and entrance onto the pavement and a section of the polycarbonate roof which um, will be removed to ensure continued use of the neighbouring window. So due to the differing ownerships, the window is allowed to be opened within the existing window recess, um, but no further. And the internal edges of the courtyard are painted in a light colour to ensure maximum natural light refraction. So it's, it's this section of the roof that would effectively be cut out. At the moment, it, it extends over the whole of the courtyard, but it's considered reasonable to take out that section of the roof to allow a bit more natural light spillage into the window. Um, just in terms of context of the history, which supports the applicant in that the roof has been in place for a while ahead of this application. The courtyard was um, open, as members will see from the top image, in July uh, 2011 and the polycarbonate roof was put in place at some point between then and July 2014 and is still in place today. So the site was recently subject to an enforcement complaint which has generated the planning application. And this is a view from the road as it is at the moment. So this shows the site from Old Taunton Road and the door which provides access to 2A. 
Historically, um, this was always a walled courtyard and from this image, members will see the polycarbonate roof and the neighbour's staircase window, which looks onto this space. So given that this arrangement is historic, the use of the window serves as staircase and the amendment to ensure that there's no light reduction to this window, there's not considered to be any adverse impact in terms of immunity on the neighbouring property. Um, turning to the wider street scene and visual impact or potential visual impact, the location of the roof is between a higher brick wall on one side and a part hipped roof over the over an extension. So as such, the impact on the street scene is limited to views immediately outside the property. And when viewed in the wider street scene, it does not appear prominent or particularly out of keeping. The application is therefore recommended for approval subject to a condition requiring the opening in the roof to be undertaken within two months of the date of the decision. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any comments or questions from members, please? Uh, Councillor Pierce. Thank you, Chairman. Um, this one's difficult because the, the properties are, are so close, closely linked, aren't they? I think altering the roofs to alleviate the light problem is is one solution but the issue that continues to concern me is around water ingress to neighboring properties because one of the consultees responses clearly says that it's causing damage to other properties via water ingress on page 55 the officer report says that um, it should not result in service service water runoff but according to the information from the consultee, it does seem to be. So is this a matter that should be picked up through this process or um, building enforcement? Because it, it cannot be right if we do allow something which is actively causing a nuisance to the neighbour through the water ingress. Mrs DeVries. Thank you. Um, the applicant did provide additional information in response to the concerns raised. In terms of water ingress, a number of the properties in this general area um, had been affected historically because of the placement of the properties, not because of this development in itself. The um, 2A has undertaken remedial measures to um, remedy the situation themselves. Number one hasn't. So it, it's not as a result of this development, it's a result of the location of the site and I think proximity to one of the particular um, water channels, but it's within the supporting information that's available on the website. So it, it's not an issue of this development. So I would say it's not something that members could consider as part of this application. OK, Councillor Pierce. OK, Councillor Gibson. Yeah, I just want you to just clear it for me. The window that's been cut um, with the light taken away. Who whose is that window? Who does that? Whose is that window? Right. This this window here. Yeah. That belongs that to number first? one. Taunton so Road. That, so that's the, from the front access. Yeah. And so, it's, so the person that's put the the roof on there has cut their window in half. You know, their their light. Is that right? Um, it's it's a polycarbonate roof, so it is see through in terms of it does let light through. Yeah, it's but not our concern. Our concern with the application was that it didn't let enough light through, which is why we've we've conditioned it that a section of that roof is to come out to allow more light to go through. Yeah, because it's not it's quite um dense. It's not it doesn't let a light a lot. I, I mean, I've obviously seen this because I used to live on that road, but um it is um it's not that clear is it the the light yeah okay i just i just wanted that that uh clearing up thanks thank you councillor kingham yeah thank you chairman um i'm not always again i'm always against these retrospective planning applications but i think in this this case i think it's um obviously for what it is it's taken up a lot of time and what have you and i think that um we should approve it and uh, get it finished with. Thank you. Was that a proposal? Yes, Chairman. OK. Is Councillor Hendry? I, I fully agree with uh, Councillor Stuart King. I'm quite happy to second them, Mr Chairman. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I've got a uh, Councillor Gibson again, please. 
I think you're on mute, Councillor Gibson. Yeah, yeah, I am. Sorry, I was just trying to get my A in. I don't like uh, leaving letters out of my words <laughs> while I'm <laughs> typing. Um, I, can I, I mean, I haven't seen uh, the proposed, what this section that's going to come out of the, um, out of this roof. Can I, because that, I just can't make any. It's like a, it's tiny on my screen and I can't work out. Is it going to be a whole section back to the wall? The, 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 um, the wall that's there or the original wall or is it just a little bit cut out what is it is it so the, the i can't see that it, from that yeah the, the width of it is is 1.8 meters so it's, it's this rectangle so it goes right onto the edge of it it's 1.8 meters in width and it's um 45 centimeters in depth okay so it's just a little section cut out not not yeah. to the wall not like it's not just taking it making it into a porch or anything because that 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 would make more sense to me that you'd make it take the whole section out from the window but okay it's tiny okay any other comments or questions from members please no i'm not seeing any others so we'll move to to the vote because we've had the proposal from councillor king and seconded councillor hendry to Grant permission. I, what, can I just clarify, Mrs. DeVries, was there an additional condition that you were adding or was that just you were highlighting the conditions no. that were on? It, it was highlighting the condition that okay. requires them to cut out that section within That's, two months of the date of consent. That's fine. Thank you very much. So again, I'll come to members for your uh, your votes, please, and, and to confirm that you've been present throughout. Uh, we'll start with Councillor Murphy this time. Councillor Murphy. Is Councillor Murphy present? I'll come back to Councillor Murphy. Councillor Evans. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Chairman. Confirm I've been here and seen and heard the debate and my votes in favour of the proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Kingham. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I've been here and listened to the whole debate and I am for the proposal. Thank you. Councillor Bradford, I presume, is still not with us. No, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, Councillor Bolt. Yeah, present for the whole debate, and I'm for the officer's recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Perry. Yes, thank you. I was present through the whole debate, and I'm for. Thank you, Councillor Grimes. Seen and heard everything, and I'm for, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Granter. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Seen and heard the all the debate, and. Uh, I am for the recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Glassford. Yes, thank you, Chairman. She didn't hear the whole debate and I'm for the officer's recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Pierce. Yes, thank you. Seen and heard the whole debate and I'm for the recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Gibson. Yeah, uh, thank you. I've seen and heard the whole debate and I'm against because I think that area is too small that you proposed. Thank you, you. Councillor Scott. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I've seen and heard the whole debate and I'm for the proposal. Thank you. And Councillor Hendry. I've seen and heard everything, Mr Chairman, and I'm for. And just a point about uh, Councillor Alan Bradford. He said first thing this morning that uh, he was going to have to leave for a few hours. So I don't know if you knew that. No, I'm sorry, I hadn't picked up okay. on that. So okay, thank, thank you. you for the next note. Councillor Facey. Yes, Chairman. Uh, seen and heard the whole debate, Chairman, and I'm for the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Murphy. I think we I may have lost. I think, yeah, I think I think we've lost connection with him. OK, all right. And so I think that makes me the last member. So I've also seen and heard the discussion and debate and I'm for the recommendation as it's been moved. So I think Mr Nicholson, that's all members have voted who are present. It's 12 in support, one against and one lost connection. And and yes, and Councillor Bradford's left us, so that's fine. Yep, that's all the members accounted for, so that is clearly carried. So permission is granted. Uh, I think if if members will bear with, we'll just take the the reports, and then uh, that will bring us to the end. So that's the reports on six point one, which is the certificates of lawfulness, uh, which are fairly short, I think, today. Mrs. Debris. 
Thank you. Um, we've got one certificate of lawfulness that's been granted at 62A Road Lane um, just to use it as a separate residential um, dwelling. So they've obviously had it in use for over four years and submitted a lawful development certificate. Okay. If there's no comments or questions on that one, we can move to 6.2, which is the appeals received. So appeals received, we've had an application to determine if prior approvals required for change of use of an agricultural building to a dwelling. Um, so that's a class Q application. We've got an appeal at Townsend Farm for gas powered energy generation facility um, for a temporary period of 25 years. Um, and we've had the appeal submitted for the application that was before members for 40 dwellings. It was the outline consent at Old Bristol Road East Brent. So that's in with us at the moment. OK, if there are any, I don't think I'm seeing any comments or questions on those. So we move to a 6.3, which is the Section 106 agreements issued. Thank you. So we've had one issued for north and east of Holden Hall. Holdenhurst Cheddar Road in um, Widmore, which was a variation of condition to um, uh, 11 age restricted dwellings and manager's office to amend the approved plans for plot nine. So that would have been a deed of variation. Um, and the Nook Five Old Road in North Petherton, which was a removal of a condition um, to allow the annex to be used as an independent residential dwelling. OK, again, any comments or questions that members have? No, nope. in which case, thank you all very much. I think that brings us to the end of our business for this morning. Uh, we'll restart again at 2.30 this afternoon. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Technical failure, the chairman will adjourn the meeting and set a new time to reinstate the meeting. Please note that the meeting is being recorded. All those present will remain muted until the chairman allows them to speak. Only members of the public who, that have registered to speak can make representation to the committee. The format of the meeting will be as per the agenda published and a copy of the officer presentations can be found on the committee web page. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can I also welcome you to the committee? I'm Councillor Filmer, chairman of the committee. Uh, just to give you a bit of background as to how we'll operate this afternoon. Uh, we'll take each application in turn. The officers will outline the detail of the application and that will be followed by a public speaking session. Um, the members will then debate the application and decide on it. For members of the committee wishing to speak again, if I could remind you to use the online chat uh, just to indicate when you wish to speak and I'll call you in turn. Uh, during the debate, there will be a proposer and a seconder for a resolution. Members will then vote on this proposal in turn and they will have to confirm that they've been present throughout the application being considered and they will then vote for against or abstain on the proposal the votes will then be counted and the result announced i'll now ask the officers and councillors who will be taking part in the meeting this afternoon to confirm that they can see and hear me and to introduce themselves so if we start with the uh, planning officers and uh, dawn de Vries. Thank you very much, Chairman. I can confirm I can see and hear everyone. I'm the Principal Planning Officer for the West, so I'll be leading on some applications and be lead officer on others. Thank you. Thank you. Is Adrian Noon with us? Yes, I am. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I can see and hear everything. Uh, my name is Adrian Noon. I'm Principal Planning Officer for the East, and I will be providing support to the presenting officers um, as necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Shanta Parsons. Hello. Um, good afternoon. My name is Shanta Parsons, Senior Planning Officer for the West. I can see and hear everything. Thank you. Thank you. And Dean Titchener. Hi there. Yeah, I'm Senior Planning Officer in the East team and I can confirm I can see and hear everything. Thank you very much. Uh, from our legal section, is uh, Dawn Lehman present? Yes, thank you, Chairman. Dawn Lehman, um, legal advisor to the committee. I can confirm I can see and hear everything. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and from Democratic Services, Leila Nicholson. Thank you, Chairman. My name's Leila Nicholson, committee manager for this this uh, meeting. Um, I can confirm I can see and hear everyone. Thank you. If we then come to the members of the committee. Uh, 
we've got uh, to start with, I think, is Councillor Glassford present? Doesn't sound so at the moment, so I'll come back to Councillor Glassford. Uh, Councillor Pearce. Good afternoon. Um, Councillor Cathy Pearce, Westover Ward, Bridgewater. I confirm I can see and hear everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Is Councillor Gibson present? Hello. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, Eastover, Bridgewater. And um, I can see and hear everyone at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Scott. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, Councillor Liz Scott from Axvale Ward near Axbridge, and I can confirm I can see and hear everyone. Thank you. And Councillor Hendry. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Sedgemoor District Councillor Alistair Hendry for Burnham Sea Central, and yes, I can see and hear everything. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Facey. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Councillor Mike Facey, Burnham Sea North. I can confirm I can see and hear everyone. Uh, Councillor Murphy. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I can see and hear everyone. Councillor Mike Murphy for uh, Burnham and Sea North. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Revens. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Councillor Bill Revens representing North Petherton Ward confirming I can see and hear everything. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Kingham. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman. Yes, Councillor Stuart Kingham uh, representing the West Poldens, and I can hear and see all. Uh, Councillor Bradford. Good afternoon, everyone. Councillor Alan Bradford representing North Petherton, and I can hear and see everyone quite clearly. Thank you. Councillor Bolt. Yes, uh, Brian Bolt, Ward Member for Cannington and Wemden. I can see and hear the meeting. Thank you, Councillor Perry. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Councillor Liz Perry representing the King's R Ward, and I can confirm I can hear and see everything. Councillor Grimes. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, Tony Grimes, Deputy Chairman, Barrow Ward. I confirm I can see and hear everything. Thank you. Thank you. And Councillor Glassford, I think you've managed to Join us. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Yes, I can see, can hear and see everything. I'm Councillor for Fairfax Ward. Thank you. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a Councillor Filmer, I'm Chairman of the Committee, and I've also seen and heard all the uh, the members and officers. Uh, just to, to mention, we also have with us, obviously, uh, members of the public, uh, who some of whom are registered to speak, some of whom are here to observe. We also have other members of the council, uh, again, I th to observe the uh, the meeting uh, this afternoon, and I think that still includes the portfolio holder for development. If we move on to the agenda for this afternoon, uh, Councillor Perry, did you want to come in before I carry on? No, sorry, I um I was waiting for declarations. Don't worry, sorry. Okay, sorry. <laughs> OK, so we'll move on to uh, apologies for absence. Mrs Nicholson. Thank you, Chairman. I've received apologies from Councillor Granter for this afternoon session. Um, could you just bear with me one minute? I'm just going to allow somebody into the meeting, but I'm not sure who it is. So okay. can I just clarify who it is when I let them in? Certainly. Two seconds. I'm having problems with people coming in. Good afternoon. Somebody is registered as Sedgemore Issues. Could you clarify who you are, please? Are they on mute? Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't unmute them. OK, well, we'll um, just have to leave it. We'll carry on. OK. Uh, so that brings us to item two on the agenda, which is urgent business of which I have, have none that isn't on the agenda. Uh, public speaking time for members of the public, for those of you who have registered this afternoon, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we'll take each application in turn. The officers will outline the background to the application and its detail, and then we'll ask you to address the committee. 
Uh, to do that, we'll need you to unmute your microphone at the when we let you know, and just then confirm uh, that the microphone is working. You'll have three minutes to address the committee, and when you've got two minutes of that time has gone and you've got one minute left to go, you should hear a bell to give you an indication that the time is running down. So, Mrs. Nicholson. Uh, that, so once you hear that bell, that means you've got one minute of your time left to to go. And obviously, if you can draw your comments to a conclusion before the three minutes is up, that would be appreciated. Item four is declarations of interest, and we'll start with Councillor Perry. Right, thank you. Yeah, I was a bit previous. Um, yes, on page 92, uh, I'm the ward member for the King's Isle, but I took no part in any parish council discussions on that particular application. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other declarations from any members? I think, it, <clears throat> Mr Chairman, I think I yep. should, I'm not even sure if I should, it, a hybrid appears twice but it's actually Highbridge East Huntsville, but it's a TA9 address, um, you know, uh, secret world. So I am a town councillor for Highbridge, but I have taken no part in any conversations whatsoever, if that matters. Fine, Mrs Nicholson, I think you've indicated with your hand up. Uh, only because um, the East Huntsville application is um, for a, a councillor of our authority, um, so if the legal officer wants me to, I will just do a blanket declaration. Mrs. Lehman? I don't know. Yes, um, we, we do a blanket declaration. OK, uh, while we're doing declarations, I need to declare a couple, which is page 82. Uh, Limpsham is within my. Uh, within my ward, uh, I attend the parish council meetings, but I've taken no part in in any discussion on these and have left the meeting when that was up for discussion. And the same thing applies to the two applications on 68 and 77. Uh, East Huntsville is within my ward, but I leave the uh, the meeting when they come to discuss any planning matters. Uh, Councillor Scott. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, it's my apologies actually for not declaring an interest this morning as I didn't realise it was um, uh, adjacent to a friend's house. Thank no, you. That, that's fine. I, I think uh, Legal and Democratic both noted it when you put it in the chat. So okay. thank you for that. Thank you. Right, members, that brings us to the end of the decorations. I'm not seeing any other comments from members. So that moves us on to the planning applications themselves. We start, I think, this afternoon in, in Limpsham with uh, Mrs. DeVries. I think you're presenting this one. Are you on mute? I was. Oh, I'm just okay. getting the PowerPoint up and running. Bear with me one second. No problem. Yep, that's on the screen. Perfect. I'm just struggling to get the um, actual slide version up. Bear with me. I'm just going to restart it. Right, thank you for bearing with me. That should be the opening slide. Yep, that's the cover sheet. Lovely. Um, so the application seeks consent for demolition of, of existing outbuildings and erection of two holiday cottages and is before members of the parish council are objecting on grounds of traffic generation um, from the existing access, loss of residential immunity, impact um, through noise and disturbance and visual impact with the development appearing overbearing on Slade Lane. So the main considerations for this application are principle of development, size, scale and design, um, residential immunity, highway considerations, ecology and landscaping and flood risk. So this is an aerial shot of the development site indicated by the red pin. Um, the site would be accessed from Slade Lane and lies within the settlement boundary for Limpsham. Um, so we'll come on to photos shortly, but Slade Lane sort of goes up in this direction. 
turns into a private access drive at this point to serve these properties and there's an agricultural access here that members will see in further photos. So this is a closer view of the application site with the roofs of the existing outbuildings. So an outbuilding here and here um, indicated they would be demolished as part of the application and the application seeks to demolish them and provide two holiday cottages. Um, looking at context, the above slide shows Slade Lane and the access route towards the application site um, as seen from Google Street View. The top image shows Slade Lane and then the bottom, bottom image shows where Slade Lane turns into the private access and the agricultural access as mentioned on the aerial shot earlier. So this is the private access road and the agricultural access as members would have seen it. Within the site, there are a couple of existing outbuildings, um, the largest of which is mono pitch, open front and block work in construction, and then the dual pitch one opposite. And again, a further photo of um, a view from the access towards the dual pitch building and the mono pitch building, and from within the site, looking between the two of them, the dual pitch and the mono pitch. So the plan indicates the existing buildings with the hatched lines, if members can make out. So the mono pitch structure is currently in this location here and the dual pitch structure in this location here. Um, the two holiday lodges are shown as holiday lodge A and B and are orientated facing south with a parking area to the west of the buildings. So orientated in this direction and parking for both of the units to the side here. In terms of principle, due to the location of the site within the settlement boundary, the principle of residential development, tourism or unrestricted is unacceptable. This, um, sorry, is acceptable. This application is proposed as tourism accommodation, which is considered to be appropriate given the absence of rear gardens. And it's considered that the development would be compliant with policy D17, promoting rural tourism, um, rural enterprise and being well related in terms of the facilities of Limpsham. In terms of design, the development would result in the reuse of an existing concrete yard and through the demolition of the existing structures, the development would result in enhancement in terms of character and appearance. The scale and materials of the development is considered to be rural in appearance and appropriate given the location. So this slide shows the front south elevation and east elevation of unit A, um, which you'll note the east elevation has no windows. Both of the units are matching in terms of design and layout. Um, this is a separate little outbuilding, which is to the front of um, building A. That's proposed to be a bicycle store. The west elevation um, of unit A faces Slade Lane and the parking area, whilst unit B faces the east elevation of unit A. Um, obviously, one has windows, the other doesn't, so the orientation isn't considered to cause any adverse impact. And the rear elevation of both the units don't have any openings, so there's no um, overlooking to the rear of the buildings. Um, the council have raised concern, um, or, or members of the public have raised concern about dominance of this development on the character of Slade Lane. Although the development is located over 70 metres um, from where the private access meets Slade Lane, and this addition to this, in addition to the intervening landscape to be retained, is considered to result in minimal impact. Um, this shows the ground floor and first floor layout, which provides for an open plan living kitchen area, hall, snug and bathroom at ground floor and two bedrooms within the roof space and a bathroom. The outbuilding to the front of unit A, um, as previously indicated, that's for a bicycle store. Um, the layout is considered to allow for sufficient amenity for future occupiers. So in respect of impact to the neighbours, um, the site is located at distance from the surrounding properties with the nearest being 31 metres to the west. Um, the windows facing in this direction on the building is, is conditioned to be obscure glazed. Um, concerns were raised in terms of noise and disruption, um, but the proposed use is considered to be compatible with the surrounding residential use. Concerns were raised in terms of highway safety and intensification of the access. The site is currently served by private access, serving a small number of properties, and the proposal would result in an increase in traffic. But the scale of this as a result of two two-bed holiday cottages were not in itself considered to result in a highway safety issue. 
Two parking spaces are provided for both properties and sufficient turning within the site. The width and alignment of Slade Lane were raised as an issue, but it's considered that drivers would be reducing their speed in order to negotiate the access. Bike storage is also proposed as part of the development. So based on the above, officers are satisfied there would be no adverse impact in terms of highway safety. Um, in respect of ecology and landscaping, a preliminary roost and nest assessment was undertaken and submitted with the application. This did identify um, evidence of roosting bats within the existing outbuildings. There are a number of conditions proposed as part of the application, um, conditions 5 to 10 to ensure work is undertaken in accordance with the habitats and species reg regulations and adequate mitigation is provided on site. Condition 13 also requires um, a landscape planting scheme to be submitted and agreed. Subject to this, officers are satisfied the development would comply with policy. So in respect to flood risk, the site is located in flood zone 3, but the sequential test is passed um, due to its siting within the settlement boundary for Limpsham. In regards to the exemptions test, um, the development is over two floors with safe refuge in the event of flood um, and replaces an existing area of hard standing. There is a surface water drainage condition to ensure that there's no increased flood risk off site. So in conclusion, the principle of development within the settlement boundary is considered to be acceptable. The size, scale and design of the two units um, currently proposed are considered to be high quality and rural in appearance and would not give rise to any adverse impact on the surrounding residential properties. Um, it would result in an intensification of the existing access, um, which is fairly constrained, but not to the extent that it's considered to give rise to a highway safety um, objection. Um, there are a number of conditions imposed regarding ecology and landscaping and flood risk, and subject to the imposition of these, um, officers are satisfied the development complies with policy. So the application is before members with a recommendation for approval. Thank you. Thank you very much. As you'll see, we have a, a speaker on the on this application. Uh, Sarah Tucker, if you could uh, turn on your microphone and just confirm that it's working for us, please. Hopefully that's working. Can everyone hear me? Absolutely. Yes, we can. So again, just to remind you, you've got three minutes to address the committee. You'll hear the bell go when there's one of that to go. Start when you're ready. Thank you and good afternoon and thank you for allowing me to speak on behalf of my clients, Matt and Emma. You have heard the proposal described in some detail this afternoon, and as you have heard, the proposal complies with planning policy for the provision of new holiday accommodation within settlement boundaries, so I do not propose to go over that again. I do, however, want to reassure members that Matt and Emma take residential amenity very seriously. Matt and Emma will in fact be the closest residents to the holiday lets as they live at Ranscombe House. They have two very small children and are naturally extremely keen to avoid, avoid noise and disturbance so close to their own family home. The cottages will therefore be aimed at families and couples seeking to enjoy the quiet of the Somerset countryside. Similarly, Matt and Emma and their children use the lane every day walking to and from school. Each holiday let is deliberately limited to two bedrooms to maintain small bookings and keep the number of additional car journeys to a minimum. Furthermore, holidaymakers will be encouraged to use bicycles and to take advantage of local and tourist public transport. Privacy also played an important role in the design process. Following discussion with neighbours, obscured glass in the western elevation of the western holiday let, as you've just seen, will protect both the neighbouring property and holidaymakers from potential overlooking. The hedge along the southern boundary next to the field has been largely inaccessible behind the existing buildings for a number of years. It is proposed to retain and manage this hedge so it can continue to screen the, the holiday cottages from, from properties to some distance to the southwest of Ranscombe House. A planting scheme has been suggested by condition, as you just heard. My clients are, of course, very happy with this and will put forward a landscaping plan if you vote to approve the application today. Emma and Matt are keen conservationists and have already planted over 20 native trees on land in their ownership adjoining the site in a bid to increase natural habitat for birds and insects. In summary, the removal of the old buildings, the breaking up of the concrete yard and their replacement with two modest one and a half storey holiday cottages with associated landscaping to be agreed will enhance the setting of the area rather than detract from it. Thank you very much for your time today and for your understanding. Thank you. Members, any comments or questions, please? Uh, 
I think Councillor Kingham, you've got your hand up. So if you'd like to go first. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, I mean, so they're very, very nice um, holiday accommodation house properties. Um, a lot better than probably the uh, the normal mobile home, which is cladded in a, a timber effect cladding. Um, obviously, there will be conditions on this for occupancy as they're a holiday let. Presumably, I don't know what sort of time scale will be put on that. But obviously, that I would think would be needed. But um, very nice looking properties, and I'm sure that uh, they will be well occupied by people coming to stay on holiday in this part of the world. Um, at the moment, I don't have a problem with them. Thank you, Mrs. Teresa. If you could just clarify the, the condition in terms of occupancy. Yeah, so condition three, um, as recommended, is our standard um, Sedgemoor District Council standard uh, tourism policy. It does require it for, to be occupied for tourism purposes only, but it can be occupied year round, but it is our standard um, condition. Thank you. Uh, I've then got Councillor Gibson, Councillor Hendry and Councillor Scott. Councillor Gibson. Yeah, thank you. Um, I want to know again uh, the green uh, credentials of the, the buildings. Um, really, because nothing's been said about that. They might have planted 20 trees, which is great, but the building, they're putting buildings there that are going to be using energy uh, for the rest of their, you know, the rest of the building's life. And I'd like to know that. And the the bats that have been found on site, um, are they are they nesting or they roosting? Um, are they in the buildings that are going to be knocked down uh, at the moment for the evidence of that? And why is there not an east window on the east side? I just wanted to know that was just something that stood out for me, that it wasn't a window on the east side of that one building. But the, the great, yeah, the sustainable is this is what's got to be going up. Um, and you can't be passing stuff unless it is, I don't think. Thank you, Mr. DeRees. Thank you. Um, we haven't got details submitted with this application in terms of the green um, credentials for this development. Um, in terms of the bats, as mentioned on my presentation, conditions sort of five to ten cover the bats element. So there is a requirement under condition five for there to be a license. Um, there is a requirement from condition six for all construction oper operatives to be inducted by a licensed bat ecologist um, and sort of taking due care and consideration with any work that's potentially affecting bats. Condition seven is the lighting design for bats. Condition eight requires improved cavity bat boxes to be installed in the eastern gable wall of the easternmost holiday let um, and puts that criteria for how and when that needs to be carried out. And there's um, restrictions on demolition of the buildings as well in terms of time frames and provision needs to be made for nesting swallows. All of that's because of the ecology reports and the identification of bats and swallows as part of that report. Um, subject to those conditions, the county ecologist was happy with that. Um, in terms of the east elevation, with east elevation for unit A, that's this elevation here, because unit B is the same as A, there are windows on this elevation of this this building so that would look out onto a flank gable so there'd be no conflict between the two um, and this eastern elevation would be the one that would um, be subject to the roost um, in accordance with condition. I think that's answered all the issues. Thank you. I've got as I say councillors Hendry, Scott and then Bolt so councillor Hendry. Good afternoon Mr Chairman. I'd like to thank the case officer first for a first class presentation. Uh, this whole project is about as close to perfect as I can possibly see, to be honest. They've got all bases covered. There's no problem with ecology access, no impact, no adverse impact at all on the, on the entire village of Lumsham. Uh, there is nothing negative I can say about this whatsoever. And if it's passed today, I'd like to wish the family well. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Scott. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I wonder if the officer could actually indicate where the parish boundary actually is. And also, I understand um, there was conversation with the neighbours. Were there any objections from the immediate neighbours? Thank you. Thank you. This is the um, I'm just scrolling up the report. Bear with me because all the objections are listed on the report. So there were four letters received. Um, the points that were raised within the objection letter was generally increase on traffic on Slade Lane 
um, because there's no, no current footway um, along that. Um, and concern about increased use of that access causing um, safety issues. Uh, any guests would need to use their cars to get to local amenities, um, which are not in the village. Impact on residential amenities through overlooking and loss of privacy. Um, obviously, as set out in the presentation previously, this is the nearest house, which is the applicant's house. Um, this is a significant difference away and first floor windows obscure glazed from that respect. The orientation of these units are sort of in this direction. And this is the landscaped hedge that the um, agent spoke of during the presentation. So it would provide screening at, from longer distance views from sort of these two properties. Um, the, they raised concern as well about the view from balcony would be of a parking area. I'm assuming they're meaning the first floor window on this area, but that's obscure glazed and that's the parking area. Um, but again, landscaping across here that'd be controlled by condition. Um, and concerns that it wasn't providing homes for local people, but it's, it's tourist accommodation. So it's an economic generating use rather than residential solely. And Mr. Dries, do you have any detail of where the village development boundary is? Sorry, yes. Um, it does run to the rear of this property and along the rear here as well. I'm unsure without checking whether it's a straight diagonal line down or if it goes down along here. And then cuts in across there, but it is within the settlement boundary. Councillor Scott. Yes, thank you. Um, my main concern, I think, was is that just the only property that's coming off of that private entrance? The, is it the, the house that owns the area? Is that the only um, house that comes off that entrance? No, there's at least four because this is Slade Lane here. Yeah. Oh, um, I see. And, and, and the story. private access starts there. So mm. this property comes off it, as does this one, as mm. do these two. Yeah. So it, it would be another two off of this private access bit that leads on to Slade Lane. Yeah. And where would things like bins be picked up from? Do they go right down to the end of um, the private access? Do you know? Um, I, I don't have that information, I'm afraid. OK. My, my assumption would be the bins for the tourist um, lodges would be generally stored in this location, but it's an assumption. Um, generally, they tend to pick up from highways rather than private accesses, mm -hmm. so it may be that bin storage would be down this end on bin collection days, but okay. that's an assumption. Okay, thank you. Okay, Councillor Bolt. Uh, just a bit of clarification on this year round um, access. Uh, are we saying that somebody could literally continue renting that, or do they have to have a separate residence? Um, elsewhere, um, a, a year round seems an awful long time. Mr. Dries. Thank you. Um, the condition reads that the holiday accommodation permitted under this reference number shall be used for holiday accommodation only and shall not be occupied, occupied as a person's sole or main residence. So whoever is occupying it needs a sole or main residence somewhere else. Um, the site owners and operators, this is the second part of the condition, shall maintain a comprehensive up-to-date register of the names of the owners and occupiers, including their guests, of individual ho holiday lets on site and evidence of their main home addresses and dates of occupation, um, the holiday, um, dates of occupation of the holiday accommodation and make this information available. So it, it used to be limited that um, holiday occupation holiday accommodation traditionally used to shut for one or two months of the year. Um, then it was limited in terms of how long people could stay there. Um, those two bits of that condition have fallen away um, due to changes in um, case law, but there is a requirement for a register to be kept of the sole or main address of any occupiers, and it needs to be occupied as holiday accommodation only. And at any point, the council can request the register of the occupiers and double check sort of that it is being occupied in accordance with the condition. Councillor Bolt. Thank you. When you said year round, um, I, I, that was uh, a concern. OK, just before I come to other members, just just a reminder for, for members of the public and other councillors who are present, um, the, the, the meeting chat area is is only for for members to indicate that they wish to uh, 
to comment. Uh, I, I understand that comments have been put in there to, to be helpful and give information, but unfortunately we, we can't take further comments once the debate has started. So uh, if I could ask members of the public and, and other non-members of the committee uh, to refrain from using the chat, that would be, would be appreciated. Councillor Grimes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just a, a question, really. Is these uh, holiday cottages would be tied to the um, the main house, um, so that they couldn't actually be split as uh, units, or would it need to come back to us? That was my Great. question. Um, they're not currently tied um, with any conditions. Um, we have and we can condition that holiday lets are maintained and retained in connection with the sole residence. Um, that's usually done when there's an impact on a particular resident. So it's not tied to Ranscombe House in the current conditions as recommended. Um, if members felt for planning reasons they should be tied to Ranscombe House, it could be added as a condition. Um, but we haven't done it in this case because there isn't a direct conflict uh, with Ranscombe House. And if they were sold or sublet off, they would have to be um, as tourist accommodation unless they came back to vary condition three. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would actually like the, these conditions put on um, if that if if that was feasible. Uh, if I come to Mrs. DeVries first and then I think Adrian, Mr. Noon has um, indicated to speak as well. So <clears throat> Mrs. DeVries, did you want to comment on the addition of that condition? Um, we, we can put it on. Uh, the reason it hasn't been put on is because there wasn't considered to be a planning reason for it, because if it's tourist accommodation and if it's appropriate within the settlement boundary, we'd only usually tie it to the property if there was an adverse impact on the property. So Ranscombe House would retain control over the impact on itself. But as we were satisfied with the impact between the two, that's why we didn't put it on. But if, if members felt that they needed to be tied to Ranscombe House, we can add it as a condition. Thank you. Mr. Noon. Um, I was just going to sort of suggest, depending on how that condition is worded, I think if members are anxious that it is a non fragmentation thing, that would have to be done by Section 106 agreement. You can, um, a condition is limited in terms of own, control of ownership. Um, I think you know, possibly uh, Mrs. Lehman might want to advise on the on the best way to do that if members felt it is essential. But as the presentation has shown is you know, what harm would arise on Ranscombe House if these two units were operated by someone else? There would still be holiday makers in there that they don't know until they arrive. Um, so I, I think it's, it's clear on this one that I think the separation is such that there is no harm if they are operated by a third party. And I think you need to cite what harm that would be to justify either doing it by condition or probably by Section 106. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from members? Uh, Councillor Hendry. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I've heard what everybody said. I'm happy with, with this as it stands. I think it's actually really, really good. In fact, I'm very happy with it. I'd like to move the recommendation. Thank you, Mr Chairman. And that's just, just to confirm, that's the recommendation as it stands. As it stands, I, I wouldn't impose any conditions, but that's obviously okay. for other people, but I personally wouldn't as it stands. And yes, I'm moving the recommendation as it stands. Thank you. Thank you. I think I've next got Councillor Bolt. Yeah, I, I can understand where Councillor Grimes is coming from with regards to this, is to the, the potential of the control of the properties. But I, I don't think, I, I don't know that that's a, a planning issue. Um, uh, th that's what I'm questioning. OK, Councillor Kingham. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I'd just like to um, second the recommendation. OK, are there any other further comments or questions that members have? So the recommendation that we currently have is to to grant permission as outlined in the in the report by the by the officers uh, with no further amendments to that as it stands so the i'll come to members in turn again will you give your vote if you can confirm that you've been present throughout the whole of the debate and presentation and whether you are for against or abstaining on the proposal that's been made so we'll start with councillor uh, glassford Thank you, Chairman. Uh, 
I have seen and heard the whole presentation. I am in favour of the officer's recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Pearce. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I've seen and heard the whole presentation and I'm in favour of the officer's recommendation. Councillor Gibson. Uh, um, I've seen and heard the presentation and I abstain. OK, thank you. Uh, Councillor Scott. Yes, I've seen the um, um, I've seen and heard the whole presentation and I'm for the officer's recommendation. Councillor yeah. Hendry. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I've seen and heard everything and I'm obviously for it and I wish the family well. Thank you. Councillor Facey. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I've been present throughout the presentation, Chairman. Seen and heard and I'm for the recommendation. Councillor Murphy. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Yes, I've been here present. I've seen and heard the whole presentation and I'm for the recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Revens. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I've seen and heard the presentation and debate and my vote in favour of the recommendation. And Councillor Kingham. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Yes, I've been present through the whole debate and I heard and seen all and I am for. Thank you, Councillor Bradford. I've heard the whole debate and been present, Mr Chairman, and I'm for. Councillor Bolt. Present for the whole debate and I'm for. Councillor Perry. Yes, I was present through the whole debate and I'm for. Councillor Grimes. Yes, present for the whole debate and I'm for. Thank you. And I've also been present throughout and I'm also for. I think, Mr Nicholson, that's all councillors who are present have voted. Thank you, Chairman. <laughs> Find me microphone there. Um, yes, that's uh, 13 4 and 1 abstention. Thank you. So that's clearly carried. So permission is is granted. Right, members, if you could turn to the next application where we have speakers present, and that's on page 92. And we're within uh, the parish of Western Zoyland. And I think, Mr. Titchener, you're presenting this one. Uh, that's correct, Chairman. I will um, uh, just upload the uh, presentation. Can you see that yet? Yes, we can. It's up on the screen. So that's okay. the, the front cover. OK, so it's a variation of condition application. It's a variation of a planning permission. Uh, which is for the erection of two dwellings uh, with garages um, and to vary the details of the access drive from Hamrod Lane leading to the site. So the land is at, uh, land associated with 27 Fourth Street, uh, Western Zoyland, uh, Bridgewater. Okay, so um, should have clicked through, it's just an yeah, error. Aerial plan just to familiarise ourselves with the site. So the application site is um, this sort of green site within the circle. Hamrod Lane is the lane that spurs down, which is a no through road spurring down, serving about 10 properties here. And just looking at the location plans, it comes up um, showing the red outline of the site. So the two dwellings which have been approved were to uh, be located in here and then a uh, blue line showing land owned by the um, applicant. Uh, and just the existing block plan that was approved as part of the uh, previous scheme just showed the connection to Hamrod Lane uh, with the access being served through here, along here, into the site here. And this is the approved uh, block plan as part of the previous scheme showing the two detached dwellings that were located uh, within this part of the site with the access coming in um, and uh, showing the turning areas uh, for the site. Um, so that's part of the uh, approval. And just just to, to uh, again, just to sort of show what, um, what's been approved on the site, these are the elevation drawings uh, that were considered acceptable at the, at the time. So plot one, uh, detached dwelling uh, with its uh, garage uh, to the side plans showing uh, the properties as proposed upstairs downstairs and plot two uh, again slightly different design uh, some slight variations from the first one m plan roof uh, but fairly similar and that's uh, located on the uh, 
the plot. And again, a floor plan just showing uh, the internal layout uh, of what was uh, approved previously. That one had its own detached garage uh, separate uh, from the uh, main dwelling. And just some photographs that were brought from the previous scheme. So when the previous uh, presentation was shown to committee, just familiarise the site, even though these aren't really particularly material to the, the main consideration, which is about access, but I just wanted to refresh everyone's memory. Uh, so this is the site. It's a, an existing very large garden associated with 27 4th Street. So this is sort of part of the wider, it's almost in an L shape, this garden. So the main actual existing house, 27 4th Street, which is on 4th Street, the main road through Western Zoyland, is much further sort of to the north, which has its own garden. And then it has this very large uh, uh, area sort of laid to sort of formal lawn uh, to the rear on which the uh, proposals uh, uh, were granted. Lower photograph just showing uh, another shot within the site. Uh, looking out partly over some of the stabling, uh, which is on adjoining land, which is also accessed from Hamrod Lane. And then again, just a couple other um, points. So stood within the site, looking back uh, in a southerly direction. Uh, this is the access point of Hamrod Lane coming into the site here. Boundary of number five, Hamrod Lane uh, coming up through here. And then bottom photograph looking directly south over the adjoining paddock, which um, um, and some uh, uh, equipment within it um, and the stables is just slightly out of shot there. Again, just getting a bit of context for what the, the site, that's uh, 5 Hamrod Lane, which adjoins the site in its western boundary. Again, another photograph of its uh, there. And then just looking back up, um, so this is the sort of lower end of Hamrod Lane, looking back up uh, Hamrod towards the junction with uh, the A372 4th Street uh, to the north. Uh, and again, um, this is much closer in proximity to that junction there. And um, visibility, um, which displays photographs as was shown to members at the time of the original application. I've got some more photos to come on to as we get into the key issues, but the principle of development, the principle of the two dwellings was, was accepted when the scheme previously came to uh, to committee uh, in 2020. Uh, so this is a variation of condition applications so it seeks to vary condition seven. So with these type of applications, it's only necessary to consider how the scheme differs from that previously approved. It's not necessary to revisit the other matters that aren't changing as they've already been considered as, as acceptable and in this case the changes relate to an access plan and the details of, of the width of the access proposed and this is the access plan that was submitted as part of um, as part of um, of this application. So what it shows is um, the uh, detailed uh, width measurements and boundary treatments along the uh, uh, access off Hamrod Lane. So this is the lower end of Hamrod Lane here, uh, which is public highway. And this section here is a private drive leading up through the site. And there are the um, width dimensions shown on here and the boundary treatments. So the width uh, at its narrowest here indicated as narrowing to 3.1 metres, uh, widening beyond the, to 3.6, 3.5 metres here, and then wider beyond uh, here and showing the boundary treatments. And I'll come on to this in slightly more detail as we move through. Just wanted to show some photographs then of that of that access. So this is the access that was was approved previously. Um, so this is it at its most eastern end, looking into the site. So there's currently an access gate into into the land uh, um, associated where the dwelling is going to go into this rear garden of uh, 27 4th Street, which is an existing access. There's a, another gate here which provides existing access in, into the paddock. Then we have here, so this photograph is stood at, at sort of the western end of the track, so effectively at the bottom end of Hamrod Lane. So there's existing access into one of the neighbouring properties here. And then this is the track which spurs off at a 90 degree angle off the bottom of Hamrod Lane. Um, and uh, it's a straight track leading up to uh, the access as shown in the upper photograph. Now it has boundary treatments um, on either side, so on the uh, northern side on the left, as you see on this photograph, this low uh, brick wall with panel uh, fencing above. On the uh, southern and right hand side, as you see here, is a um, hedgerow through a post and wire boundary. Now, the hedgerow encroaches into the width of the lane, as I'll, as I'll come on to. Um, uh, so the actual the actual boundary uh, it encroaches somewhat to an extent of about 
40 centimetres. Uh, the actual boundary is actually somewhat in here. The post and wire fencing is set back uh, within. The top photograph, again, just stood slightly further back from the west, uh, just uh, sort of long shot down the straight. The bottom photo has stood at the west, uh, but sort of turned the other way. So what you can see is uh, a couple of the private uh, accesses that lead off the lower part of Hamrod Lane, where that car is parked is where the, uh, the road sweeps around um, do, doing sort of the 90 degree turn as you come into the private drive that leads up through the track. And then just a couple of shots just showing uh, similar to the ones I've previously shown in the initial photograph section where at the, at the point where the bottom of Hamrod Lane meets the private drive, just showing that that bends there leading back up. Um, so you have about seven or seven or eight properties currently at, at the sort of that part of Hamrod Lane. Uh, there's about two with accesses currently down the lower part, um, and then the two proposed. Um. So, and again, this is just stood at the very eastern end of the track, just looking back down in a westerly direction to the car park at the bottom of Hamrod Lane, where the site entrance is. The lower photograph stood at the eastern end of uh, Hamrod Lane, uh, at the east end of the track, just showing the end of the boundary treatments. You can see the hedge was obviously very mature at this point, which is growing uh, and growing over into part of the site, um, into over part of the track. And the two accesses for the land associated with the proposal and the um, uh, and the paddock joining. So the difference in width of the track is the is is the is the, the way that this application differs from from what was previously um, uh, approved. There are no other highway related uh, amendments to the scheme. So whilst I appreciate there have been comments received through the application in, in regards to some some other factors, some of them including things like impact on the wider highway network. So there have been comments about the junction of Hamrod Lane and the A372. That in terms of capacity visibility the principle of two dwellings and their vehicular movements moving through that junction was considered that previous application was considered acceptable. So that's not what's being revisited here. We, what we really are just looking at is the access track itself as it spurs off the bottom. Now that access track spurs off the end of Hamrod Lane, I've stated at a right angle, and it's a track of about 35 metres in, in, in length. It leads, as I stated, to this paddock at the, at the back, and it's, it's a track that is straight for its length enclosed on both sides by the boundary treatments. It narrows towards its centre as I stated and as that plan showed, uh, it showed on that plan it was 3.1 before widening again. Now when the application came before members uh, previously um, and in response to concerns that were raised, members imposed condition on that permission requiring a detailed plan of the access to, to show the width along its, along its full length. Um, because of uh, there was a lack, there was considered to be a lack of detail on the plans as submitted. It didn't show any boundary treatments, the, the and um, uh, for example, and um, the so the submitted plan uh, that came in indicated a minimum width as shown of 3.1 meters. Uh, now indicating less width now than than the co committee uh, were in, indeed led to believe could be achieved. So when we got the detailed plan, it was of a narrow width than had been indicated uh, previously with the previous plans. So it was felt that that couldn't be discharged as a condition uh, on the previous permission. It was materially different and therefore needed to be brought back to members uh, for their consideration uh, if by committee and with the application that we have today. So the current application is to vary the details of the access as proposed. So the main, but in terms of how we look at it, we accept it is different. It is narrow than was uh, previously indicated the question is is it acceptable for two dwellings to be served off a private drive of this width uh, that's that's a consideration is it safe in terms of highway safety that's the main that's when we're looking at highway related issues the question is is, is it safe and that's what highways as highway officers would, would be considering now the highway authority only provided standing advice on this application as is fairly standard for schemes of, of this sort of a minor size um, so this when you apply the standing advice document that states that any access for a single dwelling should have an access of at least three metres in width. So three metres is that sort of, is that, uh, lower end, uh, which is acceptable. Um, now it states for two dwellings, there should be adequate width to pass uh, and that should be provided. So it recommends a minimum width of five metres 
for a distance of six meters. So that's ideally, that's, so that's that's an amount that would provide for a passing space. So that if two two vehicles met on a private drive of that length, there would be place for one to pull in uh, to enable the other to go by. Now, as you've seen from the plans, the proposal doesn't have that level of width um, uh, as recommended, uh, uh, the, the standing advice recommends, and therefore it does not comply with standing advice, the standing advice document that we are advised to refer to. Now, where schemes do not comply, standing advice document advises it may be necessary to refuse planning permission, you know, because schemes may inherently deliver an unsafe form of development uh, that should not be approved. But the document does advise that the advice of highway officers is always sought in such a scenario um, before such a decision is made. So this site was visited subsequent to this application coming in uh, and the width along the length was measured by the case officer. I was aware of the sensitivity of the application previously, um, wanted to go out and verify um, measurements myself. Uh, some of the comments that came in from members of the public said it should be checked and took that on board, went out uh, and measured, took those measurements myself. Now, at its narrowest, I measured it to be uh, uh, three metres. I measured it boundary to boundary rather than 3.1. I mean, the difference is probably de minimis when you get when you're talking of plans at the scale at this uh, at this kind of scale. Uh, you know, when you want to, you know, uh, when you're looking down at sort of block plans that get one five hundred, one to two hundred, for example. So that's that ten centimetres variation there, uh, but would be considered to generally de minimis. Uh, noted that, as I stated, the hedge grows through that seven boundary treatment, but the applicant has confirmed that they have the right to cut it back. So they would be able to cut it back um, to the face of the boundary treatment, which is the post and wire fence, which is what I measured between. So I think for the purpose of considering the application, you should assume that the, the width of the three metres can be achieved. I know the plan state 3.1, but uh, based on my measurements, I consider that with the three can, can definitely be achieved, and that should be how we should focus our thinking uh, when deciding how to determine the application. Now, after I went out to the um, uh, do my site visit, I noted that the scheme did not comply with standing advice, having undertaken those measurements and compared it with the standing advice document. And they sought the, the views of the highway authority uh, in detail on this scheme. Now, the highway authority were advised of measured widths, uh, uh, um, the alignment of the access track, my observations about vehicle speeds uh, uh, along the lane, the number of properties that Hamrod Lane serves, the nature of the road layout, the fact that the road uh, the the road bends toward uh, at, at the end where the connection to the, uh, the private access track happens. Now, uh, photographs were also provided to the Highway Authority as part of that, um, that request for advice. Now, based on that information, received a response in writing from the Highway Authority, um, um, and they confirmed that even though it did not comply with standing advice, they did not consider that an objection was sustainable. They considered it it did not meet standing advice, and they acknowledged that uh, as it was below the recommended widths for uh, for two dwellings, but they felt a departure was acceptable as the access did not appear to be unsafe. So, and that's that was our main consideration in bringing uh, the uh, recommendation forward today. We note that actually it is marginally narrower, but it is narrower than members who were previously indicated. I, my understanding was that indications of about 3.5 metres was the width that members were previously informed of. And obviously what we're talking about now is uh, about, uh, about uh, is three metres at its, at its minimum. I note the plan state 3.1. But ultimately, when we sought the advice of the highway authority, they don't feel that it's an unsafe access. Um, uh, and so they would not support. Uh, they they did not object to um, to the to the application, even when the detailed uh, plans were given. So they don't feel it's unsafe, um, and therefore we don't consider a reason for refusal, even though it it differs, and we accept that it differs from uh, the scheme as previously uh, uh, approved. There would be a condition, so a new uh, a new condition imposed on the permission to secure a minimum width for the access of three meters at all times. Uh, if granted by members, but the recommendation today is that permission should be uh, granted. As it's a variation of condition, uh, all other conditions from the original permission uh, will need to be rolled forward or amended as appropriate, and the table on page 99 of the report sets out the position for each of those. But the recommended recommendation today is to grant permission. Thank you.
Thank you very much. As you'll see, we've got a, 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 a number of speakers on this one. So we'll start with the first one, which is Terry McCretton. If you could um, turn on your microphone and just confirm that it's working for us, please. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. So mm -hmm. again, just to remind you, you've got the three minutes. Start when you're ready and you'll hear the bell when it is a minute to go. Right. Thank you. I'm Terry McCretton, live in Five Ham Rod Lane. I've been a resident for 42 years. The residents, particularly those adjacent to the track in question, have used it to maintain hedges, walls, fences, and to connect to the public footpath along the side of number five Hanrod Lane to get to the village. Those cottages are centuries old, and folk then and now use the track to get to the village and church. It has been in common usage for a long time. The land registry has no knowledge of ownership. It is in effect common land until the ownership and the residents' rights of access are resolved and approved, this should be rejected. In the initial application, the planning officer stated, and he said so today, that it would become a private drive. If this were so, then the common historic rights would be lost. These must be safeguarded. In presentations, number one, these comments do not appear in the application documents and in the comments which had to be sent in by a deadline date. When were they submitted, I wonder? As to the stone foundation, there is no foundation to this access track. As suggested, it was rubble put down by a farmer 35 years ago when the track became rutted and muddy. Vehicles that have had access, very few over the years, and some even refuse to use the access. Highways comments. The track doesn't meet the required standard. The suggestion that vehicles could reverse if they so met into the lane is not practicable. Shared drives lead to disputes. Why do we have a standard if it can be easily set aside? As regards fire, waste, vehicles and heavy goods, they won't use it. Some of the drivers that we have have said so. I haven't seen such a narrow entrance to any site in the village. Were fire waste consulted? Did fire and waste actually visit the site to satisfy themselves? Flooding, it does happen. Wessex Water says it doesn't. We provided photographs. West, the, where the residents were there, Wessex Water wasn't. Bullet points in the officer's report don't fully convey the living experience of residents. We have living experience of traffic and common rights of usage. We hope members will turn down this non-standard and impractical proposal. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Alan Herford, who I believe is speaking on behalf of the uh, Parish Council. Mr Herford, could you just confirm your microphone's working? If so, we're not hearing you at the moment. Is Mr Herford present? I am. Ah, we can hear you now. That's excellent. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so uh, just to remind you, Alan, uh, Mr Herford, you've got um, three minutes to address the committee and you'll hear the bell when there's a minute to go. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, members, uh, page 94 of your report sets out the details of the objection, uh, effectively repeating uh, what we submitted for the original application. So don't intend to repeat those other than to highlight the specific issue of the width of the grassed green lane and the references we submitted, which suggest should not have been accepted. We've heard that it doesn't comply with the standards, and we have uh, put forward some other points, which I hope have been checked. Can I ask, have the references we submitted to the Parish Council been checked? These raise a real safety issue, uh, particularly in fire terms, not least for emergency vehicles. I think the whole saga of the requirement for a fresh application now before you is all the illustration you need that the relevant condition could not be complied with and an acceptable width of the track could not be achieved to serve two properties. 
We've also heard of the additional use of this uh, lane, which the ownership is unknown. We remain convinced a site visit would have led to a different decision originally, and the plans should now be referred and refused on that basis. The width that can be achieved is totally unacceptable. Thank you. Thank you very much. And our final speaker on this application is uh, Paul Lillicrop. Uh, Mr Lillicrop, if you could just confirm that your microphone is working. As yet, we're not hearing you. Can you try and un unmute your microphone? Chairman, Hello. I'm not sure. Oh. Ah. Hello. There go. Yes. Is that Mr Lillicrop? It is, yes. Thank ah, you. Terrific. Um, again, just reminding you, you've got three minutes and you'll hear the bell when there's one to go. Please start okay. when you're ready. OK, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. At the original committee meeting, I stated that the access would have a width of 3.5 metres. I would like to explain uh, that statement. When I measured the access, I took a measurement from the wall uh, one side of, uh, of the track to the fence at the other side at two points, one at the gate post at the entrance of Box Tree Cottage around seven metres along the track and the other at the end of the boundary fence with Box Tree Cottage where the access widens out into the site. I measured both of these at 3.5 metres. I had not realised that the fence bowed toward the wall in the middle to 3.1 metres. I am totally responsible for this oversight and a lesson learnt on my part. I wish to apologise to members for this and assure you that at no point was I trying to misrepresent the situation. I take my professional integrity very seriously. County Highways have carried out a detailed assessment and have concluded that the access is acceptable and safe. I'd like to give some context to the width of this access proposed. For a housing estate collector road, you see from the like of Persimmon Homes, county highways require a carriageway width of 2.75 metres for each lane. This lane width is deemed acceptable for up to 400 houses. A width of 2.75 is acceptable for up to 400 houses. This proposed access for these two dwellings will be wider than this at a minimum of three metres at its narrowest point and will only be around 35 metres long. The access is straight and comes off the end of a cul-de-sac with very low traffic flows. I trust that members will give due consideration to the fact that the proposed access is acceptable and safe for two houses and concur with the detailed assessment of officers and county highways. Thank you. Thank you very much. But before I come to members, I'll just come back to officers for, because uh, obviously a number of issues are raised by our speakers. I'll come to Mr. D Titchener on a number of the issues that were raised, but also uh, Mrs. Lehman, an issue was raised about common access rights and ownership. Uh, and I wonder if, if you'd like to start off with just clarifying the position in terms of access rights and ownership, and then I'll come to Mr. Titchener to just pick up on any other issues that were raised by speakers. Mrs. Lehman. Thank you, Chairman. Um, in terms of access rights, um, <laughs> Access, um, sorry, land ownership is not a matter for planning. So when we consider a planning application, we never consider land ownership. Um, in terms of the comment that the access was in common ownership and there was it was not registered at land registry, that says to me that if it's not registered land, it will be unregistered land. So it will be owned by somebody. So um, the, the only issue is it would be up to the owner of the land if they didn't want, if it was a private driveway um, and owned um, and is unregistered land owned by a, an individual, he will have the right then to to say who and who cannot use that land. There are other issues in highways, such as prescriptive rights, long user rights, where people can apply for the land to be used as a highway over a 20 year period. But um, if, if the land was, um, if, if prescription rights was not applied for, I, I, and I don't want to muddy the water, I'm just giving an overview of um, what rights are associated with um, an unregistered highway. 
um, if prescriptive rights are not applied for under the, um, um, in line with the legislation under the Highways Act, then it will be a matter of probably trespass or matter of the landowner granting an easement for use of the highway. But in terms of the planning application itself, um, land ownership is not a matter for planning. So this is not a material consideration. It is a civil issue. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. If I come to them, Mr. Titchener, I think Mr. Noon wants to come in after that, and then I'll come to Councillor Perry, who's the first one to indicate. So, uh, Mr. Titchener. Yeah, just to pick up on a couple of points. First one is sort of related to that anyway. I think there is, I think sometimes the terminology of, uh, of words and phrases that we use might have contributed to some of the concern as well, because the use of the term private drive, it, 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 I think is being interpreted in a way that means it's private, there's no access there, but actually private in this sense means not part of the public highway. So all we mean when we say it's a going to be, it, it will be a private drive, it, it's not part of the public highway. It makes no affirmation about um, rights of access to that, you know, any rights that people might have to maintain boundaries, for instance, it's just to say it's not part of the public highway. So, it, so that's the terminolo terminology we use. Um, just some other points that were made about um, uh, consultations that were undertaken um, th throughout the scheme. Um, uh, so, for example, a consultation was undertaken with the fire service, but no response was received from them. Um, uh, county uh, the way services aren't consulted on schemes of this size, but it's but it's off a private drive anyway. So the 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 the, the bin lorries were only accessed a bit to the public highway anyway. Uh, so they wouldn't have comments to make about anything that's off a off a private drive. Um, so um, Wessex Water uh, comments were received um, um, in the public consultation about consulting Wessex Water. They were consulted. They raised no objection about about the proposals. Um, Building control were consulted when we did the previous application about some of the the, um, the access for appliances that, that and some of those comments were made again this time around. Um, and as stated in the previous report, building control stated that um, it's not necessary to to have a whip to get an appliance up to every property. Now, in, it, obviously, it is in some, but they there are they are means by which they will ensure that there is adequate protection if you can't get a, um, a pump within a certain distance of a property. Now that's usually in the form of you can install a hydrant on, on a site, you can install sprinklers within their properties, um, but that's essentially assessed under, under uh, build control, but they raised no concern that they felt that that could, could be, um, uh, that that could be uh, achieved. Um, I just note some comments were stated about the access track being rubble. I mean, it's proposed on the plans that it's um, that it's it would be um, maintained as I think the per the query about that was about sort of flood risk. It's going to be a permeable surface that, that's proposed through there, so it, it, there's no no increase in, in flood risk. Ultimately, the application and the dwellings will be subject to surface water drainage considerations under the building control. Anyway, just want to see if the my notes whether I've missed out anything that was raised. Um, uh, the the uh, uh, Paris Clark Alan Herford raised some comments about um, comments that have been raised uh, in their um, um, in their consultation response, um, which were about um, uh, which are about uh, referencing some of the highway issues in terms of um, widths that manual for streets um, would 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 specify. Um, uh, now. So manual for streets is a document that the highway authority will have uh, will have. Um, uh, we'll, we'll use to inform their thinking. I mean, ultimately, on this application, uh, we sought the detailed response of the Highway Authority, giving them the detailed, uh, you know, dimensions, um, the, uh, or the detailed widths of the proposal, um, the uh, our, our observations about the, the, the number of properties served of Hamrod Lane, the low vehicle speeds. It, it, it is a, you're not going to be driving. No one's observed driving very fast along Hamrod Lane. It is ultimately no through road. The bend will slow people at the bottom. It's only accessing limited number of properties. So highways gave us their detailed comments based on the specifics of, of the case to inform uh, in, inform their response. Um, you know they will refer to manual streets if it's necessary. But obviously we've got the detailed comments of them here. I don't think. I think. I hope I've covered anything. Please let me know if I haven't. Thank you very much. And Mr Noon? Yeah, I just wanted, I mean, I think Dean has covered off what, most of what I was going to say. I just wanted to underline that the issues of the ownership of the access track 
would be resolved through other channels. It doesn't affect the planning merits as long as the applicant has filled in the correct ownership forms, which certainly last time they were in the realms of certificate C or D, um, which you know, effectively requires them to sort of advertise and make all reasonable efforts to identify the ownership. It is a problem for them down the line, potentially, if someone emerges, it will just be one of those other things that they need to sort out to implement their permission. It's at their risk, um, but it is not a matter of the planning uh, that affects the planning considerations as long as they have procedurally approached the problem correctly, which they have done. And then the other ones, as, as Dean said, the building control will look at the accessibility for the fire brigade. And as we had on the previous application, private accesses, the bins tend to get picked up from the bottom end. It's not a fundamental problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. And to Councillor Perry. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, um, this is where I scratch my head on this because if uh, if there's a query on who owns the actual access track, and then we just say, well, it doesn't matter. We'll, we'll have to. It'll have to be worked out in the future. Surely, um, if you've got a property in the middle of a field somewhere and you've got no access to it, uh, but you expect to be driving across it on somebody else's land. Who you don't know of, uh, surely we shouldn't be sort of, um, they should be looking into that first before they even think about putting a, a development up in the first place. Um, is that not how we should do things? Thank you. Mr Noon. I think Mr Noon, you might be on mute. Apolog apologies. Um, it, it, it would be nice if that's how it, uh, how everyone approached it. Unfortunately, there are some times where, despite the best endeavours of the applicant, they can't unearth who owns a piece of land that is key to unlocking the development potential of their site. Quite often, that can be quite expensive to do. Um, so I think they, they the the various ownership forms at the back of the planning application form, certificates A, B, C, and D. C and D give you the option to carry out best endeavours to a reasonable point to the point where you are then allowed to make a planning application and that's what they've done down the line who knows a problem may pop up but in terms of the planning merits who owns that access doesn't affect whether or not this development is acceptable it will have to be resolved a place these houses probably be very difficult to sell if they haven't bottomed that out and there's a risk that someone might turn up and, and ransom someone um, but that is a risk on the developer's behalf, which we, no matter how unhappy we feel about it, it is something that is allowed to do under the provisions of the Planning Act and the ownership certificates, which they have correctly filled in. Um, it is, has, I do have to stress, it is at their risk. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Perry? Yes, well, I suppose that's what we'll have to live with, I suppose, uh, or they do as well. Uh, yeah, OK, thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from members, please? Councillor Bolt. Yeah, thank you. The chat room seems to have failed on us. Um, very quickly, Mr. McCredden has, has actually raised um, uh, something which I, uh, I, I'm not, I, I can't find in, in the paperwork that this has been used as a right away. Is it actually a right away? Mr. Titchener. Uh, so it's it's not a public right of, it's not in, in terms of what we understand as a public right of way. So like what we might understand as a public footpath, it's not a public footpath, no. Um, and just any other rights issue are as referred to by our legal officer in terms of those issues that sit outside the planning system. Councillor Bolt. Yeah, OK, uh, uh, thank you. Any other comments or questions? Yes, Councillor Bradford. Thank you, Mr Chairman, for that. Um, I would have thought you'd have got to put the two heads together very surely. That's the only way out of this one, because of them houses, if there's no access, a sens sensible sort of an access, then that the value of those houses will be very much diminished. Now, I'm surely um, I don't know whether people get on or not or whether they don't. I, I really don't know. So 
So really, a little bit of common sense. You've got to be. I don't know. They could be talking about this for the next five years. You know, they've really got to approach it head on. I think and get get a mediator working between them. You know, because uh, the houses have been built. So there's obviously nobody's happy with the access. Not wider. But having said that, having said that, if this was persimmon for one of the larger developers, then maybe it might be acceptable. So uh, it's a head scratcher. It really is. Well done, Liz. You've got a good sense of humour. Just to um, just again, to, just to clarify for members, it, it is it is eminently possible that we can potentially grant planning permission for something that ultimately then physically could not be built without further agreements being made. That, as has been explained by Mr. Noon and, and by Mrs. Lehman, ultimately that risk sits with the developer and it is for them to decide whether they uh, whether they are prepared to take that that risk that might come back at a later stage. So I think it is, as I say, we need to look at the planning merits of it. The legal aspect of, of access and ownership uh, ultimately will, will have to be resolved by the, the applicant and, and other landowners. Uh, I've got a number of councillors, I think, coming in at the moment. I've got Councillor Scott next. So if we go to Councillor Scott. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, it does look a bit of a tricky case here because of the land ownership. But as is said, um, this has happened before and we can only judge it on its planning mer merits. I was a little concerned about the, um, you know, the fire engine access and having looked online, um, the requirement is 3.7 metres for access. but as explained, that's out of our control as well with the building control. So I assume that will be sorted at a later date. So um, I think we do have our hands tied a little here with regard to the access. It's it's up to the owner, obviously, to um, ensure that they have got a proper access there in the future. Thank you. Thank you. I've got a number of councillors who've now indicated I've got councillors Kingham, Revens, Grimes and Pierce. So if we start with Councillor Kingham. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I mean, this is a, it's a tricky application. Obviously, the houses we've basically, we've more or less said they're OK. The access is the problem. And most people are saying it's not the right access, it's not wide enough, etc. But on the other hand, if the houses are built, they will want a decent access to those properties. And in some ways, it will maintain that access to a, a better standard than probably what it is at the moment. We're not going to build two detached houses and have a, a grass track to them. Um, after construction, they will want to be reinstated if it's that bad. And I'm sure they're not going to leave it as a rough old track for two detached houses. So one tip, one way, this track will be maintained and I'm sure the ownership will be sorted out in the meantime. So I don't have too much of a problem with this at the moment. Thank you. Councillor Revens. Uh, thank you very much. First of all, can I just just clarify that there are there are, there is no development taking place. Uh, it was mentioned earlier that the houses were in existence. I just that wasn't my understanding. No, Mr. Titchener, would you like to confirm the situation on that? Uh, yes, that's correct. No, no development has yet taken place on this site. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Just, uh, yeah, I just just wanted to be clear on that point. My my recollection when this came to us before as an application was that we had one very serious concern which, which was that this application went against the standing advice of the highways authority on on the private drive and there is very very it's, it's very very clear what their, their standing advice is and we've looked at it now they seem to be backtracking on what their standing advice is it makes it very hard for us ever to to look at a um, application where we got highways concerns on, we go to the standing advice, and apparently the standing advice is is flexible. Um, my my feeling on this is this this access is too narrow for one for two houses. It is acceptable for one. There is no way that I would have supported this as an application for two houses. I would support this as an access for one. And so on, you know, on 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 that grounds, I I, I cannot support. The officer's recommendation on this. Thank you, Councillor Grimes. How difficult is this? <laughs> um, I think at the end of the day, as has been said, the onus is on the developer. The access does seem as though it is acceptable, um, although it's not ideal. 
Um, I think we've had a good um, discussion on this. Um, and at this point, I'm going to move the recommendation. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Um, I wonder if I might come back to either Mr. Titchener or, or Mr. Noon. In, in terms of standing advice, um, as I understand it, in effect, standing advice is the is the basic advice that's given to all the planning officers so that they can look at stuff without highways having to specifically comment on every application. But as I understand it, in this application, we've gone back to highways to say, could they could they look at it specifically? Could you just clarify what that position? I think Adrian Count, Count, Mr. Noon is indicating. Do you want to come back? Yes, if, if I could, thank you. Um, the standing advice, as you say, is is given to us, and we apply it to all, all essentially all householder stuff and minor minor applications. The standing advice actually includes the advice that we should contact them before refusing something on the basis of standing advice, because it being the county standing advice, they will would be having to defend it at appeal. So they want to make sure that the material circumstances of, it, of the application are such that the standing advice is sound. And, you know, the standing advice is such that, you know, it's it's minimum minimum whips. Now that doesn't mean we're going to sort of, you know, look to be refuse things because there are a couple of centimeters under minimum whips. So that we will look at each on their own merits, and that's what we've done here. Um, to verify that the standing advice conclusion is applicable to this site. It doesn't mean that, you know, if this site were going straight onto the, an A road, it would be accepted. I very much doubt it would if it was going straight onto an A road. But here the issue is what happens if what resident is leaving house one as someone is returning to house two? And what happens because clearly they can't pass here. So one would have to reverse up. Well, OK, if that if they see each other whilst the guy's coming out of house one, they'll just back. He'll just back up into his drive at that end with no implication on Hamrod Lane. So the issue here is if someone's already part way down the lane towards Hamrod Lane and someone swings in. It's that reversing manoeuvre that the five foot width over the first six metres is supposed to avoid the highways harm of reversing out onto the public highway. Now, clearly on a busy main road, that would be a problem. In this instance, what we have to judge is here is would someone reversing the, the you know, maybe 10 meters or so back down the lane, the track rather onto Hamrod Lane to allow someone that's already over halfway down the track to pass? Would that maneuver be so unsafe as to constitute a severe impact on highway safety at this bottom end of Hamrod Lane. Now, previously, we concluded that although the site, the access was narrow, yeah, you know, and clearly no one could pass in it at 3.5 metres, that that manoeuvre was always going to occur under the previous approval. It was the issue. What there was, the applicant had promised us a width of three and a half metres, and to be fair. We held their toes to that. And for whatever reason, you know, the, the exact science of measuring a width along a, a sort of length here where there is a hedge bowing out over a curved fence line, it's not an exact science. They've held their hands up and they brought it back to us to say, OK, it's not three and a half, it's three metres. But the fundamental issue here of highway safety is that I think arises when someone backs out onto Hamrod Lane. That situation hasn't changed as a result of them holding their hands up and accepting that the track is narrower than we thought it was going to be. So really, I think that's where we've got to sort of you know, revisit that. We've previously concluded that reversing out onto Hamrod Lane, if it happened, would not be so un so bad as to constitute a severe impact on highway safety. That's the test here. And so we're re invited really just to sort of reconsider that point now. Um, and I think that, yeah, that going back to the county, asking them to sort of clarify that the standing advice in this instance was a perfectly reasonable thing to do. We do it frequently and very often what looks like a standing advice um, reason for refusal is turned round to a delegated approval because no one else has got a concern about it. It's only the technicality. 
So it's not unusual and it's pragmatic and it reflects the circumstances because the standing advice cannot cover every single circumstance. We're a rod of iron. We need to be pragmatic. And I, I, I feel that's what's happened here. I hope that helps. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to come back to Councillor Evans because I know he wanted to uh, to respond. And after that, I've then got Councillors Pierce, Kingham and Hendry. So Councillor Evans. Yeah, uh, two points, if I may. Uh, my understanding is the standard advice for a uh, two property access track is five metres and this uh, this track is three metres. I don't consider two metres to be a few centimetres. Um, I, I sort of disagree with Mr Noon on that point. And secondly, it would be really helpful if on these points where we are refusing something on highways grounds, um, we could, we had the highways officers here to to justify what they are saying. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Pierce. Thank you, Chairman. Um, the main thing really is being covered in the discussion about standards, but I have to say, having there been standards and this falls short of them, I feel really uncomfortable about um, supporting this. And when this originally came to us, I was um, concerned about lack of uh, difficulty of access for emergency vehicles. And having looked up the width of a fire engine, which is three metres, um, those concerns remain. And I, I take on board the comments about other means, but we don't know that at this point when we are uh, passing this or not, uh, because we don't have a response from the fire authority. So just to say, I, I'm not happy my concerns remain. Thank you, Councillor Kingham, then Hendry, then Grimes. Councillor Kingham. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, just going back to the previous application at Ranscombe House. Now that is served by a private road. And if I remember from the photograph, that wasn't particularly very wide. And we just um, granted permission for two properties there. Um, but on this one, we've got a similar application, two properties off a private drive. Um, and I would like to leave it down to a property developer to sort it out and I would um, second, second the application along with um, Councillor Grimes. Thank you. And Councillor Hendry. No, that's no problem. I was about to second it for Councillor Tony Grimes, but that's already been done, Chairman. Thank you. OK, Councillor Grimes. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, I, I'm quite happy with moving the recommendation, but I honestly do believe that these houses will not be built unless this is resolved by the developer. I can't think of anybody in the right mind that would actually build out these houses without this being resolved because the risk is colossal. And like has been said, who is going to buy a house if this is not resolved? So, but I stand by uh, moving the recommendation. Thank you. Okay, I've got Mr Noon and then Councillor Perry. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify what I said about the five metre width. The standing advice is that uh, you need a five metre width at the first for the length of the first six metres, not the whole length of the track. So it's basically so someone, you know, you've got room to pass without having to reverse onto the public highway when you're looking at a shared private access. So that was the situation. We were under five. We've always been under five metres here. The previous approval accepted that that was the case and accepted that there would be some reversing out onto Hamrod Lane. Um, this, it, this application is really just to deal with the fact that the access track in its middle part is not as wide as we were promised uh, first time round. So that really is the material consideration. Just to Councillor Pierce's point, just trying to give some clarity on the fire issue. Um, the slide we've got on there, there is a little annotation in the middle of the point of access off the bottom of Hamrod, Hamrod Lane, which actually says fire hydrant. So the applicant is sort of accepting and acknowledging that they're not going to get a fire engine on site, but building control will allow for alternative means of getting water to the site rather than taking it in a tender. In this instance, there would be a fire hydrant that the firemen can plug their hoses into and take to the um, another alternative might be a sprinkler system, but building control will be all over that. Thank you. Thank you. And Councillor Perry. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, no, well, not only have I got a problem with that, um, that particular narrowness of that, that track, but also what about the 
construction traffic. I mean, <laughs> some of those are quite big vehicles that will have to use that track uh, and whether they're going to be able to negotiate and turn around when they have to um, down Hanrod Lane or wherever they end up at the end to unload their their loads. So um, I don't know whether anybody's thought of thought of that. I don't know, Mr. Titchener, do you want to comment on that? Uh, yeah, so I mean, there is one of the conditions uh, that's attached to the permission is a construction management plan, um, uh, which was submitted um, uh, as to discharge condition on the previous one, and that's details of that have been provided to um, uh, the Highway Authority and Environmental Health to, to get their their views on it. Um, so it proposes that any uh, construction uh, um, uh, vehicles that are entering the site will have space within the site to turn. Uh, so that they can exit the site in forward gear. Um, so um, I, I think it would be up to the individual vehicles and depending on the various sizes of those vehicles, whether they make that decision, actually, whether they're going to enter the site or not. Um, uh, I guess it, it depends on how big they feel those vehicles needed to be. Uh, obviously, for the smaller ones, that would be acceptable. For the, some of the large ones, they would, they would, I imagine they would not take that. But the provision is there for, for there is enough space in the site during the construction period. And obviously, the applicant I think, Mr. Titcher, I don't know whether you could repeat the last 30 seconds of what you said because it went completely Dalek. Uh, apologies, uh, right. seemed everything fine here. Uh, I did have connection troubles this morning. Uh, so, um, so the, one of the conditions on the previous permission was for submission of a construction management plan. Can you hear me okay? We can at the moment. Right, okay. So that was a condition. The details were submitted as part of a discharge condition and the Highway Authority and Environmental Health were consulted as they are on um, uh, documents of that nature. Now there's the su submitted construction management plan which highways have seen included provision for space within the site to enable turning of any any delivery vehicles um, so they could exit the site in forward gear and what i was sort of saying is that that will it, i think it will obviously it will depend on the nature of the vehicles of the size because obviously delivery vehicles will come in various sizes whether people would decide to go all the way into the site um, but the the document that is would be secured and it's attached to this permission as a condition has provision within it that any vehicles any delivery vehicles entering the site will turn around not all vehicles i imagine would decide to enter the site but those that do have to turn around and exit in forward gear thank, thank you thank you very much councillor bolt yeah sorry Th thank you very much um uh, i'm a bit concerned about the standing advice from from highways had we given them the original figures of three meters um uh, would that have affected their standing advice? Would that have affected our original decision on granting permission for um, uh, for the build of these two houses? Um, it, if it, or are they actually changing their um, or moving their goalposts because we're in this predicament now? Basically, just one thing to comment in terms of standing advice. In effect, what standing advice is is a, is a whole series of. Um, measurements to do with sort of visibility displays and all these sort of things that county give us standard things that our officers then have to compare to uh, the application in front of them so that there isn't involvement of, a, of a, an officer at county at that point what's happened in this case is we've obviously gone beyond that and gone back to the, uh, the highways officers for them to look at it as an individual application so standing advice isn't them actually giving us advice it's the fact that they've given us a rule book to go and have a look at in most cases and if there's an issue with that, then we take it to the officers themselves. I think I saw Mrs. De Vries uh, put her hand up at that point, so I don't know whether you wish to come in. Yeah, apologies. It, it was just clarification, as you've um, lined it out, Councillor Filmer, in that standing advice, highways very much um, like us, they do try and triage the applications they need to comment on. So if it's a relatively um, small, low key development, they will refer us back to standing advice. We cross check standing advice. If it complies, it's a straightforward tick off. If it doesn't comply and we we have viewed it and, and we would like further detailed comments, that's the point we go back to them and say, technically, there's a conflict with standing advice. 
can you have a look at it? Is there a highway safety implication because of the conflict? So the advice we've had back on this one is no, there isn't. Um, but that's the crux of the debate, I think, um, that members have been sort of pushing around. Standing advice and its conflict with standing advice doesn't mean automatically it's unacceptable. It means it lo means looking at a little bit more. Um, and the advice we had from County Highways on this one is that it isn't unacceptable from a highway safety perspective. Um, and that's the key issue that's before members for consideration. Thank you. Councillor Bolt. Yeah, I'm still. <laughs> when do we go for this advice before or after the application was granted for the two houses? Uh, Mr. Titchener or Mrs. Debris or Mr. Noon? Uh, I sorry, uh, I wouldn't know off the top of my head the um, the the order of 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 events on the original application. It was certainly on this application that having been presented with an application, second application, which we knew was going to be difficult um, because of you know, having not been able to achieve the width of the, the access that we were told we were going to get. We have been very anxious to ensure that the highways officer looks at this scheme very carefully. The, you know, the failure to meet the minimum width of the access you know, down through the track in part um, this is all, you know, it's, it's very close to three meters in, in certain places. is 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 regrettable. That that is, however, the, essentially, you know, the um, the, the is the issue on this application. The bit at the western end of the access track, that's unchanged because that's sort of essentially where the adjoining property comes out onto the bottom of Hamrod Lane. That is the bit that we've particularly asked them to look at, um, as well as the issue of the width of the track, because the lack of five metres width in that western end of the track means that anyone that meets in that part will have to back out. And we have specifically asked for their comments on that highway safety issue. Um, I don't, I'm not sure there is another highway safety issue here. Um, the track is wide enough, as the agent pointed out, it's wider than 2.7, which is the width of a track running through a modern estate development where the car has to stay between the middle of the road and the curb. So I don't see that there's any harm in the width of the track along the majority of its length. The harm issue, I think, is at the western end and the fact that there isn't room to pass and someone might have to reverse out into Hamrod Lane. If we feel that is so unsafe upon this second review of the application, uh, firstly, we'd have to say what has changed since the last time, because previously we said that was OK. Um, and we would need to sort of bear in mind that that saying that you know, coming to concluding that that is unsafe to the point of refusal is at odds with the advice we've had from the County Highway Authority. So I'm not sort of trying to push people around here. I'm just trying to sort of take us to what is the key issue and just sort of try to help you to by identifying that to focus on where the highway safety issue is. If there's another highway safety issue somewhere that hasn't come out in debate, then probably we need to just tease that out. Thank you. So are we saying that the three metres, um, which is under, uh, uh, this is my understanding of the conversation, the the fact that it's under their, their minimum width, that bears no relation at all to this application? No, I don't think it, 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 that's, a, that's the problem here because the, uh, the three metre pinch point is in the middle of the access track here. Um, and it, there, uh, we're putting it at three metres, the applicant's putting it at 3.1. It's not substandard as far as the highway authority is concerned. The highway authority's issue here is that at the entrance to a private drive from private drive from, from the public highway, so that's this point, down down at the western end at that point it should be five meters wide for the first six meters to allow people to pass and to avoid anyone reversing onto the public highway that's where this one to my mind is deficient that's the bit we've asked highways officers to specifically comment on and given the the, the likely volumes of traffic only two houses given the nature of hamrod lane a no through cul-de-sac and we're right at the very bottom of it so there's no traffic going on down the lane it's just at the bottom. 
Um, highways advice is that anyone reversing out here would not be unsafe to the point of a severe highways impact. And their suggestion is that it, a refusal couldn't be warranted on that reason. So it's just that Western end I think we're looking at. Mrs. DeBruze. Thank you. Um, I think I can understand where Councillor Bolt is coming from in terms of the concerns because it is it is below whatever the standing advice is. But the, because it conflicts with the standing advice, that's why the advice from the highway officer has been sought. And it's all the site circumstance considerations that um, Adrian Snoon set, set out in terms of why it's been considered and why it's been considered acceptable from a highway safety perspective. So because it's three metres, it's not that the standing advice um, doesn't count or we're not applying it. It's that we've applied it, we've looked at it, we've then forwarded it to the highway team for further advice. They've looked at it, they've looked at the site circumstances and the particular considerations for the access for this site, the size of the access, the number of dwellings it's serving, and they've determined that from a highway safety perspective, whilst it's below their standards, it is acceptable from a highway safety perspective. So that's where the recommendation is before members. Thank you. And I think I, the last member I've got who's indicated is Councillor Gibson. Hello, yeah. Oh, that was a long one. Um, right, two questions. One is, can we put a condition on these houses that the house owners only use bicycles? Um, that would be good. That would solve all that problem of the, the cars stuff, I think. Um, and there's a hydrant for the water in case any of these unfortunately catch fire. And my other question was, when we, um, we went on that bus trip, um, to look at things that had been built. It wasn't last year, probably the end of the year before. Uh, we went to Burnham, the end of Burnham towards Breen, and there was this narrow lane that we went down to get to these nice new houses that had really lovely um, stone and shiny. You know, they were just nice. And um, that lane was pretty narrow. What, what, what was the width of that one? Does anybody know? Has anyone got any idea? Because that just seemed quite narrow to me. Maybe not three metres, maybe it was just over. But um, yeah, that was, that's just to my two questions, uh, just to just to keep me awake. <laughs> really. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Titchener, do you want to comment on whether we can condition bicycle only use? Um, I, I mean, as an ardent cyclist, I'd I'd welcome that, but it's, I'm not sure we would. Um, uh, it would meet the tests of um, uh, enforceability or uh, be appropriate. I mean, obviously, what we're trying to secure is that that people have can, can, people are allowed to make their own choices about the transport use as as they do, and part of that is trying to locate stuff within settlement limits near where services and facilities are, so they can walk to some services and facilities. This is within the settlement limit, so it has those options. But no, we wouldn't be able to condition that people use bicycles, uh, bicycles only. Obviously, the second question was about another scheme that unfortunately I'm not familiar with, so I'm not able to comment on any of the details of that. I'm afraid. No, I must admit I was on the study tour, but I, I couldn't tell you what the width of of that lane was. Um, I don't I don't think we would have that information to hand. I'm sorry, Councillor Gibson. Um, members, I think we've we've had a good debate on this one. I'm going to come to members. We've had a resolution proposed and seconded to grant permission. Um, all I would say to, to members is obviously if, you, if you're minded to to refuse on the on the width of the road, then then we would need to be able to justify why we are going against the, the recommendation of the of the highways officer who has obviously looked at the detail of this particular application so uh, I'll come to to members in turn again if you can confirm you've been here for the entire debate and uh, presentation and whether you are for against or abstaining on the proposal that was moved I think by Councillor Grimes seconded by Councillor Kingham in terms of, of granting permission uh, we'll start this time with Councillor Grimes thank you chairman yes I've seen and heard the whole presentation I'm for Thank you, Councillor Perry. Yes, thank you. I've, I've seen and heard all the presentation. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm against. Thank you, Councillor Bolt. I've seen and heard the whole presentation and I'm against. Councillor Bradford. I've seen and heard the whole presentation and I'm for. Councillor Kingham. Yes, I've seen and heard the whole presentation and I'm for. Mm -hmm. Councillor Revens. 
I've seen and heard the whole presentation. I'm against. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. Um, I've seen and heard the whole presentation and I'm against. <clears throat> Thank you, Councillor Facey. Thank you, Chairman. I've seen and heard the debate, Chairman, and I'm for. Thank you, Councillor Hendry. I have seen and heard everything, Mr Chairman, and I am for. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Scott. I've um, seen and heard the whole debate, um, but I'm against. Thank you. Councillor Gibson. Um, yeah, I've seen and heard the whole, and I don't know. I'm sorry. Um, I'm, I abstain. Thank you. Councillor Pearce. Yep, I've seen and heard the whole debate and I'm against. Thank you, Councillor Glassford. I've seen and heard the whole debate and I'm for. Thank you, and I've seen and heard the whole debate and I'm also for. I think Mrs Nicholson, is that all members who are present? Thank you, Chairman. Um, we have got um, seven, four, six against, one abstention. And I can confirm that, Chairman. Thank you very much. So that is that is carried. So permission is is granted. Members, do members wish to take a short OK, I'm getting some signals that, yes, they do. <laughs> we'll take a short comfort break. Um, so we'll restart in, in five minutes. So we'll, uh, 4.25, we'll restart. Is it still Tuesday? <laughs> yes, but it's next week, Alex. Right, members, it's 20, 25 past, so we'll, we'll restart again. We'll just... Yeah, well, we'll come around just to confirm that members are present and uh, don't forget the meet. we are still part of the meeting and still being recorded. We still have uh, non-members of the committee present as well. So if we come around to the members, we'll start with Councillor Glassford. Are you present? Present, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Pearce? Yes, I'm here. Councillor Gibson? Is Councillor Gibson here? I'll come back to Councillor Gibson. Uh, so we next come to Councillor Scott. Is Councillor Scott present? Councillor Hendry? Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Mr Chairman? Yes, I can now, Councillor oh, okay, Hendrick. Yeah, yeah so, I can see and hear everything. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Facey. I can see and hear everything. Thank you, Chair. Excellent. <laughs> Councillor Murphy. Yes, I can see and hear everything, Chairman. Councillor Evans. Yep, I'm back. Councillor Kingham. Present. Councillor Bradford. I'm down the dark lane, but I can hear and see everything. Councillor Bolt. Here. Councillor Perry. Yes, I'm here. Councillor Grimes. Yes, here. Uh, and then I think we were just going to go back and check Councillor Gibson, whether you were present. Yeah, sorry. That's all right. No worries. And Councillor Scott. <clears throat> Is Councillor Scott with us? Not seeing. Councillor Scott at the moment looks like. No, it says Councillor Scott is present, so I don't know the Councillor I'm Scott. Whether you... Ah, okay, we couldn't I'm hear here. you. Sorry. That's okay, no problem. I think that's as well as myself. I'm here and can hear everybody. So I think, Mrs Nicholson, that's everybody who should be here, all 14 of the remaining committee members. Yes, Chairman. Thank you. So we'll move on to the next applications, which are in East Huntsville. Um, Members, you'll have realised that obviously these two applications refer to the same site. One is a listed building application. So as normal, we'll have one presentation for the two applications, but both will have to be voted on separately. 
So we'll um, we'll have the presentation next, and that's uh, Miss Parsons. Can you make the presentation, please? Thank you, Chairman. Um, can you see the yep. first screen? Thank you. Yes, thank you. So yes, this is um, a planning application as well as a list of building application. Um, the site uh, relates to the Secret World Animal Rescue Centre at New Road Farm, New Road. Um, the planning application is for the change of use and conversion of the barns to a residential dwelling. The reason the application is on committee today is because the applicant is a councillor. Now, um, planning consent already exists for the conversion of these barns to a dwelling and an annex, and this is an alternative scheme. The site is located along New Road um, between East Tunstable and West Tunstable, as you can see there, and east of the M5. The, um, the extent of the application site is outlined in red, if you can see on the plan. It comprises of a two-storey barn here with single-storey elements here and um, sort of um, rough land here. The New Road runs east-west runs up over the motorway bridge and there's a spur off off of that new road that leads to the site and this is an aerial of the site um, showing the barn in part, part of the application being this barn here together with these two single story barns which are attached and the extent of this area of land this is basically um, the existing layout showing the barns and the land to the east again. And this is the proposal. The proposal is to convert this barn to a dwelling together with these single storey barns here. This, this barn here would be covering a swimming pool. There would be a new vehicle access into the site, um, which is in the exact place that the consented scheme shows an access. This would provide an um, access parking and turning for vehicles. And if we have a look at some photographs of the site, this is the front of the site, the main building facing north, the two storey section. And then this is looking further along alongside that property, looking back at the same property. And then the same property that's the frontage with the end elevation, which is the western end. And then we've another one of the end. This is within the courtyard. Um, this is facing northwards. So this is this is one of the uh, single story sections that um, that you won't see from the road. The other side of this building will be seen from the road. This is again within the courtyard moving along the end of the two story section. And then again moving along looking westwards and this is the rear of the two-storey building where it includes a lean-to. This is the, uh, these are the existing floor plans uh, for the animal centre or part of the centre. Previously incorporated a food store, um, various rooms for treatments, fundraising room, orphan room, um, reception shop, and storage buildings here and they it, there was an upper floor leading to a food store and a filing room. Uh, the, the proposed drawings indicate one single dwelling, um, two bedrooms here, bathroom, lounge, sitting area, dining room, kitchen, leading to utility, WC, study, gym and then a pool area here. Upstairs, the staircase leads to an ensuite bedroom, and this is a gallery over the ground floor kitchen. These are the elevations of existing. So this is the front elevation, which you will see from the from the highway, and this is the rear with the single storey elements. These are the end elevations, and then the proposal. This is the front elevation, which incorporates two, three three new windows, two at that end and one here. And the rear elevation would incorporate number of roof lights um, and insertion of glazing systems within the, the lean-to and the single storey element. This is the end elevation. So in terms of principle of the proposal, consent has already been granted for the conversion of the the barns to a dwelling and an annex. 
that included the creation of an access into the site here for parking and a garden area. That's an extant consent, so that could still be developed. So this is an alternative scheme. It's considered the principle is acceptable. Um, in terms of the impact on the character of the area and the listed building, I've not referred to the listed building. The listed building is to the south of the site and because these buildings are within the curtilage historically, the listed building is here. Because these buildings are within the curtilage, we've always asked for a listed building consent for any alterations. Um, it's not considered that the alterations as proposed would have any adverse impact on the listed building, nor the character of the area or the street scene. Um, it's considered that the proposal would be converted sympathetically. In terms of impact on highway safety, the proposed access would be as shown on the um, extant consent. The, the highway authority have no objection to the proposal. The application includes conditions with regard to visibility and parking, and there is adequate parking for, for the dwelling proposed, so there's no concern in terms of highway safety. In terms of flood risk, the site is within flood zone 3, 3A. Um, this is a proposal for a conversion. So with regard to the sequential test, um, because of the specific locational requirement to convert the building, you couldn't convert this building anywhere else. So clearly it has to be here. Um, it's considered that the sequential test is passed. In terms of the exceptions test, the proposal includes a refuge at first floor level in the form of a second floor. It includes a flood warning and evacuation plan and the flood risk assessment states that the development would be carried out incorporating flood resilient measures. Therefore, it's considered that the development would not give rise to undue flood risk. And to conclude, Chairman, the recommendation is to grant consent. Thank you. And with regard to the list of building application, um, the recommendation is to grant consent as per the report. Thank you very much. Members, any comments or questions, please? Uh, Councillor Bolt. Yeah, I, I think it's um, a good use. Um, it, it's a nice looking conversion and, and I'd move the officer's recommendation. I'd, I'd, I, I don't think I can move both recommendations at the same time, so just the first one. So that's that's the recommendation that's on page 73, which is the, the main application. That's correct. Thank you very much. Uh, I've got Councillor Kingham, I think, next. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I mean, so it's um, a nice use of the existing barns. The uh, conversion looks looks of a good standard, and I think they've um, planned it well. And I'd like to move the recommendation. I'll second it, I should say. I was going to say you were beaten to that one. Yeah, uh, I know. I've got Councillor Gibson next then, please. Um, yeah, I don't know how relevant these questions are because, um, I mean, I support Secret World here, uh, uh, Secret World as an organisation. Um, is where, I mean, it's taken a lot from the actual organisation, like with the, the building that's what it's used for at the moment from the sanctuary is that any you know is that going to be reinstated anywhere or um you know what what's happening with the this this feels like a like it's been all turned into a house or something that you know i, I i'm a bit concerned about that because i support the organization miss parsons do you have any uh, information yes on the Yes, thank you, Chairman. Quite a number of applications have been submitted over the years on this site. And um, when I dealt with the planning application initially to convert this property into a dwelling and an annex, it was partly partly done with the idea that if they could do that, then they could provide better facilities for Secret World, um, which is not entirely part of the decision process for converting this barn. However, um, that's they then went on to submit a planning application for um, a new building here, which has been approved by my colleague. And so it, it in effect allowed them to actually improve their facility and provide be better facilities for the Secret World um, Animal Centre. So this, this development, it's already been granted anyway for a dwelling, but 
the approval of this development is not going to take anything away from their business. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bradford. Is Councillor Bradford still with us? I'm with you, Mr. Chairman, but I haven't, I haven't indicated to speak, Mr. Chairman. That's right. Your hand, your hand went up, so it may have been that uh, that was well, well, I was going to, and I was going to second it, but, but, but um, uh, Councillor, Councillor Kingham stepped in front of me, right? Sorry. No problem. That's all right. I'm not seeing any other comments or questions from members, so if there are none, then we can move to a vote on the first proposition, which was for the main application. Uh, which was moved and seconded uh, to be granted permission by councillors Bolt and Kingham. Uh, again, I'll come around to members in, in turn, so we'll start this time with Councillor Facey. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I've been present throughout this uh, delightful afternoon, Chairman, and I'm with the officer's recommendation for. Thank you, Councillor Hendry. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I have seen and heard everything, and yes, I am also for. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Scott. Um, taking me by surprise again. Um, yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm in favour and I've seen and heard everything this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Gibson. Yeah, um, yeah, I've seen and heard the um, whole application on line four. Thank you. Councillor Pearce. Thank you. Seen and heard the whole presentation and I'm for. Thank you. Councillor Glassford. Thank you, Chairman. Seen and heard the whole presentation and I'm for. Thank you. Councillor Grimes. Thank you, Chairman. Seen and heard the whole presentation and I'm for. Thank you. Councillor Perry. Yes, thank you. Seen and heard all the presentation and I'm for. Thank you. Councillor Bolt. Uh, seen and heard the presentation and for. Thank you. Councillor Bradford. Seen and heard the whole debate, and I am for. Thank you. Councillor Kingham. Yes, seen and heard the whole presentation, and I'm for. Thank you. Councillor Evans. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Chairman. I've seen and heard the whole debate, and my vote is in favour. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Murphy. Yes, Chairman, seen and heard the whole presentation, and I'm for. Thank you. And I've also seen and heard the whole presentation. I'm in for as well. Mrs. Ah, Mr. Evans, Councillor Evans, you've got your hand up. Is there anything you wanted to query before we give the result? No. Are you no, preempting the next one? I, I, I was going to move to the recommendation. Of okay. <laughs> I'll come. I'll come to you shortly. <laughs> Mrs. Nicholson. Is that, that all? That was unanimous. <laughs> Thank okay. you. That's clearly carried. So we'll move on to the next part of the application, which was the listed building and Councillor Evans. Uh, Mr Chairman, I would like to please to uh, make a recommendation on page 1881. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is Councillor Bolt. Hmm. Uh, yes, uh, second that one. OK, are there any other comments any other members wish to make at this stage? Don't hang on. Someone's got their hand up and I can't see who it is. Oh, that's still Councillor Bolt. OK, so in which case uh, we'll move to the vote on that one because I'm not seeing any further comments. So this time we'll start with Councillor Murphy. Yes, I've seen and heard everything and uh, so far <laughs> and I'm for. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Evans. Uh, yeah, I confirm I've seen and heard the whole debate and I am in favour. And Councillor Kingham. Yes, I've seen and heard the whole debate and I'm for. Councillor Bradford. Seen and heard the whole debate and I am for, Mr Chairman. Councillor Bolt. Likewise seen and heard, and I'm for. Thank you, Councillor Perry. Sorry, yes, yeah, seen and heard, and I'm for. Councillor Grimes. Yes, yeah, seen and heard everything, and I'm for. Thank you, Councillor Glassford. Thank you, Chairman. I've seen and heard the whole debate, and I am for. And Councillor Pearce. Yep, seen and heard the whole debate, and I'm for. Councillor Gibson. Uh, yeah, um, seen and heard, and yes, I'm for, please. Councillor Scott. Yes, seen and heard, and I'm for. Thank you. Councillor Hendry. I've seen and heard everything, Mr Chairman, and I am for. Thank you. And Councillor Facey. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Seen and heard, and I'm for, Chairman. And likewise, I've seen and heard the debate, and I'm also for. And again, Mrs Nicholson. Thank you, Chairman. It was unanimous. Excellent. So that is also clearly carried, so permission granted. 
I think, members, that brings us to the end of our applications for this afternoon.